Harper Audio presents Justice Denied by J.A. Jantz. Performed by J.R. Horn. Copyright 2007 by J.A. Jantz. Production and abridgment copyright 2007 by Harper Collins Publishers. I was standing in my own bedroom, minding my own business and nodding my tie, when Mel Soames hopped into the doorway from her room down the hall. She was wearing nothing but a bra and a pair of panties, and she was doing a strange ostrich-like dance as she attempted to put one foot into a pair of pantyhose. So, what are you going to do about a tux? she asked. Buy or rent? Some questions posed by half-naked women are more easily answered than others. This one had me stumped. What tux? I wondered. Since I quit drinking, I find him in fairly good shape when it comes to remembering things. For example, we had spent most of the weekend on the road driving down to Ashland, Oregon to see my month-old grandson, Kyle. I clearly remembered having to explain to my precocious four-year-old granddaughter, Kayla, that Mel was not her grandmother, and I particularly remembered how much of a kick my daughter and son-in-law, Kelly and Jeremy, had gotten out of my trying to dig my way out of that hole. And I also remember the eight-hour drive back to Seattle on Sunday afternoon, especially the part where I had managed to keep my mouth shut when Mel was pulled over by an Oregon state trooper for doing 77 miles per hour in a posted 65. But the motorcycle cop was a young guy. Mel gave him the full-press blonde treatment, complete with a winning if apologetic smile, and managed to talk her way out of the ticket. But then, that's Mel for you. However, nothing in all those bits of memory even hinted at my needing a tux. Bye, I said. It was a desperate gamble, but I came up winners. Mel shot me a radiant smile. Good answer, she said. We should probably plan on doing that at lunchtime or maybe right after work. That way, if there's tailoring that needs to be done. Snapping her pantyhose in place, she disappeared back down the hall to finish dressing. I finished knotting my tie and then went out into the kitchen to drink coffee and contemplate my fate. Tux or not, Mel Soames brought something to the table that wasn't half bad. We had met working for the Washington State Attorney General's Special Homicide Investigation Team, the SHIT Squad, as it's derisively known in local cop shop circles. I had gone there after bailing out of homicide at Seattle PD. My former partner, Sue Danielson, had died in a shootout, and I had wanted to find a way to keep my hand in law enforcement without having to deal with the emotional stress of a partner. Ross Allen Connors, the AG, had offered me just such a position. Mel, it turned out, had come to Washington State and to SHIT for a similar reason. Only the partnership problem she was leaving behind was a bad marriage and a worse divorce. It goes without saying that we're both well beyond the age of consent and old enough to know that working together and living together is a very bad idea. SHIT is a new enough agency that nobody has ever quite gotten around to setting down and writing all the rules and procedures about what should or shouldn't be done. If they had, I'm sure cohabitation between fellow investigators would be close to the top of the prohibited list. But there's no fool like an old fool, or maybe even a pair of them. And so even though it's probably a bad idea, we do it anyway. Sometimes we stay at Mel's place in Bellevue, but... Mostly we stay at my high-rise condo in Seattle's Denny Regrade neighborhood. We carpool together in the express lanes across Lake Washington and then pick up or drop off the other vehicle in the park-and-ride lot on the east side of the lake. New acquaintances are often curious about how a retired homicide cop happens to sit in the penthouse suite of one of Seattle's most desirable high-rises. The truth is... I wouldn't be in Belltown Terrace at all if it weren't for Ann Corley, my second wife, whose shocking death left me holding an unexpected fortune. My Mercedes S55 may have come to me used, but it's several years newer than Mel's BMW, so 
Her 740 tends to be relegated to second-class status on most work days. Once on the east side, we split up and drive onto the SHIT Squad B offices in Eastgate in our two separate vehicles. We park next to each other in the parking lot and ride up in the elevator together. Big secret. Sneaky and subtle. I suspect our boss, Harry I. Ball, knows all about it and simply chooses to keep his mouth shut on the subject. Mel showed up in the kitchen looking like a million dollars. She gave me a breezy kiss, filled our two thermos traveling cups with coffee, and we headed out. Did you call Beverly and Lars? she asked. Beverly, my ninety-something grandmother, lives with her second husband, Lars Jensen, in an assisted living facility up on Queen Anne Hill. Beverly was fading, they both were, and I dreaded calling for fear of hearing bad news. Not yet, I said, too early. Well, try giving them a call later, then, Mel advised. Kelly sent along that little framed picture of Kyle, the one they took in the hospital. She wanted to be sure we got it to them right away. Right, I said, maybe we can see them after work tonight. We rode up in the elevator together. Mel ducked into her office and turned on her radio. I was surprised to see that Barbara Galvin, our super-efficient office manager, wasn't at her desk. I found her in the break room waiting for a pot of coffee to finish brewing. Heads up, she said, the big guy's here. The big guy, of course, was none other than Attorney General Ross Allen Connors. What's up? I asked. Who knows? Barbara replied with a shrug. He's been closeted with Harry for the last twenty minutes. There was no doubt in my mind that Ross Connors had appeared in person to read me the riot act for carrying on with Mel. When he showed up outside my door a few minutes later, I was ready to take full responsibility for our little indiscretion. Hey, Bo, Ross said. Do you mind? Come on in, I replied. Be my guest. Ross Connors is a big man, someone who fills up any room he enters. That goes triple for my tiny office. At 6'4 and 280, he looks like what he was in high school and college, a top-drawer tackle. He's also an experienced politician with finely tailored clothing and good looks that go with that territory. But Ross was beginning to show his age. His wife's very public suicide a year or so earlier had taken its toll. His hair was solid gray, and there were dark circles under his eyes, as though he wasn't sleeping well. I could certainly relate to that. Holding a cup of coffee, Ross settled back in my only guest chair. He took a tentative sip of the coffee and then heaved a contented sigh. Much better, he said. I don't know who made that first pot and was like drinking crankcase oil. That would be Harry, I told him, his own personal witch's brew. The rest of us have learned to wait until Barbara Galvin makes the next pot. Wise decision, Ross said. Remind me next time. When Ross reached over and pushed the door shut, I figured he was building up to giving me my dressing down. But he didn't. Instead, he took another measured sip of coffee. So, what are you working on these days, he asked. The missing persons thing, I answered. Harry I. Ball, with his usual flair for understatement, had shortened the handle to MPT, and MPT was definitely Ross Connor's own personal baby. It had dawned on Ross that it was time for a systematic review of missing persons reports from all over the state. He had embarked on a program that included making the effort of tracking down and interviewing surviving family members, inputting all relevant information on Washington State's missing persons reports, into a national database and comparing our list to any nationwide reports of unidentified remains. Now, this was all done in the hope and expectation that closing some of our missing persons cases would also help close some unsolved homicides. How's that going? Ross asked. Well, it's a lot like looking for two halves of the same needle in several different haystacks, I told him. No hits yet? A few. I found three where the people had turned back up, but for one reason or another never did get taken off the missing persons list. This afternoon I have an interview scheduled with a woman named Deanne Cosgrove, whose father went missing back in 1980. Twenty-five years, Ross mused. That's a long time. Well, that's what she said when I called her about it. Why bring it up now? I told her I had to. It was my job. Ross smiled and nodded. He didn't seem to be in any hurry, but I was ready for the other shoe to drop. 
So, how are things between you and Seattle PD these days, he asked. Seattle PD? Ross grinned. You know, remember the place you worked for twenty-odd years? I had worked in Seattle PD for a long time, most of it as a homicide detective. All the way along, though, I had rubbed the brass the wrong way, and the reverse had certainly been true. It turned out that working for Ross Connors had proved to be the one notable exception in a career marred by ongoing feuds with many of my commanding officers. Mm, so, so, I said, I guess things have improved a little. And glad to hear it, Ross said, because we seem to have a little problem, and you may be able to help. So he wasn't here about Mel and me after all. I breathed what I hope was an inaudible sigh of relief. What kind of problem? Does the name LaShawn Tompkins mean anything to you? LaShawn was a hot-shot, tough-guy gangbanger had gone to prison years earlier for the rape and murder of a teenage prostitute. I recall that sometime in the last year or so he'd been exonerated through newly examined DNA evidence. I nodded. Isn't that the guy the do-gooders managed to spring from death row last year? The very one, Ross agreed. Well, what about him? Someone shot the shit out of him last Friday evening, Ross said. Plugged him twice, once in the stomach and once in the heart, when he opened his mother's front door over in the Rainier Valley. That didn't sound so unusual to me. In fact, it's pretty much same old, same old. A guy gets out of prison, comes back, tries to go back to doing whatever he did before he went to the slammer. He soon finds out that times have changed. New thugs have taken over his old territory and his old contacts, and they don't like him encroaching on what they now regard as theirs. Turf war? Maybe, Ross said. Maybe not. That's what I'd like you to find out for me. Why? For the first time since he'd sat down in my office, Ross looked uncomfortable. I really can't say, he said, or rather I won't, not at this time, and given the fact that there have been leaks in my office before, I nodded. We both knew too much about those. I'm not about to put anything in writing, he continued, not in an email, not in a letter, not in anything official. At this point, it's strictly an informal inquiry. Well, can I use your name? Let me know first. Reports? Nothing written, he said. I've cleared it with Harry, so he knows you're on special assignment. I'll check with you off and on in the next few days and see how it's going. So, I'm your secret agent man, I asked. Ross nodded. I've got a good crew of people here, he added. All of them are hand-picked and all of them trustworthy, but you and I have a history, Bo. I'm counting on your discretion on this matter. You want discretion? You've got discretion. Thanks, he said, and that includes your special friend, by the way, he added as he rose to his feet. It was a long way from what I had expected and deserved, but it was clear Ross knew all about Mel and me. And now I knew he knew. And not telling Mel about what he had asked me to do would put me between a rock and a hard place. Ross pulled the door open. As he stepped into the corridor, he turned and looked back at me. Life goes on, doesn't it? he said. That throwaway comment covered a lot of territory. Ross Allen Connors and J.P. Beaumont did have a history, one that included the pain of losing wives to suicide. This was the second time now that Ross had come to me personally when he needed something handled under the radar. In the world of SHIT, I was indeed Ross's secret agent man. He had just given me the handshake. Yes, I agreed. Yes, it does. For a long time after Ross Connors left my office, I sat there and contemplated what it all might mean. Obviously, by limiting the scope of the investigation into LaShawn Tompkins' death to one officer, and by disallowing any kind of a paper trail, the AG seemed to be looking for a certain amount of deniability with regard to whatever his interest might be in the homicide of a now-exonerated killer. I also gave some careful thought to what I would tell Mel when she got around to asking, as she inevitably would, what the hell was going on. It happened at lunchtime as we were driving through rain-washed sunshine to the men's warehouse in downtown Bellevue. So, what did Ross Connors want, she asked. We were in the BMW and she was driving, so she wasn't looking at my face when I answered. There's a good reason I don't play poker. My face is always a dead giveaway of whatever's in my hand. 
Just chewing the fat, I don't think he's ever gotten over what happened to Francine. His wife, Mel asked, shooting me a questioning look. All that had happened before Melissa Soames had turned up at SHIT. I nodded, hoping she'd go back to watching traffic instead of watching me. Well, that's understandable, Mel said. The fact that she swallowed my lie without a moment's hesitation made me feel that much worse. I'd held out some hope that in the process of actually buying the damn tux, I'd somehow managed to jar loose a little more information as to the whys and wherefores of my needing one. No such luck. Other than telling the alterations lady that we needed to have the tux in hand by Friday evening, Mel didn't let slip any additional details. By then I was in far too deep to ask. After my ordeal by Tux, we hurried across the street to the California Pizza Kitchen to grab some lunch. The place was bright, busy, crowded, and noisy, which suited me just fine. I hoped that Mel would be preoccupied enough with her surroundings that she'd stop giving me the third degree about Ross's special project. Fat chance. So what are you up to later? she asked. I have an MPT interview set up for this afternoon, I said. Once that's over, I may end up having to go directly from there into Seattle. So, I'm on my own for getting across the water tonight, she asked. Looks like. That's all right, she said. I'd forgotten. I have a board meeting tonight. I'd need to bring my car home anyway. That's when it finally dawned on me. Mel had been drafted onto the board of SASIC, the Seattle Area Sexual Assault Consortium. Their annual fundraising auction was scheduled for Friday night. Since she's on the board, not appearing simply wasn't an option. And that's why I needed the tux. But my relief was short-lived. What about Beverly, Mel prodded. Did you call her yet? Not yet, but I will. If you go see her tonight, be sure to take that picture of Kyle along. I left it in the hallway table with the rest of the mail. I was eager to move away from the uncomfortable subject of visiting my grandmother. Now what does your afternoon hold, I asked. Mel rolled her very blue eyes. For weeks she'd been working on a county-by-county -county analysis of violent crime. She'd been complaining about it for that long as well. As of this morning, she said, I'm suddenly charged with creating a catalog of violent sex offenders, which is, if you ask me, a long way away from our primary mission. A catalog. She took a bite of her pasta salad and nodded. More like a survey, she answered. For the past five years, Ross wants to know where Washington's released sexual offenders have been, where they went once they got out of jail, and where they are now. Oh, and he also wants it ASAP. Considering Mel's extracurricular activity with Sasek, I could see why Ross Connors had drafted her for that particular job. We paid up and were headed toward the door when, over the noise of rattling crockery, I heard someone call... Melissa! Oh, Melissa! I turned and saw someone, a blonde, waving frantically from a table at the far side of the cashier's stand. Is that someone you know? Mel's face broke into a smile. It's Anita. Mel tends to refer to her friends by first names only. I knew that Anita was somehow related to Sasek, but in that moment I couldn't have remembered how for any amount of money. Anita, no last name, stood up, held out a diamond-bedecked hand, and proffered a smooth, perfumed cheek for an expected kiss. She was upper thirty-something, pencil-thin, and drop-dead gorgeous. "'Why, you must be the unparalleled Beau Beaumont,' the woman said with a smile. "'I'm Anita Bowden. Mel talks about you all the time, by the way, says you're wonderful.' "'I wouldn't believe everything I hear,' I told her. When I glanced in Mel's direction, I saw she was blushing, and I have to confess that the idea of Mel's talking about me in my absence put a smile on my face. "'So, you're coming on Friday,' Anita continued. "'Wouldn't miss it,' I said, faking for all I was worth. "'Got my tucks and everything.' "'Good boy,' Anita said. "'See there, you're every bit as wonderful as she says. "'And you'll be at the board meeting tonight?' she asked, turning to Mel. "'Yes, I will,' Mel answered. We didn't say anything more until we were back in the BMW. So you talk about me when I'm not around, I asked innocently. Don't press your luck, buddy, Mel returned. Wouldn't miss it, she repeated, mimicking my delivery. You're such a liar. I'm surprised you weren't struck by lightning. As a matter of fact, so am I, I said, and we both burst out laughing. 
When we arrived back at the office, I got into my own car and headed out for my interview with Deanne Cosgrove. With the help of my newly purchased GPS, I had no difficulty making my way to the residence of Deanne and Donald Cosgrove on the western edge of Redmond. The house was one of a number of small, neat family homes tucked into a quiet cul-de-sac. A tiny fenced and well-maintained front yard was graced by a number of plastic vehicles and a small swing set. When I rang the bell, it was answered by a woman in her early thirties who carried a relatively new baby on one hip while being trailed by a pair of what looked to be three-year-old twins. Deanne Cosgrove had the wan, distracted look of someone suffering through months of sleep deprivation. Her hair was pulled back in a ragged ponytail. J.P. Beaumont, I said, holding out my ID. She glanced at it with no particular interest. Are you Deanne Cosgrove? Yes, I am. Come in. Uh, please excuse the mess. She was right. The house was messy. Not dirty, but cluttered with laundered but unfolded clothes, piled two feet deep on the couch, and with a minefield of toys littering the carpeted floor. I meant to shower and have this all picked up before you got here, but don't worry about it, I assured her. I just came back from visiting my daughter and son-in-law down in Ashland. They have small kids, too. Deanne gave me a sincere but haggard smile and then swiped an easy chair free of plastic toys so I could sit down. Then she settled into a rocker. Without practice diploma, she unbuttoned her blouse, covered herself with a tea towel, undid her bra, and began nursing the baby. So what's this about my dad, she asked. I glanced at the name on the folder I was carrying. The missing persons report for Anthony David Cosgrove had been filed by someone named Carol Cosgrove on May 19, 1980. Deanne, the daughter, had been listed on the form by name. Who's Donald, then, I asked. Your brother? No, she said. Donnie's my husband. Cosgrove's my maiden name. When Donnie and I were getting married, I told him I wanted to keep my name just in case Daddy ever showed up and came looking for me. Luckily for me, Donnie's a really practical guy. He said it made no sense to have more than one name in our family, so he changed his name to mine. It was clear that almost twenty-five years later, Deanne Cosgrove was still grieving for her absent father and hoping against hope that some day he would return. Sounds like your husband's got a good head on his shoulders. An odd expression flitted across Deanne's face. Yes, she agreed finally. Yes, he does, but you still haven't told me. Why are you asking questions about Dad after so many years? I work for the Washington State Attorney General Ross Connors, I said. He's asked my agency to go through unresolved missing persons cases and see if by cross-checking we can bring some of them to a close. I've heard about cases like that, Deanne offered. Cold cases where they eventually figure out that an unidentified body somewhere else is someone who's been missing for a long time? Yes, so if you don't mind... But I didn't even finish asking the question before Deanne Cosgrove launched into her story. It happened the day Mount St. Helens blew up, she said at once. Daddy went fishing that weekend and never came home. The day Mount St. Helens blew up. If you lived in Washington State or even anywhere in the Pacific Northwest at the time, those words conjure a day you remember. The initial blast caused a huge avalanche and sent up an immense overheated cloud of 300-degree pumice and ash that killed every living thing inside a 200-square-mile area. So your father was one of the fifty or so people who died. The actual number was fifty-seven, she said. Daddy wasn't ever counted in that official number because they never found any trace of him. No sign of him or his vehicle. But Mount St. Helens is where he had told my mother he was going that weekend. He said he was going fishing on Spirit Lake. It seemed likely to me now that if Anthony David Cosgrove had been anywhere near Spirit Lake at the time, he had most likely been vaporized. But I remember, too, that investigators had found traces of many of the human tragedies left behind in the volcano's aftermath. In fact, Mount St. Helens and the surrounding area have been subjected to an almost microscopic examination as scientists study both what happened back then and what's happening now. With that in mind, it seemed strange to me that no fragment of Anthony Cosgrove's vehicle had ever been found. By then, the baby seemed to have fallen asleep. She held him to her shoulder, burped him, and then went to put him down somewhere out of sight. 
When Deanne returned to the living room, she brought with her a small gold-framed photo of a young man wearing a vintage 1970s hairdo and equally dated horn rim glasses. Grinning goofily for the camera, he held a tiny, red-faced, wrinkly baby, held her awkwardly and carefully, as though he was concerned she might break. "'Your dad?' I asked, handing the photo back to Deanne. "'Yes,' she said. "'It's the only one I have. "'After he was gone, Mom went through the house "'and got rid of most of his pictures.' "'She put the treasured photo up on the mantel, "'settled cross-legged on the floor, "'and then gathered her rambunctious twins to her "'as if finding solace in their wiggly presence. "'They cuddled up next to their mother on the carpeted floor, "'and with their heads in her lap "'and their feet sticking out in opposite directions, "'they gradually settled down. "'How old were you when it happened?' I asked. When my father went missing, I was eight. Since they never found any sign of him, I assume your father stayed on the missing list permanently. Deanne nodded again. Now, that's right. I've always thought it would have been easier for me if we'd at least found something of him to bury. Maybe then I could have gotten over it and moved on. My mother did. She didn't bother waiting around seven years to have him declared dead. She divorced him, remarried, and made a whole new life for herself. But I just couldn't. They did declare him dead eventually, but it didn't change anything. She paused while tears welled up in her eyes. She pursed her lips. Somebody finally came to the house and told my mother that it was hopeless, that my father wasn't ever coming home, and she should just give up on it. We had a little memorial service because, like I said, there wasn't anything to bury. I could envision Deanne Cosgrove as a broken-hearted little girl, lost and grieving while the grown-ups around her preoccupied with their own difficulties, walked away from hers and moved on. But you didn't give up, did you? No, Deanne agreed. Never. And you still haven't, I thought. I miss him every single day, Deanne added. Where's your mother these days, I asked. Once my father was declared dead and the insurance money finally came through, she and Jack, her new husband, bought a place up in Leavenworth, she said. Just outside Leavenworth, she added. I guess I shouldn't call Jack a new husband. He's been around for a long time. So Mrs. Cosgrove hadn't spent much time waiting around for her missing husband to show up or playing the grieving widow, I thought. Mom and Jack got married in January of the following year, Deanne said. I don't like the man much, never have. He's an overbearing jerk, and we had our issues, especially when I was a teenager. That's why I ended up living with my grandmother, my father's mother, down in Kent most of the time I was in high school. But by then there was money coming in from Social Security, so it didn't seem like I was a burden. But you said there was insurance. Deanne nodded. Quite a bit, she said. Some of it was group insurance, and the rest of it was stuff Daddy owned. There was one smaller policy that was just for me. Donnie and I used that to make the down payment on this house. "'Anything else you can tell me about your dad?' I asked. "'I was always surprised that he went fishing that weekend,' she said. "'As far as I know, he hadn't ever gone before. "'He didn't even like fish that much. "'What he liked were airplanes. He loved airplanes. "'You mean as a hobby? As in every way. "'That's what he did, you see. "'He worked for Boeing, too, designing airplanes. "'I'm not really sure what he did there. "'I wish now I'd been older so I could have known which planes he worked on and what he did.' Maybe I've ridden on one of the ones he helped design. You probably have, I said. I hope so, she replied. I put my notebook in my jacket pocket, and when I stood up to go, Deanne expertly eased the two sleeping kiddos off her lap without disturbing either one of them. Thanks, she said as she showed me to the door, and please tell your boss thank you for me too. It means a lot to know that someone still cares about my father after all this time. Is someone still looking for him? It means more than you know. The last thing I did before I left was to hand her a business card. Now, this is how you can reach me, I said, jotting my cell number on the back. Okay, she said, stuffing it into the pocket of her jeans. Thanks. As I walked back to the Mercedes parked just outside the small front yard with its plastic big wheels and swings, I had a whole new idea about that daunting list of missing persons. Every single one of them had left behind family members for whom life had gone on.
Everybody at SHIT had sneered when Ross had announced his missing persons directive. But having met Deanne Cosgrove and witnessed her pain, I could see that this was a situation where the Attorney General was right and everybody else was wrong. After leaving Deanne Cosgrove's place in Redmond, I started back to Seattle and then thought better of it. Since I was going to be approaching the LaShawn Tompkins situation pretty much without portfolio, I needed to track down whatever information was out in public. If Mel came home and discovered I'd been scrounging through her dead newspaper collection for actual news, she would know at once that something was up. Instead, I stopped off at the Starbucks in Rose Hill, bought myself a latte, and logged on to the Internet to read one of several articles concerning LaShawn Tompkins. LaShawn Tompkins was 19 years old when he was arrested in charge of the brutal rape and murder of a 15-year-old prostitute named Alita Princess Jones. He was 21 when he was convicted of aggravated first-degree homicide and sentenced to death. He was 28 when the DNA analysis of the evidence in that flawed case caused him to be released from his cell on death row with no new charges filed against him. Now at age 30, he's dead, gunned down, execution style in the doorway of his mother's Rainier Valley home. Despite being convicted of a crime he didn't commit, LaShawn used the time in prison to turn his life around completely, says Mark Granger, executive director and pastor of the King Street Mission, where Tompkins had worked as a counselor since his release from Walla Walla two years ago. Tompkins had come to his elderly mother's home on Friday, as he did twice every day to check on her, to help dispense her medications and to prepare her meals. There was no sign of forced entry. Indications are that Mr. Tompkins willingly opened the door that allowed his killer access to the home. Shawnee went out into the kitchen to heat up my meals on wheels, mac and cheese, said the victim's bereaved mother, Etta Mae Tompkins. The next thing I know, he was lying there on the floor by my front door with blood everywhere. He was such a good boy, and he was doing the Lord's work. The only good thing about this is that I know my son was saved, and he's gone home to Jesus. I was about to go on to the next article when my cell phone rang. As soon as I saw the Queen Anne Gardens number on the readout, my heart fell. Lars Jensen is an old-fashioned kind of guy. He doesn't like cell phones. And I knew he would call me on mine during work hours only as a last resort, and for the worst possible reason. It's Beverly, he said. How bad, I asked. Yeah, sure, Lars answered. It's pretty bad. I hated to call and worry you, but I think you should probably come now. Lars is an old Norwegian, a retired halibut fisherman. I'm on my way, I said. I'll be there as soon as I can. Driving down 405, I called Mel at work and told her what was going on. I'll let everyone here know, she said. If you want me to, I'll drop everything and meet you there. No, I said. That's all right. I'm okay. Which wasn't exactly true. This was hitting me very hard. Beverly Jensen was my last surviving elder. She and my grandfather had been estranged from my mother and me for many years, both while I was growing up and long into adulthood. My grandfather, a man of unbending principles and scant human kindness, had thoroughly disapproved of the fact that my mother had not only gotten herself pregnant outside the bonds of holy matrimony, but she had also adamantly refused to do the right thing and give me up for adoption. It was only in the past ten years or so, and long after my mother's death, that I had established a connection with him at a time when my hard-nosed grandfather had been on his last legs. It was then that I had learned how my grandmother, forbidden by her husband to have any contact with either my mother and me, had faithfully followed as many of my exploits as she could. She had kept voluminous scrapbooks that included clippings of everything to do with J.P. Beaumont. Seeing those secret scrapbooks, ones my grandfather had known nothing about, had told me everything I needed to know about Beverly Beaumont's selfless love and constancy. And then she met Lars. Widowed by then, Beverly had come to help out at my late partner's Sue Danielson's memorial service. Somehow my grandmother and Lars, my AA sponsor, ended up doing dishes together in the party room kitchen at Belltown Terrace and had hit it off. They had married within months of meeting, and everything had been fine until now. 
At Queen Anne Gardens, I parked in the visitor's line and then signed in. She's not in their apartment, you know, the desk clerk told me. She's been moved to our care center. Euphemistically speaking, care center was assisted living code for ICU. I thought they should have called it IWU, intensive waiting unit. There were two beds in the room, but only one was occupied. Lars, leaning on his cane and staring off into space, was seated next to Beverly. When he saw me, he smiled and made an effort to rise. Sit, I told him, what's happening? He shrugged and sank back down. She's sleeping now, he said, but she was asking for you earlier. That's why I called. I looked at Beverly sleeping. I had never before seen her without her false teeth. Somehow she appeared to be much smaller than I remembered, even though I had seen her only a few days earlier, shortly before Mel and I left for Ashland. Is she in any pain, I asked. No, he said, she's just tired, we both are. Lars' weathered face told me that was true. His eyes were red-rimmed and watery. We had some good times, he added, but she's ready to move on. I looked around the room. There was no heart monitor, no oxygen equipment. Isn't there something we should do, some treatment? Lars shook his head and gestured toward the bright yellow do-not-resuscitate placard that had been affixed to the door. No, he said, there's nothing. She just needs to rest a little. And so do you, I said. Why don't you go take a nap? Yeah, sure, he said, getting shakily to his feet. I think you're right. Left alone in the room with Beverly, I sat there for a long time, simply watching her sleep. She seemed serene, untroubled, and unafraid. I castigated myself for not stopping by Belltown Terrace on the way and picking up Kyle's picture. Not that it would have made any difference. She was asleep, and I doubted if she would ever waken enough to see the framed photo Kelly had wanted Beverly to have. I sat there for the rest of the long afternoon, listening to Beverly breathe, thinking about the few short years we'd had together and regretting the many years we'd spent apart. I was glad for the happy times she and Lars had shared, and felt sad when I realized how much it would hurt for him to lose a second well-loved wife. He came limping back into the room and resumed his bedside watch about the same time the sun went down behind the green terminal out in Elliott Bay. No matter what, Lars said quietly, I wouldn't have missed this. I nodded. That's always the bottom line where love is concerned. Is loving someone ever worth the ultimate price of losing them? And she's very proud of you, Bo, Lars added. Always has been. I know, I said, blinking back tears. Mel turned up about then, bringing with her Kyle's missing photo. I was grateful she had gone to the trouble in the few spare minutes she had between the end of work and the start of her evening board meeting. After showing Kyle's photo to Lars, who was suitably unimpressed, I placed the small framed photo on the nightstand next to Beverly's glass and water pitcher. Mel was smart enough not to ask how I was doing or how long I'd be, because I had no idea. I badgered Lars into going down to the dining room for some dinner just before they closed. He offered to take me along, but I wasn't hungry. He had barely left the room when Beverly's eyes popped open. She looked first at the chair Lars had just vacated, then gazed anxiously around the room. It's all right, I assured her. He went downstairs for some dinner. Oh, she said. Then she mumbled something I couldn't make out. When I asked her to repeat what she'd said, she opened her eyes and looked at me impatiently. Where's Mel? Mel had to go to a meeting, I said. She'll be back later. Lars said you were on a trip, Beverly mumbled a few seconds later. Did you marry her? So that was it. Beverly had evidently decided that Mel's and my trip to Ashland had been something it wasn't. Uh, no, I said. We drove down to Ashland to see Kelly and Jeremy and their new baby. I reached for the photo to show Beverly her new great-great-grandson. Ignoring Kyle, Beverly stared directly into my face. Marry her! she commanded. Mel's a good girl, and she's good for you. Don't let her slip away. 
That single fragment of forceful and lucid conversation seemed to sap all Beverly's strength and energy. She soon drifted off to sleep once more and was still asleep when Lars returned from the dining room. How is she? Still sleeping, I said. Somehow I didn't mention to him what she had said earlier. I didn't say anything then and I didn't later as the night wore on. And Beverly's breathing grew more and more shallow. I didn't want to admit to Lars that she'd roused herself long enough to give me one last set of marching orders. And I didn't want him to know that, in what might well be her last waking moments, Beverly had been thinking about me rather than him. By midnight, it was over, and she was gone. I stayed with Lars long enough to see him settled in the apartment he and Beverly had shared. By the time I left Queen Anne Gardens, the clouds had returned, and it was raining again. A little past one, I let myself into the condo at Belltown Terrace. Mel, with her feet tucked under her, was curled up in my recliner, sound asleep. I stood there for a long moment or two, watching her, stunned by how amazingly beautiful she was and wondering how much time we might have to be together, or if we even should. Finally, I reached out and touched her gently on her shoulder. She awakened instantly. Mel searched my face and read what was written there. Beverly's gone, then? Mel asked. I nodded. I'm sorry, she said. So am I, I agreed. Sorrier than I would have thought possible. Let's go to bed. When Mel woke me up in the morning, it was with a cup of coffee and a goodbye kiss. She was almost dressed and ready to go to work. I already called Harry and told him you won't be in, she said. Thanks. He wanted to know when the services would be. I'm not sure. Lars says that's all handled, but we didn't really discuss it last night. There's handled, and then there's handled, Mel declared. And I'm sure there'll be lots of loose ends that need tying up. And if all the kids are coming home, we should probably make some hotel reservations for them. I don't think having all of us stay here together is a good idea. I was out of the shower and toweling dry when Lars called. Hate to bother you, Lars began, but you said you probably wouldn't be going in today if you could take me to the mortuary and to a flower shop. Whatever you need, Lars, I can be there in half an hour. An hour's fine, he said. They don't open till ten. It was sometime during that hour that I realized Beverly had done both Ross Connors and me a huge favor. By dying when she did, she afforded both of us the luxury of cover, time off the clock when I'd be able to pursue the LaShawn Tompkins matter, with no one, Mel Soames included, being the wiser. I found Lars hobbling back and forth in front of Queen Anne Garden's sliding glass door. He looked agitated. I assumed he was still upset about Beverly. He climbed in beside me. Those old ladies, he muttered, slamming the car door behind him and shaking his head. What old ladies? Back there, he said, gesturing back toward Queen Anne Gardens. Beverly's not even in the ground, and here they were all over me at breakfast, wanting to sit with me and bring me coffee. Yeah, sure, that was treating me like I was fresh fish. It was hard not to smile. It occurred to me that since Lars was in his nineties, he had a hell of a lot of nerve calling anyone else old, and only a lifelong fisherman would confuse fresh meat with fresh fish in that particular context. Well, they were probably just concerned about you. No, he declared heatedly. I am old enough to know better than that. I had to give him that one. If he thought the randy ladies at Queen Anne Gardens were on the make, he was probably right. Where to, I asked. Blights, he muttered. We went up and over Queen Anne Hill and down the backside to Florentia near the Fremont Bridge. Dana Howell, Lars' funeral consultant, greeted him warmly. I'm so sorry to be seeing you again so soon. Yeah, sure, Lars said, but I'm glad we got it done. And it turned out it was done, all of it, down to what would be printed on the program as well as what music would be sung and played. You still want two urns? Dana asked. Lars shot me a sidelong glance and then nodded. Half her ashes go into the lake with her first husband. The other half goes with me. That's fair. That was the first I knew that when the weather cleared, 
I'd be required to make another pilgrimage to Lake Shallan to scatter a second set of ashes. My arrangements are here, too, he added in an aside to me. Dana here knows just what I want, and it's paid for, too. You won't have to worry about a thing. After leaving the funeral home, we stopped by a florist on top of Queen Anne Hill where Lars blew all of seventy-five bucks on a floral arrangement and then worried about having spent too much. I made a note to call back later and add a few more arrangements to the floral end of things. Anything else? I asked him once we were back in the car. Lars hesitated for a moment. I think I'd like to find a meeting. I wasn't surprised to hear that, even after years of sobriety. I made a few calls and located a noontime AA meeting in the back of an old-fashioned diner up on Greenwood. When it came time to repeat the serenity prayer, I saw the white-knuckled grip Lars had on his cane and knew right then he was having a hell of a struggle, accepting what he couldn't change. I was in pretty much the same boat. When I took him back to Queen Anne Gardens, I went around to the passenger side of the car to let him out. Once he was upright, he surprised me by giving me a heartfelt tug. "'Tanks,' he said. "'Tanks for everything.' What about tonight? Would you like to have dinner with Mel and me? Lars shook his head sadly. No, he said, I'll be all right. With that, he hobbled away. I glanced at my watch. It was only a little past one. Mel wouldn't be back on this side of the water any time before six. I suppose I should have felt guilty about using that time to pursue the LaShawn Tompkins homicide, but I didn't. I got back into the S-55 and headed for Rainier Valley. Edame Tompkins' house was small but tidy-looking, with a well-kept fenced front yard. A few traces of the earlier tragedy were still visible. A scrap of yellow police tape lingered on a gatepost. When I stepped onto the porch, a mop and bucket filled with dingy reddish water reeking a pine saw set next to the doorway. The screen door was closed, but the inside door stood slightly ajar. As I raised my finger toward the bell, I heard the sound of a female voice coming from inside. I know he was important to you and your people, Pastor Mark, and you are welcome to have whatever kind of memorial service for Shawnee you like, the woman was saying. But the funeral is mine. Bible Baptist is my church with my pastor and my people. That's where I'm having it, and that's final. A man spoke then. I couldn't make out the individual words, but his tone sounded conciliatory. When he appeared in the entryway, a white man with long, flowing gray locks, he seemed to be in full retreat. "'I'll be going then,' the man I assumed to be Pastor Mark said. "'I'm sorry for your loss.' "'And I'm sorry for yours,' Adam conceded. "'I know Shawnee was a big help to you.' As Pastor Mark made for the door, I had to step into the living room in order to allow him to pass. I knew I'd need to interview Pastor Mark eventually, but now was not the time. The living room was tiny, just big enough for two chairs. Between them was an occasional table with a single lamp. A large black woman with a halo of wiry gray hair was seated in one chair, with a sturdy walker positioned close at hand. Squinting to see me better, Edame Tompkins raised an implacable finger in my direction. "'Who are you?' she demanded. "'And where did you come from?' I dug out my ID and handed it over. "'Homicide,' she mused, squinting some more and holding it up to her face in order to read it. "'I've been talking to homicide people for days now. Can't you all get together and talk to each other and leave me alone? And what are you staring at?' Embarrassed, I realized I was staring. I knew LaShawn Tompkins had been thirty years old. Human biology being what it is, his age gave me a rough idea of how old his mother would be, probably close to my age or younger. This woman was much older than that. You think I'm too old to be Shawnee's mama, is that it? I was reminded yet again why it is that I don't play poker. My daughter died a few days after Shawnee was born, Edame explained without my having asked. He was a breech baby, and they had to do a cesarean. I'm the one who brought Shawnee home, and I'm the one who raised him. I'm the only mother he ever knew. You got a problem with that? No, ma'am, I told her. So what do you want, then, Mr. Policeman? Why are you here? 
I want to find out who murdered your son. She nodded. You and me both, she said. So sit down then. Take a load off. I sat. What's your name again? Beaumont, I said. J.P. Beaumont. Your mama didn't give you no first name? Jonas, I said. Etta May nodded sagely. A good Bible name, she observed, like in the whale. Not exactly, but close enough that mean-spirited boys plagued me with that from the time my mother signed me up for kindergarten. It was due to a belly full of whale jokes, if you'll pardon the expression, that I pretty much abandoned my given name by the time I hit junior high. So, are you saved, Mr. Beaumont? Probably not, according to your lights, I said. You might be surprised about my lights, she replied, but I'll tell you this. My son was saved. He went into prison one way, and praise Jesus, he came out another. He wasn't doing drugs, she added, and he wasn't selling drugs neither. Shawnee wasn't doing nothing wrong. He was here fixing my supper, looking after me. Why would someone want to kill him like that? I have no idea. And who did you say you work for again? Ross Connors, the Washington State Attorney General. And why is this Mr. Ross interested in who killed my Shawnee? I'm not sure. Maybe he thinks those detectives from Seattle PD won't do a good job, she suggested. That was, of course, a distinct possibility. That Detective Jackson seemed nice enough, Etta May added. I was happy to have that piece of information. Detective Kendall Jackson, who is probably as tired of wine jokes as I am of whales, is one of the newer guys in Homicide, but he's also someone I know and respect. I figured he was someone I could go to with a few discreet questions. "'What do you want from me?' Adam May asked. "'Well, maybe your son said something to you that would have some bearing on what happened,' I said. "'For instance, did he mention anything to you about having any difficulties with people at work?' Etta May shook her head. "'What about friends from around here?' I asked. "'Did he take up with any of his old pals from the neighborhood once he came home?' "'I already told you, Jonah,' she said firmly. "'LaShawn came out of prison a changed man. "'He didn't go back to any of his old friends or his old habits.' "'What about a girlfriend?' I asked. "'Did he have one?' "'Not that I know of.' But "'What about difficulties with money?' "'He didn't have no money.' Edomay declared. Didn't need it, neither, because he was giving his life over to the Lord and to the King Street Mission. When he got that settlement from the state, I think Pastor Mark thought Shawnee would turn right around and drop the whole thing in the collection plate, but he didn't. Instead, LaShawn spent it on me, fixing this place up all nice and cozy so I'd have myself a comfortable place to live. I didn't remember the exact amount of LaShawn Tompkins' wrongful imprisonment settlement. I wondered how much of it was left, and was it enough to provide a motive for murder? If your son had no money, what did he do for food and clothing? He ate his meals at the mission. As for clothing, I don't know nothing about that. You have to ask Pastor Mark. I said, you and the good pastor seemed to be having a slight difference of opinion when I first got here. What was that all about? Oh, that, Etta May said. Pastor Mark is under the impression that just because Shawnee worked for him it was like he owned him or something, and that he could say how and where the funeral was going to be and all that. I had to set him straight on that score, and I did. Yes, Pastor Mark and the King Street Mission would bear some scrutiny. It would have been nice to think that LaShawn Tompkins and Pastor Mark had both seen the light, and that the two of them subsequently had devoted themselves to lives of selfless service to others but I just didn't happen to think that was true. It was likely there was something else at work here. If I ever managed to figure out exactly what that was, I'd most likely know who had gunned down LaShawn Tompkins and why. When I had first pulled up in front of the house on Church Street, I had turned off my cell phone. As soon as I turned the phone back on, it was bristling with a collection of messages and missed calls. I dialed Mel immediately. Where are you, she wanted to know. Head at home, I hedged. How's Lars, she asked. Medium, I said. Did you invite him to dinner? Did, I said. He turned me down. He probably shouldn't be alone right now, Mel said. He should have people with him. 
I thought about the gaggle of unattached Queen Anne Gardens dames Lars had claimed were hovering around him, all of them circling for a premature landing. I doubt he'll be all that alone. Still, Mel said, do you think I should call and ask him? She wanted to know. Mel probably could have talked Lars into coming out for dinner, but if she did, we might end up having a discussion of exactly when I had dropped him off and what I'd been doing in the meantime. "'You seem pretty tired,' I said. "'Let's sleep well enough alone.' I gave her the arrangement details for Beverly's services so she could pass them along to Barbara Galvin and Harry. She extracted a promise that I'd order more flowers. She also told me that she'd made arrangements for the kids to stay at the Homewood Suites a few blocks away from Belltown Terrace at the bottom of Queen Anne Hill. "'What are you going to do now?' Mel asked. "'Go home and put my feet up,' I said. "'It was a pretty short night. "'When I got as far as downtown, "'I thought briefly about stopping by Seattle PD, "'but decided against it. "'It would create far less of a stir "'if I phoned Kendall Jackson "'than it would if I showed up on the premises in person, "'asking questions. "'And since Ross seemed to want deniability, "'less of a stir would be far preferable to more of one.' Back of the condo, I settled into the recliner, picked up the phone, and dialed that old familiar number that took me straight to the heart of homicide. Hey, Bobo, Kendall boomed. What can I do for you? I understand you're working the LaShawn Tompkins case. Yep, Jackson said. Hank and I drew that one. Hank was Detective Henry Ramsdahl, Jackson's partner. How's it going, I asked. Is that an official how's it going or an unofficial? Unofficial, I replied. After the state made that payout in the Tompkins case, Ross Connors wants to be sure everything is on the up and up. But he also doesn't want to make a big fuss about it, if you know what I mean. Uh, we're not making much progress so far, Jackson admitted. From everything we've been able to learn, once he got out of prison, he straightened up and flew right, right up until somebody shot him dead, which, if you ask me, sounds pretty iffy, Jackson concluded. All bad guys mostly don't go straight. We were on the same wavelength on that score. With the possible exception of the girlfriend angle, though, he added, we haven't found anyone with a beef against him. What girlfriend, I asked. The fact that LaShawn might have a girlfriend was news to me, and it would no doubt be news to Etta May as well. Name's Manning. That would be Sister Elaine Manning. Sister as in she's black? Well, that too, but mostly Sister as in that was her title at King Street Mission. Also an ex-con, spent five years at Purdy for armed robbery. From what I can tell, that's pretty much the prerequisite for becoming a counselor at King Street. You've already done your crime and your time. What about Elaine Manning, I prompted. We're hearing bits and rumors that she and Brother Mark may have had something going, but that was before Brother LaShawn turned up on the scene. Once that happened, Sister Elaine more or less spun out of Brother Mark's orbit. So we could be dealing with a simple love triangle? Maybe, Jackson agreed. Tell me about Pastor Mark, I said. Last name's Granger, Kendall said. Former druggie, did a 15-year stretch for second-degree murder. Been out for the past five years. Another unlikely prospect for a Goody Two-Shoes award, but we haven't been able to find anything new on him either. Everybody at King Street seems hell-bent on keeping their noses clean. No drugs, no booze, no illegal activities. They just aren't making ex-cons the way they used to, I said. I guess not, Jackson agreed with a laugh. So there's nothing on the street about who might have done this. So far, not a word, Jackson replied. And believe me, we've been asking. What about forensics? A thirty-eight, Jackson said. We ran the bullet through Nibin. Nothing turned up. Nibin is the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network, which keeps track of bullets the same way the automated fingerprint identification system keeps track of fingerprints. The fact that the bullet used to kill LaShawn Tompkins hadn't shown up in the database meant that the weapon was clean, that it hadn't been used in any other crime prior to his murder. Now that it had been entered into the system, however, if it was used again, it would be noticed. When or if that happened, it would make the killer easier to trace. So you'll keep me in the loop on this one, I suggested. Only if you do the same, he returned. Quid pro quo, whatever. If you dredge something up, I want to hear about it, too. Fair enough, I said. I put down the phone, leaned back in the recliner, and closed my eyes. 
I may even have drifted off for a second or two before the phone rang, startling me awake if not to full consciousness. "'How come we have to stay in a hotel?' my daughter demanded. "'Why can't we stay with you? Is it because of her?' And there, in a nutshell, is why men find women so baffling, daughters included. I'll be the first to admit I wasn't always the best of fathers when Scott and Kelly were kids. But in the years since I stopped drinking, I've gone to great lengths to undo as much of that damage as possible. Maybe I've made more progress with Scott than I have with Kelly. I just talked to Mel, Kelly continued. She told me we'll be staying at Homewood Suites and gave me the confirmation number. I still didn't get it. My first thought was that since Kelly and Jeremy live in a very tight budget, maybe she was worried about having to pay a hotel bill. I'm paying for the room, I said, trying to fight my way out of a mess not of my own making. This has nothing to do with money, Kelly exclaimed. She seemed on the verge of tears. It's bad enough that we have to come all the way from Ashland to Seattle with a month-old baby in the car. Is it asking too much to expect that we get to spend some time with you instead of being carted off to a hotel like a bunch of strangers? Scott and Cherise will be staying there, too, I offered lamely. And it's only a couple of blocks from here. From Kelly's point of view, the hotel could have been on Pluto. It's all about Mel, isn't it, she raved on. Mel this and Mel that. Mel's doing this because she doesn't want to share you with anyone, not even with your granddaughter, who's crazy about you, by the way. I wasn't about to send Mel packing back to her apartment at Bellevue for the duration of the kid's visit. I'm sure it'll be fine, I said. I won't be going into work. We'll be able to spend plenty of time together. We will not, Kelly insisted. With that, she hung up on me. I didn't call her back. There wasn't much point. Mel came home a little while later. She whipped out of her work clothes, put on a jogging suit and sneakers, and dragged me with her to the Belltown Terrace rooftop running track. I've often said that my major form of exercise is jumping to conclusions. Mel had set out to change that. At least three times a week she dragged me, usually kicking and screaming, to the running track, where she literally ran circles around me while I walked. All knees are not created equal. Afterward, sitting in the hot tub, she leveled a blue-eyed stare at my direction. What's wrong, she said. You're a million miles away. Are you thinking about Beverly? I was sad about losing Beverly, but what was really bothering me right then was the fact that Mel's good deed of making hotel reservations for Kelly and Scott was about to blow up in both our faces. I nodded and sighed as convincingly as I could manage. It is sad, Mel agreed, especially for Lars. Winnowers often don't fare too well when they're left on their own, which gave me something else to worry about entirely. How was your afternoon, I asked. Mel frowned. More interesting than it should have been, she said. I started tracking down locations on those released sex offenders. I just barely scratched the surface, but already two of them are dead. Dead? Mel nodded. One suicide and one accident. A guy named Les Fordham got sent to prison for molesting his girlfriend's 12-year-old daughter. When he got out, he went to live in southern Oregon, got a job working in a sawmill there, and seemed to be doing all right. Then last summer, for no apparent reason, he turned on the gas on his stove and ended blowing himself to kingdom come. And the accident, I asked? Well, you may remember it, Mel said. The guy's name was Ed Chrisman. He was living up in Bellingham, got all drunk up on a Sunday afternoon last December, the investigators theorized that he stopped off at one of the rest areas on Chuckanut Drive to take a leak. It was cold, so he left the car running while he got out to do his business. I remember, I said. He also left his car in gear. It hit him from behind while he was standing there with his fly in zip. Knocked him off the edge of a cliff into the water. The car went into the drink right along with him, on top of him, as I recall. Smashed him flat. Mel nodded. That's the one. With the weather the way it was, his vehicle wasn't found at the foot of the cliff until almost a week after it happened. The transmission was still in gear when they fished it out of the water. Sounds like he was still in gear, too, I said. Mel glared at me. Not funny, she said. No, I agreed. I suppose not. But if those two guys were already dead, how come they're still on Ross's sex offender list? I believe that's why Ross has me updating the list. Right, I said. Makes sense to me. 
Sounds like me and missing persons. Now let's go see about dinner. One of the things Mel and I share in common is that we're both terrible cooks. Yes, we'd make coffee, and on occasion, toast. Fortunately, since the Denny Regrade is full of restaurants, trendy and otherwise, we're in no danger of starving to death. Our current favorite is a little French place called Le Petit Bistro, two blocks up the street. I'm guessing Le Petit Bistro comes close to being the French approximation of an old-fashioned diner. The food doesn't put on airs, and neither does the waitstaff. Maybe I should stay in Bellevue while the kids are here, Mel suggested as she sipped a glass of red wine. I was having Perrier. No way, I responded. With the funeral and all, Mel continued, emotions are bound to be running high, and daughters can be, well, let's just say they can be a little territorial. Did Kelly say something to you about this? Mel shrugged. Not in so many words. She didn't have to. I got the message. Look, I said, it's bad enough that we have to play hide-and-seek with the guys at work, but I'm damned if I'm going to play the same game with my kids. You're in my life because I want you in my life. Everybody's just going to have to get used to it, Kelly and Scott included. Under the circumstances, that seemed like a perfectly reasonable thing to say, but the next thing I knew, Mel was crying mopping away tears and mascara with her cloth napkin, while the lady who's the co-owner of the restaurant shot daggers at me from her station behind the dessert case. Some days you really can't win. Mel was pretty quiet, make that dead quiet, the rest of the time we were eating. I thought I was in more trouble with her than I was with the lady at the restaurant. On our two-block walk back to Belltown Terrace, however, Mel slipped her arm through mine and leaned into my shoulder. I think that's one of the nicest things anybody's ever said to me, she said. We went home. It was still early, but we went to bed anyway, and not to watch Fox News Channel either. Later, with Mel nestled cozily against my side and sleeping peacefully, I lay awake for a long time. I realized that there were many things I was more than willing to give up for the sake of my children, but Melissa Soames wasn't one of them. With a smile, I finally drifted off to sleep as well. The next morning I woke early, and not wanting to awaken Mel, bailed out of bed. Out in the living room, I dredged my laptop out of my briefcase, booted up, and logged on. Ross Connors had sprung for an agency-wide subscription to LexisNexis, which meant that, with my secret password, well, maybe doghouse isn't all that secret, the whole world of cyber news and public records was open to me without my having to do all the searching myself, with a click of a mouse, as they say. In reality, it took a little more than that, but before long I'd gathered up a fair amount of information. LaShawn's payout from the state was 250000 not that much, considering he'd been wrongfully in prison for seven years. Elaine Manning, LaShawn Tompkins' girlfriend of the King Street Mission, had been sentenced to prison in North Carolina for robbing a Krispy Kreme, a donut shop, for God's sake. Mark Granger, the head of the mission, got screwed up on drugs in college and went to prison for second-degree murder from a drug deal gone bad when he was 20 years old. Got a mail-order degree in divinity of all things while he was still in prison. It turns out there are lots of King Street missions in this country. The one in Seattle was housed in what had once been a derelict flop house near the railroad. In the mid-90s, it had been purchased and refurbished by an outfit called God's Word, LLC. I was still looking for traces of God's Word when I heard the toilet flush. It's one of those newfangled power-assisted things that sound like somebody strangling a cat. The racket gave me enough warning that I was able to log off LexisNexis. By the time Mel started the coffee and came into the living room, I was perusing the online edition of the Seattle Times. Good morning, she said, kissing me hello. You're up early. 
Why do you insist on reading those things online? The paper's right out in the hall. All you have to do is open the door, pick up the paper, and take off the rubber band. I seem to remember you prefer finding your newspapers in pristine condition, I replied. I'm only thinking of you. Thanks, she said. When it comes to lying, I'm getting better all the time. When Mel left for work a little past seven, I decided to pay a visit to the King Street Mission, where I also might find Elaine Manning. The mission was situated in a squat, unimposing old brick building set in a mostly industrial and dying warehouse area that was so far out of the downtown core that parking was actually free. The hand-lettered sign over the front door, complete with crosses on either end, exhorted new arrivals to abandon all dope, ye who enter here. I stepped into a brightly lit multipurpose room that served as dining room, lobby, and library. The white tile floor was polished to a high enough sheen that it would have put most hospital corridors to shame. At one end of the room was a series of tables equipped with several desktop computers. Behind them were shelves lined with books and a series of couches and easy chairs. Behind the desk sat a young, dark-haired woman who might have been attractive had it not been for her mouth, the missing and blackened teeth and swollen gums that are routinely called meth mouth these days. Her name tag said she was Cora. "'Something I can do for you?' she lisped. "'Yes, I'm looking for Pastor Mark. "'He's conducting a Bible study right now,' she said. "'He should be done in ten minutes or so. "'I'll wait,' I said. "'The wall next to the front desk was lined with a series of bulletin boards. "'I wandered over to them and studied the contents. "'One contained what looked like a duty roster "'and included things like cooking shifts, sweeping, bathroom cleaning, garbage takeout, so this was a cooperative effort. People who lived here were expected to keep the place clean and running. That was refreshing. There was also a schedule of classes, computer skills, resume writing, GED, literacy, although I'm not sure how someone who was illiterate would have found his or her way to that last class. There were also three different Bible studies, one Old Testament and two New, on every day of the week. A note next to the class and meeting schedule announced that an in-house memorial service would be held Thursday at 7 p.m. I made a note of that, but I already knew I had a conflict in terms of my grandmother's services. Maybe Kendall Jackson could cover it. May I help you? I turned around to see a Pastor Mark standing behind me. He had arrived soundlessly in a pair of white tennis shoes that were a stark contrast to his black pants black short sleeve shirt, and stiff clerical collar. His graying hair was pulled back in a ponytail. His wire-framed glasses gave him the jaunty look of a withered college professor. The array of jailhouse tattoos that cascaded down both bare arms told another story. I held out my hand. My name's Beaumont, I said, J.P. Beaumont. I'm an investigator for the Washington State Attorney General's office. I believe I saw you yesterday at Mrs. Tompkins' home, but we were never properly introduced. You're a cop? Considering Pastor Mark's divinity degree was one of the jailhouse variety, his question was entirely understandable. Ex-cons and cops have a way of recognizing one another on sight. We tend to run in the same circles. I nodded. I'm looking for Elaine Manning. I'm afraid I can't help you, then. Pastor Mark replied. Sister Elaine's not here. Something steely came into his tone. You have no idea where she might be, I asked. None at all. When did she leave? Sometime Saturday morning, I'm not sure when. And what about Friday evening, I continued. Where were you around 7 p.m. or so? Kendall Jackson had told me that was the approximate time LaShawn Tompkins had been shot. Pastor Mark gave me a slow but confident smile, a Cheshire cat kind of smile, as though he knew way more than I did. I was right here, he said. I was here with everyone else, eating dinner between six and seven. Seven sharp is the beginning of evening Bible study, which I conducted myself that evening. New Testament, Book of John, chapters six and seven. Cora can give you a list of the people who are at dinner, as well as the people in my study session, if you wish. Beyond that, however, I've been advised to answer no additional questions without my attorney being present. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have work to do. 
Clerical collar or not, Pastor Mark Granger was an experienced but oddly polished ex-con, a felon who knew exactly when it was time to lawyer up. I noticed something else about him, too. Underneath that polished exterior lurked a seething anger that he managed to hold in check, but only just barely. And men like that, the ones with explosive tempers lurking right beneath the surface, are often the most dangerous. I had left my cell phone in the car while I visited the mission, and again the phone was awash in messages. I hurried through them one by one. Hi, Dad, Scott said cheerfully. Mel wanted me to call you with our flight information, but we'll be renting a car, so you don't need to worry about coming to pick us up. Are there dinner plans? Should we go there directly, or just check into the hotel and wait for marching orders? Next one was from my son-in-law. Hello, it's me. Jeremy. He sounded nervous, and I can understand why. We hardly ever talk on the phone. We're in Salem at the Burger King, he continued. Kelly's in the restroom changing Kyle's diaper. We'll probably be in Seattle around two or so. I guess we'll be coming straight to the house. I think that's what Kelly wanted me to tell you. If it isn't, I'll call back. If Kelly had charged her husband with calling me, did that mean she and I weren't speaking? Or at least she wasn't speaking to me? Then Mel. Harry wants to know if the funeral is a private affair or if it would be all right if some of the SHIT guys came along, Mel said. I told him it was fine, but now I'm wondering. Should I have checked with Lars? Had we better order some food and reserve the party room? Call me. Next was Min's Warehouse. Mr. Beaumont, when you were in on Monday, we were told that you needed your tux in time for Friday. It's ready now. Could you please stop by at your convenience and try it on? Mel again. I've been trying to think of where we should go to dinner with a new baby and all. I finally decided that we'd be better off eating at home. So I've called that new catering place, Magical Meals. They'll deliver a roast beef dinner with all the trimmings to the condo, complete with someone to serve and clean up. If you think that's a bad idea, in fact, it seemed nothing short of brilliant. Then a message from Lars. Yeah, sure, he said. If you have time, give me a call. I called Lars back first. What's up, I asked. I think I'd like to go to a meeting, he said, if it's not too much trouble. I'm on my way. I called Mel back and breathed a small thank you when I reached her answering machine instead of her. Busy with Lars, I said, taking him to a meeting. Dinner sounds great. I forgot about the tux, but on the way to Queen Anne Gardens, I remembered to call the flower shop and got the flowers ordered. Several different arrangements, big ones, spare no expense. So I may not be great, but at least I'm not entirely useless. Lars came out to the car looking like death warmed over. I'd managed to find a noontime meeting. This one over on the east side at a place called Angelo's. I'd been there before, years ago. So had Lars. Thank you, he said once he got in the car. What's going on, I asked. He shook his head. I cannot believe toast women, he said. The first one knocked on my door this morning to see if I needed someone to help me with breakfast. Yeah, sure, I can eat my own breakfast. And it's been that way all day long, one of them after another. Are we going to a meeting just to get away from a bunch of pushy women, I wondered? So we went to the meeting. Then, because Lars was in no hurry to go home, we went by and picked up my tux. And then, because he still didn't want to go back to Queen Anne Gardens, I took him along in a jaunt through the grocery store to stock up on essentials, and then home to Belltown Terrace, where he settled into my recliner and snored like a jackhammer for the remainder of the afternoon. Then, because the house was still quiet, relatively quiet due to Lars Olympian snoring, I called up Lexus Nexus one more time and just for the hell of it typed in the name Anthony David Cosgrove. Within seconds of typing the name, there it was, a whole list of hits concerning Anthony David Cosgrove. To my surprise, one of them was only two months old. It came from an obscure magazine called Electronics Engineering Journal. It was an amazingly dull article on corruption and payoffs among defense contractors. The reference to Cosgrove came near the end of the article. According to industry analyst Thomas Dortman, 
Payoffs with dollar signs on them are the ones that gain big headlines, but payoffs that result in job offers are almost standard operating procedure. One of the earliest Dortmund recalls happened at Boeing in the early 80s. In that instance, charges came to nothing, however, when the alleged whistleblower, electronics engineer Anthony David Cosgrove, disappeared in the Mount St. Helens explosion. That was it. But still, it was intriguing. The missing persons reported said nothing about Cosgrove being involved in any kind of at-work investigation. And Deanne hadn't mentioned anything to me about it either. But she had been a little girl at the time. I jotted down Thomas Dortmund's name. If, as he claimed, he had personal knowledge of what was going on at Boeing in the early 80s, maybe he had personal knowledge of Anthony David Cosgrove as well. I was about to put Dortmund's name into my search engine when the phone rang. It was the doorman calling to let me know that my daughter and her family were downstairs. Could he send them up? Of course, I said. After that, everything went straight to hell in a handbasket. I expected Kyle to be a handful. After all, he was only a month or so old. And Lars? Of course, he would need attention. His wife had just died. And Kayla? She's four. What could you expect? What I didn't anticipate was that Kelly would be more of a pain in the neck than all of the rest of them put together. Because, as I had gathered from our non-phone conversation, she really wasn't speaking to me. She spoke to Lars. She spoke to Jeremy, who looked as though he would much prefer being anywhere else in the universe to being cooped up in his father-in-law's domicile. Kelly spoke to Kayla. When she went into the guest room to feed Kyle and put him down for a nap, I went gunning for Jeremy. I found him hiding out in the family room with Kayla, who was watching a cartoon about someone named Elmer or Elmo, something like that. "'What's going on with Kelly?' I asked. Jeremy shook his head and shrugged. "'Beats me,' he said miserably. "'All I know is I can't do anything right. "'I makes two of us,' at which point Kelly suddenly reappeared in the doorway. "'Let's go,' she announced. Jeremy said, "'Where?' To the hotel, Kelly said. Obviously, that's somebody else's room. I wouldn't want to be in the way. No, Kayla wailed. I don't want to go. In actual fact, it was someone else's closet. Mel didn't use the bedroom at all, but with Mel's clothing and makeup clearly evident in both the bathroom and the closet, I could see how Kelly might have gotten that mistaken idea into her head. I thought we were going to stay for dinner, Jeremy objected. We'll eat at McDonald's, Kelly said firmly. Kayla will like that better anyway. I don't want to go, Kayla said. I want to stay here with Gumpaw. At which point the telephone rang again. Your caterer is here, the doorman announced. Should I send her up? By all means, I said. Kayla was still screeching as the elevator headed for the lobby. It was enough to make me long for the old days and the relative peace and quiet of the Seattle PD Homicide Squad. The catered dinner was not a huge success. In fact, although the food itself was excellent, the company was lacking. Kelly and Jeremy did not attend. Lars wasn't hungry. Scott and Cherise showed up an hour and a half later than expected due to their Seattle-bound aircraft, having had some kind of mechanical problem while it was still on the ground at SFO. Mel didn't show up for dinner at all, and she didn't call. About 9 p.m. when I came back from returning Lars to his digs at Queen Anne Gardens, Mel was home. I found her at the dining room table, still damp from taking a shower and clad only in a robe. She was chowing down on leftovers. How'd it go, she asked. Could have been better, I muttered. Where have you been? Crime scene, she replied. We were out in the boonies far enough that we ended up in a telecommunications black hole. Cell phones don't work there. What kind of crime scene, I asked. Homicide, she said. What did you think it would be? SHIT hasn't often called in on homicide crime scenes. First response usually falls to local agencies and jurisdictions. It turns out that the victim is one of mine, one of my registered sex offenders, Mel said. The guy's name is Cates. Alan Christopher Cates. 
We'll need dental records to get a positive, and we won't have those from the Department of Corrections until tomorrow at the earliest. Cates lived by himself in a little camper shell out in the woods, sort of like the guy down in Oregon. He wasn't big on friends and family since he'd been dead for a month or longer before anyone bothered to report him missing. What did he die of? A single bullet wound to the head. It was fired from point-blank range. Blew out most of his skull. Self-inflicted? Not likely, she answered, since no weapon was found at the scene. That makes, what, now, three of your guys, as you call them, dead? One in Oregon, one Bellingham, and now this? More like seven, Mel said, as she stood to clear her plate and carry the remaining containers of roast beef, mashed potatoes, and gravy back to the fridge. I thought Ross wanted me to verify addresses of living sex offenders. I had no idea so many of them would have croaked. And the dead guys are all over the map, literally. Two now in Washington, one in Idaho, Oregon, and Montana, and two more in Arizona. So your guys are dying like flies. What of? Mel looked troubled. It does strike me as odd. I've only worked my way through a hundred and fifty names or so, and seven dead strikes me as a pretty high number. These are reasonably young guys, mostly in their thirties and forties. I think something's amiss here, and I don't know what. I also think that's why Ross has me looking into it, because, as you said, they're dying like flies. We went from the table to the window seat, where Mel moved a cushion and unearthed one of Kayla's toys, a red hand puppet. Elmo, Mel said, slipping the puppet onto her hand. I never heard of him, I told her. How do you know this guy's name is Elmo? Mel laughed. I'm a detective, remember, she said, whacking me playfully on the noggin with Elmo's semi-hard head. I get paid for knowing things. Actually, my niece loves anything, Elmo. And what's your excuse for not knowing? And where did everybody go? I expected to come home to a house full of company. And so I gave her a blow-by-blow -blow description of my disastrous family afternoon and evening, including the part about Kelly decamping in a huff when she found Mel's personal items lurking in the guest room closet and bathroom. Sounds like she's suffering from a severe case of separation anxiety, Mel said. She's afraid of losing you to me. That's ridiculous, I ordered. Kelly isn't losing me. I'm not going anywhere. She just had a baby, Mel pointed out. Her hormones are all out of whack. You need to be patient. She's the one who could use some patience, I grumbled. Shaking her head, Mel changed the subject. Did you ever get around to making some kind of arrangements for a post-funeral reception for Lars? Damn, I said. I take that to mean no. I nodded. She immediately reached for a cell phone. I'll call Rita then, she said. I'm sure she'll do it. Who's Rita? Rita Davenport. She runs the same catering company that served dinner tonight. She and I are both board members of Sasek. Why don't you check with the manager on party room availability, and I'll see what I can do about rounding up some food. While I reserved it via the landline, Mel made arrangements for magical meals to provide food and beverages. You do good work, I told Mel when she put the phone back down. Thank you, she said, turning to give me a long, inviting kiss. I'm actually a multi-talented girl. And that was absolutely true. I awakened the next morning to the smell of brewing coffee and to Mel's voice on the telephone telling Harry I. Ball in no uncertain terms that Alan Cates or no Alan Cates, Beverly's funeral was important and Mel was taking the day off. The man's already been dead for more than a month, she said. If King County comes up with anything today, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to bring me up to speed tomorrow. I don't like funerals, probably because I've been to far too many of them in my time, and I expected this one to be bad news. I realized it was going to be different, however, as soon as we walked into the chapel, where an invisible organ was playing Love is Lovelier the second time around. The back two rows were packed with people, mostly women and one lone man, from Queen Anne Gardens. Also near the back was the contingent from SHIT, Harry and the two other guys from Squad B, Brad Norton and Aaron Oliver. Close to the front were my friends Ron and Amy Peters, along with their three kids, Ralph and Mary Ames, were also in attendance. 
The whole front of the chapel was arrayed with floral arrangements. Maybe I had overdone it a little, but not that much. As Beverly had specified, there were two separate boxes of cremains on the altar. Between them stood a color photo of a beaming Beverly Piedmont Jensen, dressed for once in her life in sparkling formal attire. Lars leaned over me. Yeah, sure, he said. Just look at all the flowers. Who do you think sent them? No idea, I said. Robert Staunton, the chaplain from Queen Anne Gardens, officiated at the ceremony and did a credible job of it. It was clear from his remarks that he knew Lars and Beverly well, and that he had liked and respected them. What he had to say was, in fact, a celebration of the love and caring they had brought to each other late in life. Toward the end of the service, Staunton opened the proceedings for comments from friends and family. I was surprised when Kelly handed Kyle over to Jeremy and stepped up to the microphone. I didn't meet my great-grandmother at all until just a few years ago, Kelly said. But I know she loved us even when we weren't together. And I'm grateful to have known her at all. And I'm grateful to Lars for making her so happy. That pretty well said it for me. There wasn't a single thing I could have added to that statement, so I didn't try. When it came time to leave the chapel, Lars picked up the photo and carried it with him for the remainder of the day clutching it to his chest as though it were a talisman that would drive away the several elderly women who did tend to cluster around him. As far as they were concerned, however, Lars Jensen's opinion to the contrary, I never saw anything at all in the women's behavior that was the least bit inappropriate. They seemed like nice, ordinary women, who were clucking in order to express sincere concern for someone who had lost his mate. Period. If one of them was dead set on maneuvering Lars into the sack, I didn't see any evidence of it. We made it through the reception in fairly good shape. I had been prepared to take the whole group out to dinner, but Scott let me know that wasn't necessary. Jeremy and Charisse haven't spent much time in Seattle, he said. We're going to go out for pizza, and then tomorrow we're going to go sightseeing. Somehow the idea of my kids spending some adult time together because they wanted to, without squabbling and without parental enforcement, was an idea that warmed me. By six, everybody was gone. Lars had returned home. The floral arrangements had been dispersed, some to Queen Anne Gardens, some to the front lobby of Belltown Terrace, and some to our living room. I was in the recliner with my feet up when Mel's cell phone rang. I listened in on her part of the conversation, but her noncommittal yeses and uh-huhs didn't tell me much. By the time she ended the call, though, she was visibly upset. Who was that, I asked. Lenny Kesselman, she said, head of CSI for King County. What's the matter? The bullet from the Kate's homicide scene is missing. Maybe one of the detectives who was there yesterday picked it up and failed to put it in the log. It's missing from the wall, Mel clarified. We all saw the hole in the wood paneling inside the camper. Since it didn't penetrate the outside of the camper shell, we assumed it was lodged between the paneling and the shell and was probably stuck somewhere in the insulation. So they cut out that chunk of paneling and dug through the insulation, but the bullet wasn't there. When they took the piece of paneling in for processing, they found evidence that would be consistent with the bullet having been removed from there at the time of the shooting. If Alan Cates' killer had been tough enough to wade through fresh blood and gore in order to retrieve damning evidence of his crime, it was likely we were dealing with someone who was appallingly cold-blooded. Most murderers don't come equipped with the presence of mind to clean up after themselves. Most of them aren't that smart. What about shoe prints? I asked. What I saw would be consistent with a killer who wore booties. That meant the guy was definitely crime scene savvy. Maybe our killer is a cop, Mel ventured. Unfortunately, given the circumstances, that conclusion wasn't at all outside the realm of possibility. That would certainly explain why Ross Connors is involved. Wouldn't it just, Mel agreed. With that, she once more reached for her phone. Ross Connor's SHIT squad is the first place I've ever worked that isn't all hung up on everybody going through channels and across desks. I find that very refreshing. 
Yes, Harry I. Ball runs our unit, but Ross values the hand-picked people he's chosen as his investigators, and he trusts them. So it didn't surprise me that the call Mel placed was to the Attorney General. She gave him a brief rundown of what Kesselman had told her, then she started hedging. I suppose I could meet you at the office, or else my place in Bellevue, in about twenty minutes. After a glance in my direction, Mel replied, Ten minutes? Sure, that'll be fine. One of us will be downstairs to let you in. To my astonishment, she was blushing as she closed her phone. So who told Ross we were living together? I sure as hell didn't. Well, somebody did, she said. He's at a meeting at the Fairmont. He'll be here in ten minutes. He's coming here? In the old days, the pre-Melissa Soames days, an unexpected evening visit from him would have necessitated my knocking on my neighbor's doors in search of a borrowed cup of spirits. Now that Mel was living here, however, we had a moderately decent wine cellar. The best I could do was offer Ross a glass of wine from a twenty-dollar bottle of imported French Bordeaux purchased from Mel's wine merchant of choice, Costco. While Mel went downstairs to collect our visitor, I opened the bottle, set out some glasses, and poured myself a tonic and tonic over ice. When Ross showed up, he looked surprisingly distressed, and I could tell he'd already had a drink or two. This is ostensibly a condolence call, he said brusquely as Mel led him into the room. Other than that, no meeting has taken place, got it? Got it, I said. I poured him a glass of wine. He took a long sip without really tasting it. So let's go over this Kate's thing again, he said to Mel, from the top. He listened without comment as Mel recounted the story. Any ideas, he asked, when she finished. Well, Bo and I were speculating just before you got here, Mel replied. We're wondering if maybe Kate's killer could be a cop, or at the very least, someone with a law enforcement background. Ross shifted uneasily in his chair, and since he had appropriated my recliner, I knew it wasn't that uncomfortable. Could be, he said, then he sighed and continued. Our killer could be a cop or an ex-cop or maybe even a correctional officer who's systematically targeting ex-cons. We need to know if this is an inside job. That's why I put both of you on the two separate cases, with Mel running the sexual offender roundup and you on the LaShawn Tompkins incident. That way, if the two cases do link up, I'm hoping to localize the problem. Mel gave me a look that clearly said, Who the hell is LaShawn Tompkins? Hoping to divert her attention, I spoke up. Are you saying you think we're dealing with two separate issues or one? Ross nodded. I'm not sure, he said, but it's possible they're not separate at all. He peered bleakly at Mel over the rims of his glasses, the one in his hand and the pair perched on his nose. The report you sent me yesterday morning prior to finding Mr. Kate's body indicated you had found six dead victims. Let's assume, for argument's sake, that a few of them aren't related, but the rest do seem suspicious, not so much when taken individually, as I'm sure was intended, but certainly when taken together. Were each of those cases thoroughly investigated? I can't say one way or the other, Mel answered. They were labeled suspicious deaths. Maybe whoever did this counted on that, on the idea that local authorities wouldn't expend a lot of time or expense in resolving these cases. After all, who gives a damn about one dead crook, more or less? Clearly Ross Connors did. These guys were all dying on his watch. It's going to explode once it hits the media, he said glumly. At that point, there'll be hell to pay, regardless of who's actually doing the killing here. And guess who's going to have to shoulder the blame? For the better part of twenty years, Ross Connors had navigated Washington State's stormy political seas with apparent impunity. I suspect that, for the first time, he was encountering a crisis that could leave him vulnerable. So what we need to know is who is behind this, Ross said. Who he is, and how he's locating and targeting his victims. Finding them is easy, Mel said. So far, all the dead guys on my list are sexual offenders with their addresses posted on the Internet. But that doesn't explain LaShawn Tompkins, Connor said. He wouldn't be on any registered sexual offender list because he's not a sexual predator, per se, since he was actually exonerated on the rape charge. 
Well, if he's not listed, I said, maybe his death has nothing to do with the others. Ross heaved a sigh. He may not have been guilty, but the fact that he's out of prison now makes him an ex-con. What neither of you know is that three more dead ex-con cases turned up today. One in New Mexico, one in Nevada, and one more here in Washington. I remembered Mel saying her cases were all over the map. We've got someone twisted here, Ross continued morosely. Some egomaniac who's appointed himself judge, jury, and executioner. From what you've told me, whoever killed Alan Cates is familiar with crime scene investigation and forensics. That's true in the other cases as well, at least as far as I perused the files, Mel said. In each case, the assailant left behind almost no trace evidence. So, he's wily, I said, and he's also someone who has access to prison release records, I added. That's why I'm saying it's a rogue cop, Ross concluded. That's what I've been thinking ever since Todd brought it to my attention. Either a bad cop or a corrections worker gone postal. Todd who? I asked. Ross squirmed in his seat once more. Uh, Todd Hatcher, he answered. A guy who works at my office. An attorney, I asked. No, Ross said. Actually, he's an economist. I almost choked in a sip of icy tonic. An economist, I croaked. Are you kidding? Not at all, Ross returned. Ever heard of forensic economics? Mel and I shook our heads in unison. But before last summer, neither had I, Ross said. But then Todd turned up. He had just picked up a Ph.D. in economics. He claimed that by doing a statistical analysis of our current and recent prison population, he could create a computer model that would predict our recidivism rates tell us how many prison beds we would need in the future, where, when, and what kind. For instance, he thinks he can sort out the exact number of geriatric facilities we'll eventually need as our prison population ages. Believe me, those kinds of studies can cost big bucks. But here was this one very motivated guy who wanted to do it for practically nothing. He had made a similar proposal for his dissertation, but his faculty advisor had turned him down. So, you took him on, Mel said. An economist, not a cop. That's right, Ross agreed. So, I hired Hatcher. I gave him an office and a computer and turned him loose with oodles of information. Shortly after he started doing his study, however, Todd hit on an anomaly. A sudden spike in mortality rates among recently released inmates. How recent a spike, I asked. In the last... Year and a half or so, Ross shook his head and stared at the depths of his almost empty wine glass. If it turned out a serial killer with close to a dozen victims could be traced back to his administration, Ross's days as attorney general were probably numbered. If we discover present or former law enforcement personnel are involved, Ross resumed, I'll have to bring in the feds, no question, but I don't want to do that until I'm reasonably sure what we're dealing with. On the other hand, we simply must put a stop to this. Yes, the victims are some pretty bad dudes, but they've also served their time and paid their debts to society. What about Mr. Tompkins, Mel said. On the surface, her question was directed at Ross, but the look she sent in my direction said otherwise. What's the story with him, she continued. Whatever it was must have happened before I came to town. That was true. LaShawn Tompkins had been both wrongly convicted and rightly released long before Melissa Soames turned up in Bellevue, as Ross Connor's latest addition to SHIT. Ask Bo here, Ross said helpfully. At this point, I'm sure he knows far more about it than I do. So I told them what I knew, pretty much. I left out the part about Kendall Jackson working with me on the QT as far as attempting to locate Elaine Manning was concerned. I'm still hoping maybe it is a love triangle, I finished somewhat lamely. And maybe when we locate the girlfriend, I hope so too, Ross interrupted, but I'm not holding my breath. You can see why I turned to the two of you, though. Of all my people, you two are uniquely situated for keeping something like this quiet. Yes, Mel agreed, sending yet another scathing glance in my direction. I can certainly see why you might think that. Mel, Ross went on, you'll need to gather up all the information we have on these offenders from all applicable jurisdictions, so 
Todd will be able to organize the information for us. Once we look at all the cases together, we may find there are common denominators, details no one has noticed. He reached for the bottle and emptied it into his own glass without offering any to Mel. I count ten victims so far, Mel said. It seems to me that's worthy of a task force approach. If it comes to light that you've only put three investigators on this and one of them is an economist instead of a cop, it's not going to sound like you're taking this seriously. Oh, I'm serious, all right, Ross said, very serious. What I'm hoping is that the two of you will point me in the right direction. If it turns out our prime suspect is a cop, let me know. With that, Ross rose unsteadily to his feet. I'll call Harry in the morning, he said. Tell him that you two are working a special project for me for the foreseeable future. And considering the situation, it might be better if you work from home instead of the office. Mel escorted Ross downstairs at the elevator and hooked him back up with his car and driver. When she returned, just as I expected, she took me to the woodshed over the Tompkins situation. Maybe you'd better tell me about your friend LaShawn, she said. This time don't leave anything out. And so I told her the whole story, including the parts about working Sub Rosa with Detective Kendall Jackson. I expected all hell would break loose, but it didn't. When I finished, Mel stood up and stretched. Time to go night-night, she said. It's turned into a hell of a day, and tomorrow isn't going to be any better. A little later, when we were lying in bed, I was almost asleep when Mel said, So, how do you feel about all this? Even half asleep and without having any idea of the actual topic of discussion, I was smart enough to recognize this as a trick question, almost as volatile as the age-old do I look fat in this? Feel, I said dimly. About our being partners, she said. That was the first thing Barbara Galvin told me about you when I showed up at SHIT. She said Bo doesn't work with partners. Mel was right about my wanting to avoid investigative partnerships. During my time in homicide at Seattle PD, I felt I'd been exceptionally hard on partners. As far as I was concerned, my partner's biggest problem, their single common liability, had been their star-crossed association with me. My relationship with Melissa Soames, however, was entirely different. I was in love with Mel. On the surface of it, that should have made me that much more reluctant to put her in any danger. But I'd seen how Mel reacted when she was under fire. I knew that if things got tough, I could trust her implicitly. When you're out in the real world dodging bullets, it doesn't get any better than that. Ross Connors is a little behind the times, I said, pulling her close. We were partners long before he got around to saying so. When you awaken to the enticing smell of freshly brewed coffee, it's easy to think that all's right with the world. Mel's side of the bed was cool to the touch. There was a hint of floral fragrance lingering beneath the aroma of coffee. That would be her shampoo. So Mel had been up long enough to shower and make coffee. I got up and wandered out into the dining room where I found my two daily crossword puzzle pages, removed them from their, for me, completely extraneous newspapers, and laid them out on the dining room table. Mel came down the hall a moment after I poured my first mug of coffee. She was fully dressed. I'm going to go see Lenny, she announced, slipping on a pair of low-heeled pumps. I knew that meant she was on her way to visit the crime scene folks at King County to check out the missing bullet situation. I've talked to Todd, she added. He's on his way here. Here? I'm sure I sounded more than a bit territorial. After all, a man's home is his castle, and the idea of having an itinerant economist show up on my doorstep, along with my first cup of coffee, did not compute. Yes, here. Ross doesn't want us working on this in the office, remember? Todd's bringing abstracts of the files and all the cases Ross mentioned last night, and the ones on my list, too. She gave me a goodbye kiss and left, steaming travel cup firmly in hand. Able to ignore the Cross Lake traffic reports for once, I settled in at the table with my own hit of caffeine. I doubted Ross Connors would begrudge me the time it would take for me to whip through the Friday New York Times puzzle. I was making excellent progress when my cell phone rang. 
I figured it was Mel, who had forgotten something, but the number wasn't one I recognized. Mr. It was a male voice, a relatively young male voice. Butmont? The name is Beaumont. My name's Donald, he said. Donnie Cosgrove. I, I think you talked to my wife earlier this week. Of course, Deanne. What can I do for you, Mr. Cosgrove? I told her I was going to go clean the jerk's clock, but Deanne begged me to talk to you instead. Wait a minute, I said. What are you talking about? Jack, he said. Jack Lawrence, Deanne's stepfather. He came roaring through here yesterday while I was at work, yelling and raising hell. Threw our whole household into an uproar. Well, what was he upset about? That Deanne had talked to you, wanted to know how dare she bring this back up after all these years. Told her she should learn to mind her own damn business and let sleeping dogs lie. Stuff like that. Can you believe it? Cosgrove demanded, his voice shaking in outrage. He actually said that to her about her father, called him a sleeping dog, and in her own home, too. You're saying Mr. Lawrence seemed to think your wife had something to do with instigating our renewed interest in Anthony Cosgrove's disappearance? Evidently. How did he find out about it? Deanne called her mother to see if you had contacted them. Carol is Deanne's mother, after all, so we try to maintain some kind of normal relationship with her. As normal as you can with a nutcase like Jack lurking in the background. Carol must have mentioned the conversation to Jack. He hit the roof and drove all the way down from Leavenworth to bitch Deanne out about it. I just wish I'd been there when it happened. But, of course, Lawrence is such a coward he'd never tackle someone like me. He'd rather terrorize Deanne and the kids. Maybe you should consider swearing out a restraining order against him, I suggested. I've read about what happens to women with restraining orders, Cosgrove said bitterly. A lot of them end up dead. Has your father-in-law been violent toward Deanne in the past? Well, why do you think she moved out of the house when she was in high school, Donnie returned. That's why she went to live with her grandmother. I couldn't help but be struck by Jack Lawrence's over-the-top response to learning that we were re-examining a case that, on the surface, had opened and closed twenty years ago. What can you tell me about the man, I asked. About Jack? You mean other than the fact that he's an asshole and a bully? Other than that. Jack Lawrence is a my-way-or-the-highway kind of guy, Donnie answered. Ex-Marine, tough as nails, very opinionated. Always knows everything about everything. Is there a chance that Jack is distressed about our investigating Tony Cosgrove's disappearance because he was somehow involved in it? There was a long pause before Donnie answered. Maybe. What do you mean? It always struck me as a little too convenient that Tony disappears and the next thing you know, Jack and Carol are a couple. You don't accept as fact the idea that Tony Cosgrove died in the eruption, I asked. Not really, Donnie said. I always thought it was strange that nobody ever turned up even the smallest trace of him or his vehicle. Well, I had to agree with him there. I believe Deanne mentioned something to me about Jack Lawrence working for Boeing at about the same time her parents were there, I said. Was that the case? Well, Tony started working there sometime in the late 60s or early 70s, Donnie said. That's where he and Carol met. Jack turned up later. After retiring from a 20-year hitch in the military, he hired on with Boeing in sales. Carol ended up being his secretary. Carol told you this, or Deanne, I asked. Neither one, Donnie answered. I worked for Boeing for a little while back when I first got my degree and before I moved over to Fluke, which is where I am now. But back then, when people at Boeing heard I was the guy who'd married Tony Cosgrove's daughter... A couple of them took me aside and handed around that maybe Tony's disappearance wasn't an act of nature after all. Did you ever ask anyone to look into it, I asked. No, I was just out of school and new on the job. I couldn't afford to risk drawing attention. Why not? Well, despite what people think, the aerospace industry is actually a small, closely knit group. And these days, electronics engineers are a dime a dozen, especially in India. That's why I'm calling you on my cell, Mr. Beaumont, and not from my office, either. But to have Jack come charging into the house the way he did yesterday was just too much. That's about when I figured it out. Donnie was upset that his father-in-law had stopped by and raised hell with Deanne. But Donnie wanted someone else to do something about it. 
namely me. The fact of the matter is, raising hell with scumbags is a big part of my job description. I'm glad you called, I told him. I'll be looking into it. I had read the article in Electronics Engineering Journal and had a pretty good idea that a defense analyst named Thomas Dortman had been one of Anthony Cosgrove's co-workers at Boeing in the late 70s and early 80s. So what are you going to do now, Donnie asked. Will you go talk to him? For a moment I thought Donnie was asking if I was going to talk to Dortman. Then I realized he was actually referring to his erstwhile father-in-law, stepfather-in-law, Jack Lawrence. I'm sure I will eventually, I assured him, but not till after I check out a few things first. And you'll let us know what you find out, Donnie asked. I mean, you'll let Deanne know. Believe me, I told him. I'll let you both know. Call waiting buzzed just then. I ended the call with Donnie Cosgrove. Mr. Hatcher to see you, the doorman announced when I switched to the other line. Good, I said. Send him up. I'll confess to having had certain preconceived notions about our visiting economist. Wide load build, horn-rimmed glasses, mop of long, greasy hair. In fact, Todd Hatcher looked like a cowboy, just in off the range, in boots and Levi's, and wearing a dripping Stetson and a soggy leather jacket. In one hand, he carried a bulging backpack that was just as damp as he was. Mr. Beaumont, he asked as I opened the door. I nodded. Welcome. Come on in, I said. Make yourself at home. Removing his hat, he banged some of the excess water off it in the hallway before stepping into the apartment. His blonde hair was cut in a short but not quite military buzz cut. Without even shedding his jacket, Hatcher was immediately drawn to the windows of the far side of the living room. Wow, he exclaimed, looking out on the gray expanse of water that was Elliott Bay and Puget Sound. What an amazing view. It's even more amazing when it isn't raining, I told him. Can I take your coat? He peeled it off and handed it over, revealing the unapologetic pearl-buttoned western shirt underneath. Coffee, I asked. If it's not too much trouble, black, please. By the time I returned to the living room, he had abandoned the view in favor of sitting in the window seat and examining the room itself. Growing up in Benson, I never could have imagined a place like this. Benson, I asked. Benson, Arizona. I went back to the kitchen and poured a second cup of coffee for me. First impressions are important. The fact that he looked like a hick just off the farm, or ranch, didn't inspire a whole lot of confidence. I took my coffee and returned to my recliner. What brought you to Washington, I asked. An Ingmar Hansen Fellowship in Economics, he said. I came here to finish my Ph.D., I didn't know Ingmar Hansen from a hole in the wall, but clearly Todd Hatcher was a hell of a lot smarter than he looked. It's done now, he said. My degree was awarded last June. I had a couple of offers to teach, but I wanted to do this first. He glanced down at the sodden backpack. By this, you mean the study for Ross Connors, he nodded. I had hoped to be able to use it for my dissertation. That would have broken new ground, a dissertation about something useful. But my advisor wasn't having any of it. He told me no one's interested in analyzing the need for geriatric prison beds, which, of course, is patently stupid, since prisons are still one of this country's growth industries, and the prison population is aging everywhere. I tried to picture Todd Hatcher in his cowboy boots and Stetson sauntering across the U-Dub's beloved Red Square. Talk about out of place. It came as no surprise to me that Todd and one or more of his professors wouldn't have seen eye to eye. So what's the plan, I asked. Mel told me I should work on the spreadsheet here. That way I can consult with one or the other of you as I go along. If we're all going over the files and picking out what strikes each of us as important, we'll probably come up with better data. Once we have that, we'll run a paradox analysis and see if anything pops. For all the sense it made to me, that last sentence could just as well have been uttered in Russian or Chinese. So what do you need from me, I asked. He opened the backpack and took out a slim laptop. His boots may have been on their last legs, as it were, but his computer was state-of-the-art. A place to spread out and work, he said. I pointed toward the granite counter of the breakfast bar. Will that do? Sure, he said. 
What about logging on? There I had him. We've got a Wi-Fi network complete with a broadband connection. Cool, he said. That remark came with no need of translation. I was gratified that our telecommunication system measured up to his expectations, and I was also glad that despite the considerable difference in our ages, cool was still cool. Somehow I found that reassuring. Todd Hatcher was hustling around and setting up shop when my phone rang. Hey, there you are, Detective Jackson said. I tried calling your office, and they said you were off. Off wasn't quite the same as out, but I let it pass. Manning didn't show up at the memorial service, Jackson said, but we got a lead on her this morning. According to our sources, she's staying in a shelter up on Aurora. Hank and I are on our way to interview her right now. I'll let you know what we find out. Maybe I should talk to her, too. Want me to ride along, meet you there? Considering your persona non grata status around here, maybe that's not such a good idea, he said. I can give you a rundown of what we learn. I want to talk to her myself, I said. What's the address? You're not listening, he said irritably. I'll give you a call when we finish up the interview and let you know where to find her. I don't want you showing up while we're still there. No, I agreed. Of course you wouldn't. And remember, Jackson added, no matter what, you didn't hear any of this from me. That I understood completely. My next order of business was to see about tracking down Thomas Dortman. With Todd, now ensconced at the bar, I took myself and my laptop to my recliner and went looking for Thomas Dortman. He turned out to be a freelance writer and sometime Fox News contributor, whose website's homepage said he lived in the Seattle area, although his 728 phone prefix ended at a downtown location. I called the number and left a message telling him who I was and asking him to call. And then, because there was always a chance he was off gallivanting around somewhere, I shot him an email as well. I then concentrated primarily on the file concerning Ed Chrisman, the genius who had been taking a leak when his own vehicle knocked him off a cliff and into the drink. I learned Chrisman was anything but a Boy Scout, with several increasingly serious scrapes with the law, before he had finally been sentenced for sixteen years after brutally raping his ex-wife. According to the record, very little usable forensic evidence had remained in Chrisman's smashed vehicle. The keys had been found still in the ignition. Chrisman's wallet had been stuffed under the seat with money and credit cards intact. If anyone else had been involved in what happened to him, robbery had not been part of the program. The file did reference a single scrap of dark material— not matching any of Chrisman's clothing, that had been found caught in the front passenger door. Other than saying the cotton broadcloth was either blue or black, there was no way of telling if it had been lodged there on the day Chrisman had taken his last Sunday drive, or if it had somehow predated the day of his death. I kept looking at the clock, hoping Mel would come home or that Kendall Jackson would call me in time for me to go see Elaine Manning prior to LaShawn Tompkins' funeral. By noon, however, it became clear that neither of those things was going to happen. I gave Todd carte blanche to rummage through our two-day-old leftovers, but he was so absorbed in his work I doubted he'd notice I was gone, to say nothing of remembering to eat. Down in the Rainier Valley I was early enough that I was able to park close to the church. I was so early, in fact, that the doors to the African Bible Baptist Church were not yet open. So I walked the length and breadth of Church Street and talked to any number of Edmund Tompkins' neighbors. No one had seen anything, or at least no one would admit to having seen anything. Finally, I spoke to a gas station attendant from a BP station who reported having noticed a single white woman, a nun, walking in the neighborhood shortly before LaShawn Tompkins was shot. I didn't ask him if he had happened to mention any of this to the other detectives because I was sure he had. It turns out the other detectives hadn't happened to mention it to me. In this business, though, you can't afford to take that stuff personally. Did she look suspicious, I asked? The man laughed outright. Are you kidding? I figured that nun was just like one of those Jehovah's Witnesses babes that are always coming around here. Scary, but not suspicious. She was wearing a habit then? You mean one of those black robe things? Yes, she was. "'carrying her Bible and her umbrella. 
Did you get a good look at her? No, just because she was dumb enough to stand outside in the rain didn't mean I was. But I know she was white, if that's what you're asking. It was what I was asking, and I made a note of his comment. If a nun had been out there in the street at the time LaShawn Tompkins was shot, there was an outside chance that she might have seen a vehicle coming or going. I needed to track the woman down and talk to her. By 1.30 and still on foot, I made my way back up Martin Luther King Jr. way to the African Bible Baptist Church. This was, as I remembered, Edna Mae Tompkins' home church. Even though the neighborhood had changed and there was a far greater Asian presence there now, the Congregation of African Bible Baptist was primarily black, and although I certainly didn't blend, I was made to feel welcome. I sat near the back. From there I was able to spot Etta May seated alone in the first pew. With unwavering dignity, she gazed at LaShawn's open, flower-bedecked casket. Moments after I was seated, a group of people led by Pastor Mark Granger made their way up the aisle. The group commandeered two full pews directly behind Etta May. She turned and looked at them as they filed in. With a scowl of distaste and a slight shake of her head, she looked away again. I suppose she was thinking much the same thing I was. She had given King's mission free reign and how they did their own send-off for her Shawnee, and I think she was worried that Pastor Mark and his flock wouldn't allow her the same courtesy. By the time the appointed hour of 2 p.m. rolled around, the church was packed. Detectives Jackson and Ramsdall came in during the first hymn, a moving rendition of Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. Funeral or not, attendees and choir alike came prepared to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I noticed that the visitors from King Street Mission held their hymnals open, but they looked uneasy and didn't seem to be singing along with everyone else. This may have been due to the fact that they didn't know the words to the various hymns. Or maybe they were accustomed to practicing a somewhat more subdued version of Christianity. Good for Adam May, I thought. The Reverend Clarence Wilkins officiated. When it came time for the eulogy, he spoke movingly of LaShawn as a cute but mischievous little boy who had regularly attended Sunday school. The minister also spoke of LaShawn's years in the wilderness when he had been lost in a world of drugs and gangs. Finally, to a chorus of heartfelt praise gods and amens, Wilkins related how, in the end, LaShawn had come back to Jesus. The service came to an end rather abruptly after that, closing with a final hymn and with no chance for attendees to come forward to make comments of their own. Maybe I have an overly active imagination, or possibly it was simply prejudice on my part, but I assumed Etta May had precluded any additional speakers in order to keep Pastor Mark from taking to the pulpit. Since he had seemed intent on hijacking the entire service, I could hardly blame her for that. Out on the street, while we waited for the casket to be carried out of the church and transferred to the waiting hearse, I tracked down Kendall Jackson. Hank Ramsdall was nowhere in sight. I thought you were going to call me, I said. Jackson was busy scanning the crowd. That's right, I said we'd call when we finished interviewing Elaine Manning. Well, we never finished, he said, because we never found her. I was hoping she'd show up here. She wasn't at the shelter? She probably was there, Jackson corrected. If so, she wouldn't come out to talk to us. And the woman who ran the place was pissed as hell that we had any idea that's where Elaine was staying in the first place. It's a domestic violence shelter, you know. But if LaShawn was her boyfriend and he's dead, who's she running from? Good question, Jackson said. For right now, my money's on Pastor Mark. When the King Street Mission people emerged, most of them wandered off toward three eight-passenger vans parked down the block. Pastor Mark and a man who appeared to be his lawyer walked off together toward a black Lincoln Town car that came complete with a driver in a black suit. The vans may have been good enough for Pastor Mark's flock, but they evidently weren't good enough for the shepherd himself. "'I guess that means he's not going to the cemetery,' Jackson said. "'And I guess that means Hank and I won't be going either. "'We'll just follow along and ask him if he has any idea "'why Elaine would have left King Street "'and taken up residence in a DV shelter. "'My guess is he won't say a word. "'Mine too,' Jackson grinned. "'But it doesn't matter.' Sometimes silence speaks louder than words. 
I walked back to my Mercedes. Once the funeral procession rolled past, I pulled into what I assumed was the caboose position as we headed south for Renton and the Mount Olivet Cemetery. A block or two south of Church Street, I noticed that another vehicle, an older model Honda, had pulled in behind me. Before we reached the gates to Mount Olivet, I peeled off into a side street. Most of the cars in the procession followed the hearse on into the cemetery and stopped close to a canopy-covered grave site. The Honda, on the other hand, stopped just inside the gate. The woman who exited the vehicle was sturdily built. She was black in her mid-thirties and wore her shoulder-length hair in a cascade of tiny braids. She went over to the grassy edge of the road, far enough to see the people clustering around the gravesite. The woman watched the funeral attendees, but none of them noticed her. I stepped out of the Mercedes and walked up behind her. Ms. Manning? Startled, she jumped and then spun around to face me. Who are you? My name's Beaumont. J.P. Beaumont. I'm an investigator with the Washington State Attorney General's office. I shouldn't have come, she said simply. From what I've been told, you and LaShawn Tompkins were an item, I returned. Why wouldn't you come to his funeral? I don't want to talk to you, she said. I don't want to talk to anybody. She dodged away from me and headed back toward the Honda, but I managed to beat her to the driver's door. We're trying to figure out what happened to him, I said. Don't you want to help us? Somebody shot him. She was crying now. Do you know who killed him or why? I asked. She shook her head. All I know for sure is that LaShawn is dead. Why did you leave King Street Mission, Miss Manning? And why are you staying in a domestic violence shelter? Who are you afraid of? Without answering, she tried to reach around me to grasp the door handle, but I was in the way. When the attempt failed, instead of falling back, she leaned into me, weeping uncontrollably on my shoulder. For a moment, I didn't quite know what to do. Shh, I said, patting her. It's going to be all right. Finally, she drew back, wiping fiercely at her eyes. I'm sorry, she said. That was stupid of me. Grieving isn't stupid, I said, but not talking to me about this would be. Please, Miss Manning, that's all I'm asking you to do. Just talk to me. Don't you owe LaShawn that much? I thought Elaine might try to skip out on me, but she didn't. We drove straight to a Burger King and parked side by side. Inside, she went to one of the window booths while I placed our order. Coffee for me, Diet Coke for her. By the time I got to the booth, she was putting away a compact, and she seemed to have her emotions well in hand. I didn't see Pastor Mark get out of any of the buses at the cemetery, she said. That's because he didn't go there, I told her. He was at the funeral, but I think he was annoyed because he didn't get to run that show. Oh, Elaine said. Is Pastor Mark the one you're afraid of, I asked. She nodded. Is it that obvious? I'm a detective, remember? But what isn't obvious is why. Pastor Mark has a temper, Elaine said. I already figured that out, I interjected. And he didn't approve. Of you and LaShawn? She nodded. Pastor Mark claimed we were setting a bad example for the other people at the mission, and he made it pretty clear that if LaShawn and I insisted on being a couple, we'd have to leave King Street. Would that have been a problem, I asked? More to Pastor Mark than for us, Elaine returned. Why's that? Because we were his best worker bees. LaShawn did a lot of the physical labor around the place, in addition to much of the active counseling. I ran the household end of it, made up the duty roster, ordered supplies, and handled client intake. Yes, Pastor Mark is the one with a degree in divinity, but LaShawn was way better than Pastor Mark at doing the kind of spiritual work it takes to turn lives around. His was an example other people could relate to and copy. You still haven't answered my question, I insisted. About why I'm afraid of Pastor Mark? I nodded. 
She sipped her diet coke for several thoughtful seconds. I think he was jealous of LaShawn, she said finally, and I think he did it. Wait a minute, I said. You're saying you think Pastor Mark is responsible for LaShawn's death? It was Elaine's turn to nod. But he says he was teaching a Bible study class at the mission at the time LaShawn was shot, and he says he has a list of participants to prove it. Pastor Mark knows a lot of people, Elaine said. Not very nice people, she added. So he knew people and could put out a hit, but would he have done that over you? I think he was afraid LaShawn and I would go out on our own and start a new mission somewhere else. In competition with Pastor Mark? He's not good at competition of any kind, she answered. Yes, he was jealous of LaShawn and me, but I think he was even more jealous of the relationship LaShawn had with the clients. Thought it was undermining his authority somehow. Was it? Yes, Elaine said simply. When I accused him of having something to do with LaShawn's death, he just snapped. Told me if he heard I'd even handed to the cops that he might be responsible, that the same thing could maybe happen to me. He threatened you? Elaine nodded again. So I went to the shelter. A friend of mine runs it. I knew she'd take me in. Elaine Manning's concerns about Pastor Mark sounded good, but whether she was well-spoken or not, a jury looking at her most likely wouldn't look beyond the fact that she was a convicted felon. Unsupported allegations from a reformed armed robber druggie wouldn't carry much weight in a witness stand. I doubted they'd make the grade with Ross Allen Connors, either. As I left Renton and headed home, it was after 4.30, and it was in the throes of Friday afternoon rush hour traffic. I had visions of getting home late and finding Mel dressed and ready to go to the shindig. I shouldn't have worried. When I finally walked in the door at a quarter to six, I was astonished to find Mel dressed in the clothing she'd worn to work much earlier that morning. She glanced up at me from the kitchen counter, where she and Todd were still hard at work. "'How's it going?' she asked. Slow, I said, kissing her hello. What about you? Pretty much the same, she said. There's a lot of material here. Todd roused himself from his computer and sent an unabashedly admiring look in Mel's direction. If you want me to hang around and work on this over the weekend... But Mel jumped in to send him packing. No, she said, we have more than enough here to keep us busy all weekend. Besides, she added, we have an engagement this evening. If we don't head out soon, we'll be late. Todd Hatcher took the hint. All right, then, he said, closing his computer. I'll go. Uh, should I take the abstracts or leave them? I shrugged, Mel said. Leave them. We may have time to work on them over the weekend. All right, Todd agreed, but if you need anything, Mel ushered him to the door. No, she said firmly. Take the weekend off, Todd. You work too hard. Once he was outside the apartment, she looked at her watch. Better hurry, she told me. We went into our separate bathrooms to shower and dress. I hadn't tried on the tux after it had been altered, not with Lars Jensen waiting out in the car, but the changes had been done expertly enough that the tux fit perfectly. At twenty after six, Mel appeared in my bedroom door in a long black beaded dress with a slit that showed a length of exquisitely formed leg. She held up a single-strand pearl necklace. Can you fasten this? Complying, I brushed her perfumed shoulder with my lips as I did so. You're beautiful, I told her. Poor Todd. The guy was practically salivating every time he looked at you. I noticed, Mel said. Now, tell me about tonight, I said. What am I in for, exactly? The pre-gathering gathering is in the presidential suite up on the 34th floor of the Sheridan, Mel told me. That's for Sasek board members and their spouses and or partners only. It's the time when we all stand around having drinks and congratulating ourselves on what a great job we did. Then we'll go downstairs for the fundraising banquet itself. That's in the ballroom. My tux, which had fit perfectly only a few short minutes before, suddenly felt too tight. I'm going to a cocktail party, I groused. Oh, goody. I talked to the catering staff, Mel assured me. They'll definitely have non-alcoholic beverages available. Riding the elevator up to the Sheridan's presidential suite without having had the benefit of any liquid courage, I found myself having second thoughts about the whole thing. 
second thoughts and very damp palms. Don't worry about it, Mel said. It's going to be fine. And it was. I stepped into the spacious but crowded room and discovered, to my immense relief, that I was properly attired. Thanks to Mel's timely intervention, my tuxedo held its own with every other tuxedo in the room, and Mel didn't just measure up to the other women, she outshone most of them. That made me feel even better. She knew everyone, of course, and was immediately caught up in first one conversation and then another. Wanting to make myself useful, I wandered over to the bar and ordered a tonic with a twist for me and a glass of Merlot for her. Then I settled in by the windows and stared out over the surrounding glowing high-rises to the distant darkened mass of Elliott Bay. "'Great view, isn't it?' someone said. I turned to look. The man standing beside me was about my age and size. Since there were no conveniently placed tables, he too was holding two drinks. "'Name's Beaumont,' I told him. J.P. Beaumont. "'Since we both seem to be functioning as window dressing at the moment, I guess we'll have to shake hands later.' The man chuckled. Cal Loman, he said. I always wanted to be a drink stand when I grew up, didn't you? Cal Loman was a name I recognized. He was a senior partner with one of the big deal corporate law firms in town, Henderson, Loman, Richards, and Potts. I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks in Seattle's Ballard neighborhood, raised by a single mother who supported us by working as a seamstress. She made a meager living by sewing knockoff copies of designer dresses for Seattle's social elite. All through grade school, I had to endure endless teasing over showing up each day in one or another of my mother's homemade shirts. Eventually, I fought back, winning some and losing some, and being sent to the principal's office on an almost daily basis. The fights didn't stop for good until I was in high school and was old enough to get an after-school job at the local theater. Only then did I achieve the pinnacle of sophistication by showing up at school in a store-bought shirt. But America's a great place. Here I was, decades later, having a tuxedo-clad male bonding conversation with one of Seattle's prime movers and shakers. "'Your wife's on the board?' Loman asked. "'Mel Soames is my partner,' I said, and yes, she's on the board.' Just then, the woman we had met days earlier at the California Pizza Kitchen arrived on the scene. She was dazzling in a strapless green silk gown topped by an amazing emerald necklace. "'Hello there,' she said to me. "'We've got to stop meeting like this.' Then, reaching past me, she collected the glass of wine Cal Loman had been holding. "'So you've already met my Anita?' Cal asked with a possessive smile." As I said, Cal was about my age. Mel is fifteen years younger than I am, and this delectable piece of arm candy was far younger than that. Briefly, I said, but I'm not up on exactly what you do. I'm retired, Anita told me, sipping her wine, and trying to make the world a better place. That's why I started the Sasak in the first place. She turned to Cal. Okay, she said, time to go to work. There's someone I want you to meet. She dragged him away so unceremoniously that I was surprised Cal didn't object. About that time, Mel showed up and relieved me of her glass of wine. So let me guess, I said. Now that Anita's hooked up with a sugar daddy like Cal Loman, she can forego working for a living and can afford to devote herself to charity. Mel gave me a bemused look. If anybody's a sugar daddy, it would have to be Anita, she said. She left Microsoft at age 33 with a pocket full of loot. That's where she met Cal at Microsoft. She plucked him off Microsoft's team of corporate legal beagles and took him home to play house. A lot like you and me, babe, only in our case you're the one with the moolah. Anita could probably buy and sell Cal Loman a dozen times over. That's when it came home to me. Times had changed. Women had changed. My second wife, Ann Corley, had died and left me with an armload of money, but tux or not, I was still that unsophisticated hick from Ballard. Plan on being nice, Mel added. I'm pretty sure we're seated at the same table. Convinced I had somehow bungled that initial encounter, I was dreading sharing dinner with Cal and Anita, but then I got lucky. When we went down to the cavernous ballroom and made our way through to the table directly in front of the speaker's podium, I caught sight of someone I actually knew, Destry Hennessy. 
I had encountered Destry years earlier when she had been a lowly criminalist working on a master's at the UW during the day and toiling away in Seattle PD's crime lab by night. Once she earned her degree, she had taken a job somewhere else I wasn't sure where. Sometime in the course of the last several years, Destry had returned to the West Coast as the newly appointed head of the Washington State Patrol crime lab. "'Des,' I said, "'long time no see. What are you doing here?' "'I'm the speaker,' she said. "'I hate doing public speaking. In terms of phobias, it's supposed to be right up there with fear of dying. With a room this big, I can tell you I'm scared to death. You'll do fine. Thanks,' she said. "'It's nice to have a friend in my corner.' When I went to introduce her to Mel, I was surprised to learn they already knew each other. "'We're both on the Sasak board,' Mel explained. "'We roomed together at a retreat down in Mexico last fall.' "'Funny,' I said. "'You never mentioned it.' Mel shook her head. "'You and I weren't exactly an item back then, remember?' While the two of them chatted, I checked out our table, where I was dismayed to discover someone had taken the liberty of assigning seats. The good news was that Destry was on my right. On my left was a dragon lady named Professor Rosemary Clark, who I soon learned turned out to be the University of Washington's distinguished professor of women's studies. Since the good professor was far more interested in talking to Cal Lohman than she was to me, Destry and I spent dinner exchanging small talk. "'Heard you're working for SHIT now,' she said. I nodded, glad that for once I was dealing with a fellow bureaucrat who didn't have to make a joke of the agency's name. "'How do you like it?' she asked. Not bad, I said. Ross Connors is a pretty squared-away guy. As we started in on the salad course, I asked Destry about the talk she would be delivering. Well, it'll be on our DNA pilot program, she said. What pilot program? I'm sorry, she said. You're here at the major donor table, so I figured you knew all about it. Sasek is paying the freight for a full-time DNA profiler in the crime lab. There's so much DNA evidence coming in now that we're falling further and further behind. If we raise enough money tonight, we may be able to fund another one. Someday we may be able to start making progress in that backlog of rape kits that have sat untested in evidence rooms for years on end. With all this high-tech stuff, I said, pretty soon old-time detectives like me will be completely obsolete. Destry Hennessy laughed and patted my hand. Oh, that would be a shame, she said. Why? I thought she'd say something about society losing the benefit of our law enforcement experience and cunning and skill and maybe even our flat-out stubbornness, but she didn't. Because some of you old guys are so darned cute, she said with a smile. I did not want to be cute, and I certainly didn't want to be old. What I really wanted was to get up and stalk out of the ballroom without waiting around for the main course or for Destry Hennessy's upcoming speech, either. But I didn't. My mother raised me to be more of a gentleman than that. At least she tried to. So I plastered a phony smile on my face, chatted civilly with the professor when called upon to do so, and stayed right where I was. I'm doing this for Mel, I thought glumly and she damned well better appreciate it. There was a lot about the evening that made me uncomfortable. For one thing, there was a whole male evil woman poor victim theme to the event that rankled. Yes, I know that most victims of sexual assault are women, but being a non-abusing male in that particular Sheridan ballroom was not a comfortable fit. Still, I was expected to sit there and share the guilt and blame while a lineup of women revealed a litany of abuse that was enough to curl your hair. As a man, I was automatically under indictment. I was also expected to haul out my wallet and make a sizable donation to the cause, which included funding for victim advocates and victim counseling, as well as continuing to fund the rape kit examination project that was, it turned out, Anita Bowden's special focus. That rankled even more. It was bad enough that Ross Connors was now passing off police work to underemployed economists, but to find out that the crime lab was outsourcing DNA profiling as well was enough to make this old cop feel like a member of an endangered species, an exceedingly cranky endangered species. So I handed over my credit card number, kept my mouth shut, and just tried to make it through. 
What's the matter? Mel asked. We were standing outside the hotel in a crush of people waiting for an outnumbered and overwhelmed crew of parking valets to retrieve the Mercedes from the garage. How did you ever get mixed up with that bunch of women? I asked, thinking most particularly of the good professor of women's studies, who had given me an earful of invective over the dessert course. Okay, my comment was more of a growl than anything else, but I didn't expect what happened next. Mel simply turned and walked away. Make that stalked away. Where are you going, I asked, trailing after her. To catch a cab, she said over her shoulder. But I'm going home, she added, to Bellevue. I guess our voices were somewhat raised and people started to gawk. Just then the valet showed up with my car and honked twice from the curb. By the time I tipped him and retrieved the Mercedes, Mel was nowhere in sight. Since she had said she was going to Bellevue, I drove there, too. There were no lights on in her apartment, so I parked outside and waited. And waited. Finally, forty-five minutes later, I headed back to Seattle. When I drove down into the underground garage, I realized the error in my thinking. Her BMW was gone. So she had ridden the cab back to Belltown Terrace to pick up her car so she could drive herself across the lake to Bellevue. No wonder I had missed her. Missing Mel early the next morning, I rolled out of bed and went out into the kitchen to make my own coffee. I brought in the newspapers from the front door, but I didn't bother opening them. I didn't feel up to working a crossword puzzle. Instead, I sat in my recliner, sipping coffee and brooding. Finally, I threw caution to the winds and dialed Mel's cell. Much to my surprise, she answered. I'm not speaking to you, remember? If you were speaking to me, I countered, what would you say? Those women, she said, repeating my ill-chosen words. How did I get hooked up with those women? Mel, look, I'm sorry, but you're not seeing this from my point of view. I spent dinner stuck next to that dreadful professor, who really does hate men, by the way, and listening to all those awful stories. It seemed like every story and every single one of the women said pretty much the same thing, that whatever had happened to them was all my fault. I'll bet even Anita Bowden's husband, Calvin Lohman, Mel supplied, and he's not her husband. Whatever, I said. I'll bet even he was squirming in his seat. Every man there was probably doing the same thing. There is a reason, she said. I'm sorry? A reason I'm involved with those women. A reason I'm on the board. I just don't like to talk about it, but maybe I'll tell you sometime. If I start speaking to you again, that is. With that, she hung up, leaving me with no clear idea of where I stood. She claimed she wasn't speaking to me, but she had been. And the other part, the part she had left unsaid about the reason behind her involvement with Sasek, put a hole in the pit of my stomach. I had never even considered that someone as slick as Mel might have some dark corner in her past where she too had been gravely mistreated. If something like that had happened to her, I wasn't sure I was ready to hear about it. Once I did, would I feel obliged to go out, track the jerk down, and throttle him with my bare hands? That would make a lot more sense than sending donations to Sasek. I called Mel right back. I know you're still not speaking to me, I said, but if you wanted to come back to the house and work together on Todd Hatcher's stuff, I promise I won't say a single word out of line. I'll think about it, she said, but I need some space, Bo. Space and time, she hung up again. Rebuffed, I knew I couldn't afford to spend the day sitting around thinking about Mel and what I did or didn't know. I needed to take some kind of action. I called the DMV and ran a check on Carol and Jack Lawrence. Once I had their address information, I headed for Leavenworth on the far side of the Cascades. It was late on a sunny but surprisingly chill morning when I pulled up at the Lawrence's mailbox in Lavetta Road, south of Leavenworth proper. The house itself was one of those some assembly required log cabins, where someone else cuts up, notches and numbers, and fits together all the tree trunks necessary to build the house. They're then taken apart, 
loaded onto a truck and hauled to wherever the house is being built. This one was a large two-story affair with a steeply pitched roof and a covered porch that ran across the entire front of the house. A single vehicle was parked outside, a muddied Subaru Forester. Out of force of habit, I jotted down the license number, then started up the walkway. The door was cracked open the distance of a short length of fastened security chain. Yes? a woman asked questioningly, while remaining mostly out of sight behind the partially open door. Carol Lawrence was about my age. Her silver hair was pulled back in a ponytail, but even that small glimpse revealed a resemblance between her and her daughter that was nothing short of striking. She looked as if she had been crying, and I wondered what about. "'What do you want?' she asked. I held up my ID. "'Mrs. Lawrence, I began. If you have a few moments, I'd like to speak to you.' By the time the words were out of my mouth, she was already trying to slam the door. My foot, schooled by years of actual door-to-door full-of-brush salesmanship, was firmly planted in the way. "'Go away,' she ordered. "'I'm not talking to you, and neither is Jack. Tony's been gone for a quarter of a century. There's no reason to bring it all back up. But your daughter—' "'My daughter disapproves of me,' she said. "'I didn't wait seven years, and she's never forgiven me for that. "'But you know what? I'm the mother. "'I get to live my life the way I want to. "'Now go away.' "'Are you aware that your husband went to see Deanne yesterday?' I asked. "'That he threatened her? She was very upset?' "'Look,' Carol said. "'Jack is Deanne's stepfather. "'They have never gotten along and never will. "'Not only that, I finally figured out that I can't fix it. "'So please go away and leave me alone "'before my husband comes home and finds you here. "'The way he's acting is enough to make me think "'maybe the two of you were an item long before Tony went fishing, "'up on Spirit Lake,' I said. So what if Jack and I were an item back then, as you call it? We've been married for 25 years now. That should count for something. You don't have any idea what my life was like then, and you have no right to judge me. Neither does my daughter. The idea that Deanne brought this up, Deanne had nothing to do with it, I interjected. The Attorney General's office is doing routine follow-ups on missing person cases from all over the state. That's how your former husband's name came up, period. Oh, Carol said. We thought... I took a business card from my pocket and passed it through the door. I didn't expect her to take it, but she did. I don't care what you thought. We are conducting an active investigation at this time. You can make it easy, or you can make it hard. She studied the card, then unlatched the chain. All right. She sounded resigned. Come on in. Like I said, Jack has a home right now. What do you want to know? For the next hour or so, we went over the same ground I had covered with Deanne days earlier. I asked many of the same questions and heard the same answers, but with one telling difference. I had left Deanne Cosgrove's home convinced she was telling the truth, or at least the truth as she knew it. When my interview with Carol was over, I left the Lawrence's sprawling log house living room with the distinct impression Carol had been lying through her teeth. All I had to do now was to learn enough about the case to catch her in one of those lies. Like Donny Cosgrove, I was beginning to believe that Mount St. Helens had nothing at all to do with his first father-in-law's disappearance. "'Have Jack give me a call,' I told Carol the last thing before I stepped off her front porch to return to my car. "'You have my number?' "'Okay,' she said. "'I'll tell him.' We both knew he wouldn't call. Most likely Jack Lawrence would play hard to get. That didn't bother me, though. Tony Cosgrove had been gone for a quarter of a century. I had all the time in the world. To my mind, there was now a whole new urgency in my wanting to track down Thomas Dortman, the defense analyst. If, as I suspected, he had worked at Boeing during the 70s and 80s, there was a chance he'd actually known Tony Cosgrove or maybe even Jack Lawrence. What I needed more than anything right now was to talk to someone who would either confirm what Carol Lawrence had told me or blow her out of the water. I drove onto State Route 520 and straight home. On the parking garage ramp, I was astonished to see Mel 740 parked in its customary spot. I headed up to the penthouse, not the least bit sure it would be safe to open the door without wearing a flak jacket. When I stepped inside, however, I found Mel at the far end of the living room. 
The window seat was covered with stacks of papers, which I immediately recognized as excerpts from Todd Hatcher's abstracts. She was seated cross-legged on the floor in front of a yellow pad, reading glasses perched on her nose. She stood up as soon as I came into the room, walked over, and kissed me hello. Sorry, she said I was out of line. I kissed her back. I would have done more, but she dodged out of my arms before I could get a good grip on her. She returned to the window seat and began gathering the papers. I should have talked to you about this a long time ago, she added. Should have talked to me about what? About why I'm involved with Sasek? I felt a funny twist in my gut. If this was something Mel didn't want to tell me, it was also probably something I didn't want to hear. Look, I said, I was out of line, too. Whatever it was must have happened a long time ago. It's none of my business. You don't owe me an explanation of any kind. But I do, she said. What happened back then is why I'm involved in sexual assault issues today. It's also why I'm a cop. Coffee? I recognized that her offer of coffee was nothing more or less than a diversionary tactic. I accepted it for the same reason. Mel's face looked so troubled, so hurt, that I wanted to take her in my arms and hold her, but she wasn't having any of that. She went back to the relative safety of the window seat and perched there, coffee cup in hand. I, on the other hand, retreated to my sturdy recliner. Did you ever have something happen to you where it wasn't your fault? I mean, you know it wasn't your fault, but you still hold yourself responsible? Mel asked. Let me count the ways, I thought. Once or twice, I conceded. Have I ever mentioned Sarah Matthews to you? Uh, I don't think so. Who's she? She was my best friend in high school. Austin High School in El Paso. Her father was a sergeant in the Army, and my dad was a major at the time. Sarah and I were in the same home room for three years, she continued. My senior year, Dad was transferred back to D.C. Sarah and I stayed in touch for a year or so, through graduation and for the first semester of our freshman year in college. She committed suicide a few days before Christmas of that year. She shot herself. Where? In the head, Mel answered, blew her brains out. No, I mean, where was she when she died? She was still in Texas, University of Texas at El Paso. I knew Mel had graduated from the University of Virginia. So you weren't anywhere around when it happened? No, Mel said. Sarah was in Charlottesville. So how could her committing suicide possibly be your fault? Mel picked up a small book that had been sitting on the floor beside her. She got up, walked across the room, and handed it to me. What is it? Sarah's diary, Mel replied. I'm sure she was afraid someone at home might find it, so she must have hidden it on my bookshelf. When we moved, it got stuck in a box of books that stayed in storage until the beginning of my sophomore year. Mom found it and gave it to me. It pretty much explains everything. I was holding the book, but I didn't think Mel actually intended for me to read it. What does it say? Mel's eyes filled with tears. Her father molested her from the time she was little. She tried to tell her mother, but her mom didn't believe her. Did she tell you, I asked? Mel shook her head. Not in so many words. I think she tried, but I was too naive to understand what she was really saying. But if I had bothered to read the book... You just told me that you didn't know about the diary until after she was already dead. Right, but... But what? If I had been a better friend, I would have listened more. And when her father put the moves on me, he went after you? Mel nodded. It was at a Christmas party at a neighbor's house. He caught up with me out in the backyard. He was drunk enough that I was able to get away, and I never told anyone about what had happened. I was too embarrassed. He was what, I asked, in his thirties? Around there. And you were in high school? Whatever happened has nothing to do with you, I declared. It was his fault, not yours. It's not so much what happened before I read the diary, Mel interjected. It's what happened afterward. Well, what did happen? Nothing, Bell answered hopelessly. Not one damned thing. I kept my mouth shut and didn't say a single word. 
By then, Sarah's mother, Lois, was already sick, crippled by MS and confined to a wheelchair. If he'd gone to the slammer then, I don't know what would have become of her. Sarah was already dead. What difference did it make? Even now, I doubt the diary itself would have been enough to convict him, so I just kept quiet. Mel sat in the window seat. She seemed to be staring out at the water, but I doubt she was seeing any of it. Where are Sarah's parents now? Lois Matthews died about seven years ago. Her father, Richard, is remarried and lives somewhere in Mexico. When I heard he was marrying again, I wrote a letter to his second wife. I told her I was a friend of Sarah's and that she had told me about being abused by her father as a child. She never wrote back. So you did do something. Mel nodded. I suppose, but I didn't do enough, not about him. What I did instead was get involved in the sexual assault community. That's also when I decided to become a cop and changed my major from English to police science. I've been involved ever since, she added. So, now you know. That's how I became one of those women. Mel fell silent and seemed to be waiting for some response from me. I'm sorry for your friend, I said, and I'm sorry for you, too. It's an awful thing to have carried around on your own for all these years. Thank you, she said, but I haven't been that alone. When I'm with the women from Sasek, none of us is alone. I know the statistics. Six out of ten girls and one out of four boys are molested prior to age 18. And I had certainly seen the irreversible damage a history of child abuse leaves in its wake. But I don't think I had ever internalized it in the same way as I did when Mel made that one quiet and very simple statement about not being alone. And it gave me a whole new perspective on those women at the Sheridan, the gutsy, determined, well-dressed women who had somehow moved beyond whatever had befallen them personally and who were striving to help others. Being involved in something like that changes you, Mel said after a long pause. It changes your whole outlook on life. That's why I don't dwell on it and why I don't talk about it very often. And it's why I couldn't talk about it last night, not after all the stories we just heard. It brought it all back, and it hurt too much. Mel needed comforting, and I did what I could. Sounds to me like you've accepted what you couldn't change, and you're changing what you can, I told her. That's part of what we talk about in AA. It's how we learn to go on. Thank you for telling me, I added. I know it wasn't easy. Thank you for listening, she said. So, now that I'm back in your good graces, what should I do, I asked. Make a bigger donation? No, she said. What you contributed is fine. Listening is better. What about dinner, then, I asked. Yes, she said, but I missed you last night. And there's something I'd like to do first. And that's exactly what we did. It wasn't until much later, after we were showered, dressed, that we actually started talking about work. She told me how far she'd gone in making notes on the abstracts, and I told her about my semi-fruitful trip to Leavenworth. What's the defense analyst's name again? Mel asked thoughtfully, reaching for her laptop. Dortman, I said. Thomas Dortman. Mel did several quick keystrokes and then studied her screen. And he has a new book coming out at the end of the month. The Whistleblower's Survivor's Guide. Want me to order you a copy from Amazon.com? Don't bother, I said. From what I read in the article, Tony Cosgrove was supposed to be a whistleblower, or maybe he would have been if he hadn't disappeared when Mount St. Helens blew up. The next morning seemed as good a time as any to continue my LexisNexis research on Dortmund. But with my first cup of coffee in hand, I happened to think of something else. And so, out of idle curiosity, instead of typing in the defense analyst's name, I typed in something else. Richard Matthews, Mexico. And waited to see what, if anything, would show up. Didn't take long. What popped up first was an article dated November 14, 2004, from the El Paso Herald. Two weeks ago, Candace Matthews kissed her husband Richard Matthews goodbye as he left to go on his regular morning walk near their beachfront retirement home in Cancun, Mexico. 
She hasn't seen him since. Richard and Candace Matthews were newlyweds four years ago when they purchased their dream home. It was a second marriage for both of them. Richard had retired from a career in the U.S. military, and Candace was a former realtor. When they met at a dance club in El Paso, Texas, they married two months later. The investigation is progressing, says Sergeant Ignacio Palacios of the Cancun Metropolitan Police Department. We are treating this as a missing person situation, but so far there is no indication of foul play. Down the hall, the shower stopped running, and I heard Mel's hairdryer whine to life as I struggled to fend off the intense sense of foreboding that suddenly gripped me. I looked back at the computer screen and double-checked the date, November 14th. Mel and I hadn't been involved then, but I did remember Mel's returning from a week's worth of vacation, sometime late in the fall, sometime prior to Thanksgiving. I recalled that she had come back to work in high spirits, looking tanned and fit, and bringing with her a gift for Barbara Galvin's son, Timmy, a huge sombrero with his name embroidered on it. Had she been to Cancun? I called up the next entry, dated November 18th. Unidentified human remains discovered washed up along the base of a beachside cliff near Cancun, Mexico, are thought to be those of former El Paso resident Richard Lowell Matthews, who disappeared almost three weeks ago while on an early morning walk. While confirming that remains have been found, Mexican authorities say that a positive identification will have to await the arrival of dental records that are expected in Cancun sometime tomorrow. Sergeant Ignacio Palacios of the Cancun Metropolitan Police Department reported that the autopsy had revealed presence of a gunshot wound that was most likely the cause of death. The case is being investigated as a possible homicide. So Richard Matthews was dead, possibly of a gunshot wound. Down the hall, the hairdryer switched off and on as Mel wielded hot air and a brush to force her hair into submission. In the weeks and months Mel and I had lived together, I had learned to welcome the dryer's ungodly racket. It was an audible and daily reminder of how my life had suddenly changed for the better. This morning, though, that hair dryer felt more like a screeching buzz saw slicing into my heart. Once before I'd fallen for a beautiful but flawed woman, one who had transformed herself into a one-woman vigilante brigade for both convicted and suspected child molesters. Smitten, I had been blind to Ann Corley's inexplicable interest in the death of a young girl at the hands of members of a local religious cult. My inability to grasp the seriousness of the situation had led inevitably to Anne's death, and almost to mine as well. Now history seemed to be repeating itself. Only yesterday Mel had told me she was still haunted by learning too late of her best friend's incestuous relationship with her father. Mel had told me that she still agonized over having done nothing to avenge her friend's death. The bathroom door opened, freeing a cloud of steamy air. A heady combination of fragrances wafted down the hallway. I closed the screen containing the most recent El Paso Herald article and hurriedly typed Thomas Dortman's name into the search field. Mel emerged from the bathroom, wearing a short, silky robe, the hem of which skimmed the bottom of her equally silky panties. She came over to where I was sitting and brushed the top of my head with a kiss as she collected my empty coffee cup from the end table at my elbow. Refill? Uh, thanks, I mumbled. What are you working on? Dortman. Mel stood in front of me with my cup in one hand and the other on her hip. Look, she said reprovingly, this is Sunday. We've been so caught up in work that we've neglected everyone. Scott and Charisse are still here and we haven't been keeping tabs on Lars. How about if we give ourselves the whole day off and pay attention to people instead of cases? Great idea, I said, slapping shut the laptop's lid. It's the weekend. Let's forget about work for a while. It'll do us both a world of good. Mel disappeared into the kitchen and returned with my replenished coffee cup, which she handed over to me. You look upset, she said. Is something the matter? No, nothing, I said. I'll go shower. I stood in the powerful flow that cascaded down from a ceiling-mounted shower head 
while my body was pounded with spray from a collection of wall-mounted shower heads as well. Steam may have been circling upward toward the ceiling, but I felt chilled. Surely she wasn't involved in the death of Richard Matthews, I told myself. Surely not. Standing there with the punishing water pummeling my body, I was suddenly struck by an idea. There was one other person in the world who had been betrayed by Ann Corley in much the same way I had been. One other sucker who, if I told him my suspicions, would immediately grasp all possible ramifications. After all, my friend and attorney, Ralph Ames, had been Ann Corley's friend and attorney long before he became mine, and she had suckered him, too. Leaving the shower running full blast, I stepped out onto the bath mat, hot-footed it into the bedroom, retrieved my cell phone, and took it back into the bathroom, where I dialed Ralph's number. "'Where are you calling from?' Ralph asked once he was on the line. "'You sound like you're standing in the middle of a torrential downpour.' "'I am. That's the shower.' "'Here's an idea,' he said. "'How about if you call me back after you finish your shower? "'Please, Ralph, there's a problem. Listen to me.' And he did. I explained it all while the shower continued to roar. "'So what do you want me to do?' he asked when I finished. "'Try to find out whether or not the remains really do belong to Richard Matthews?' "'That would be a big help,' I said. "'And what, if any, progress has been made at finding out who killed him? "'Anything else?' Ralph asked. "'Mel's full name is Melissa Catherine Majors Soames,' I replied. "'I'm pretty sure she went to Mexico sometime last November.' "'I'll see what I can do,' Ralph said. "'Meantime, watch yourself.' "'Mel knocked on the closed bathroom door. "'I was so startled it's a miracle I didn't drop the cell phone into the toilet. "'Lars is on the phone,' she said. "'Do you want to take it?' "'Tell Lars I'm in the shower. I'll call him back when I get out.' "'Still disturbed by the staggering possibilities, "'I was disgusted to find that my right hand shook uncontrollably.' In the process of shaving, I nicked my neck twice and the bottom of my ear once and emerged from the bathroom with tiny scraps of toilet paper, staunching the flow of blood to keep it from ruining my collar. Out in the living room, I found Mel dressed and ready to go. Lars was calling to double-check on who was picking him up for breakfast, Scott and Charisse or the two of us. He also wanted to know if you thought Scott and Charisse would mind if he brought a friend along to breakfast. A friend? I asked. What kind of friend? Her name is Iris, Mel answered. Iris Rasmussen. According to Lars, she was a good friend of Beverly's. Wait a minute, I said. Are you telling me that we buried Beverly on Thursday and Lars wants to bring someone else along to brunch on Sunday? I don't think he meant it like that, Mel returned. He probably just wants to have someone along who's his age, someone who's on the same page he is. Oh, but Iris is on the same page, all right, I told her. Let's go. But I thought you were going to call him back. Why bother, I said. You already told him he could bring her. He doesn't need to hear it from me. Mel shot me an exasperated look. What's the matter with you this morning? Did you get up on the wrong side of the bed or what? The wrong side of the universe is more like it, I thought. Nothing's the matter, I said. What are we waiting for? We could just as well see what that randy old coot is up to. Despite my misgivings about her, Iris Rasmussen turned out to be the life of the party. She was full of one-off color Sven and Ole joke after another, and she told them with all the verve and style of an aging stand-up comedian. She kept all of us in stitches, me included, and that was pretty remarkable in view of the fact I wasn't in much of a joking mood. Lars laughed along with the rest of us and chowed down on his oyster omelet. Laughing seemed to do wonders for his appetite. Iris was tuning up to deliver yet another punchline, and the waitress had yet to drop off the check, when my phone rang. I was relieved when a glance at the readout displayed an unfamiliar number. At least it wasn't Ralph. "'Mr. Beaumont?' a woman asked. The voice wasn't one I could place, but she sounded upset. I excused myself and made my way outside. "'Yes? It's me, Deanne Cosgrove. There's someone here who needs to talk to you. I heard her passing the receiver to someone else. Mr. Beaumont, I'm Detective Tim Lander of the Chelan County Sheriff's Department. 
I understand from Miss Cosgrove here that you intended to go see Jack and Carol Lawrence in Leavenworth yesterday. Yes, I said, that's right, and I did go there. Why? I'm investigating a double homicide, he said. Carol and Jack Lawrence were found shot to death in the yard outside their home early this morning. Would it be possible to meet with you this morning? I'd like to discuss the purpose of your meeting with them yesterday. I'd also like to know what the outcome was. Well, I didn't meet with both of them, I corrected. I only spoke to Mrs. Lawrence, but of course, yes, I can meet you at the special homicide offices in Eastgate, if you like. Where's that? Lander asked. And how soon can you be there? I glanced at my watch. Depending on traffic, uh, half an hour to 45, I said. Then I gave him special homicide street address as well as driving directions. When I returned to the restaurant, Iris Rasmussen was still holding forth. The only other person paying any attention to my phone call was Mel, who was giving me what I've sometimes heard my son-in-law refer to as the stink eye. "'What's up?' she asked. "'Work,' I said, flagging down our harried waitress. "'I'm going to have to go into the office.' "'Good,' she returned. "'I'm coming along.' I'd been hoping to have a chance to confer with Ralph Ames, but telling Mel she wasn't welcome to ride along would have caused an immediate uproar, especially since we had arrived at the restaurant in the same vehicle. We made our way out to the parking lot, said our goodbyes to Iris and Lars, and to Scott and Charisse as well. "'What's wrong?' Mel asked, as soon as the Mercedes doors shut behind us. "'Oh, it makes you think something's wrong.' She rolled her eyes. "'Something's bothering you,' she said, "'and don't try blaming it on whoever called you just now. "'You were wound tight long before the call came in.' "'Where did you go when you went to Mexico last fall?' I asked. "'Cancun,' she said. "'When were you there?' "'The end of October through the first week in November,' she said. "'But I don't understand. What's this all about?' "'The date she mentioned hit me like a second blow to the gut. Having launched this disturbing conversation without waiting for any kind of confirmation from Ralph Ames, I realized there was no turning back. Remember your dead friend's father, the one you told me about yesterday? Richard Matthews, Sarah's father, Mel asked. Of course I remember him. Why? He disappeared in Cancun on the 1st of November. Disappeared? His body was found later. He died from a single gunshot wound. She chewed on that one for a while. And you think I had something to do with what happened to him, did you? We were on Mercer by then, headed for I-5. Why don't you stop the car and let me out, she said. I'll walk back to the house. Mel, please, I said. It's not like this hasn't happened to me before. So that's what this is all about, Mel demanded. It's all about Ann Corley, isn't it? Since she went off the rails and killed somebody, you automatically assume I must have done the same thing. Is that what you think? I didn't answer her question immediately, not aloud, and that in itself was answer enough. A glance in Mel's direction showed me that she was sitting on the far side of the car with her arms folded across her chest. When Melissa Soames folds her arms, it's not a good sign. I may have been in Cancun at the time he was shot, Mel said, but I had no idea that's where he lived, and no matter what you think, I'm not responsible for what happened to him. She paused briefly and then added, When did you learn all this? This morning, I said. I stumbled across it on the Internet while you were showering. And you immediately leaped to the conclusion that since Richard Matthews was dead, I had to be the one who killed him. Mel shook her head. That doesn't speak very highly for whatever it is I thought the two of us had going. Mel, I began, it's just... Don't bother with the apology bit, she said. I don't want to hear it. My phone rang then, right in the middle of the I-90 bridge. The way my luck was going, there was no need to check the caller ID readout. I knew it had to be Ralph as soon as the phone rang and before I answered. Mel flew in and out of Cancun along with seven other women on board a private jet that belongs to someone named Anita Bowden, Ralph said. They stayed at a beachfront home called Casa del Sol, owned by Ms. Bowden. They arrived on Thursday, October 28th, and returned to Seattle on Wednesday, November 3rd. Thanks, I said, hoping to cut short the conversation. I appreciate it. But Ralph was just tuning up. 
If the guy disappeared on November 1st, she would have been there at the time, so we're definitely talking opportunity. I'm printing out whatever I can find on the guy on the web. Is there anything else I can do to help right now? No, I said, thanks for the invite, but I don't think we'll be able to make it to dinner tonight. She's with you then, Ralph asked. Right, I said. Maybe later this week I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay, then, he finished, give me a call when you can. What was that all about, Mel wanted to know as soon as I hung up. Ralph and Mary were inviting us over to dinner tonight, I lied. It didn't seem like such a good idea. I'll say, Mel said, and that was the last thing she said to me for the remainder of the trip. When we reached East Gate, Detective Tim Lander's unmarked Shallon County patrol car was parked in a visitor's spot in the garage. While I went to greet him, Mel bailed out of my car without a word or a backward glance and headed for the elevator. Mr. Beaumont, Lander asked, exiting his vehicle. I nodded. We shook hands, and I led him onto the elevator and then upstairs to the SHIT squad offices on the third floor. We walked past Barbara Galvin's empty desk. Beyond that, the door to Mel's office was shut. We kept right on walking. This is all part of the Attorney General's office, Lander asked as I cleared off the guest chair in my cubicle-sized space so he could sit down. I nodded. There's a squad here, one down in Olympia, and a third one over in Spokane to cover eastern Washington. And what exactly do you do? Lander asked. We investigate whatever Ross Allen Connors asks us to investigate. At the moment, he has me working on cold missing persons cases from all over the state. That's why I went to see Deanne Cosgrove and Carol Lawrence, looking into the case of a man who disappeared 20-plus years ago. Lander pulled out a notebook and consulted a page of scribbled notations. That would be Anthony David Cosgrove, he asked. Disappeared on May 18, 1981. Correct, I said. Deanne's father and Carol Lawrence's first husband. I told Lander about my conversations with Deanne and her mother, Carol. Apart from the news that Carol and Jack were already involved before Tony went missing, I concluded, Carol told almost exactly the same story Deanne told. Almost? I like the way Lander caught my effort at hedging. He focused in on the wobbly modifier with laser precision. Look, I said. Carol told me the same story her daughter did. In fact, the two versions were virtually identical. The problem is, when Deanne told me the story, it seemed like she was telling the truth. When Carol told me the same thing, I got the feeling she was lying. How did you leave things with Carol Lawrence, Lander asked. I handed her one of my cards and asked her to have Jack give me a call. I told her I needed to talk to him, but I figured it would be a cold day in hell before he ever called me back. In fact, I was a little surprised Carol even bothered to take my card in the first place. Not only did she take it, Lander told me after a pause, she kept it too. The CSI guys found your business card in her hand. Her cell phone was on the ground next to her body. We know for sure that Carol Lawrence tried to call you on it. Your office number here at the office is the last one listed under dialed calls. She placed that call at 8.57 p.m., which is about the same time the preliminary coroner's report estimates as the time of death. The idea that Carol Lawrence had tried and failed to reach me left me feeling half sick. It was the weekend, I muttered. After hours, calls to SHIT go to our general voicemail. I could call our office manager and have her check to see what was left. Don't bother, Lander interrupted. I'm sure she didn't leave a message. The duration of the call is just over 30 seconds. Long enough to show that the connection was made, but not enough for her to make it through the voicemail prompts. Believe me, I already tried it. How did this whole thing go down, I asked. The scene's a little chaotic, Landers said. We made casts of several different sets of tire tracks going in and out. We've located an area where a car pulled off the road and sat for a while. We found several empty beer bottles and some discarded gum there in the dirt. So there could be fingerprint and or DNA evidence. Lander nodded. If it turns out the shooter is the one who chewed it, we think he parked on the shoulder waiting for something. Maybe for Jack Lawrence to come home. 
After that, it appears there was some kind of confrontation in the yard next to Jack Lawrence's vehicle. In the course of the struggle, several shots were fired. Jack was hit once in the right shoulder and once in the gut. We believe Carroll tried to flee and was shot in the back. Did you find any brass? Lander nodded. That's where we got lucky, he grinned. Nine millimeter. The killer was smart enough to go around picking it up, but he missed one. Looks like that one bounced off something and rolled under Lawrence's RAV4. We didn't find it till early this afternoon, after the vehicle was towed. I closed my eyes and tried to envision Carol in Jack Lawrence's yard, with his peaceful-looking log home tucked in among towering fir trees. Another vehicle was parked in the Lawrence's yard when I was there, I said, pulling out my notebook. A Subaru, I believe, a Forester. I'm pretty sure I jotted down the plate number. Well, that would be Carol's car, Lander interjected. As far as I know, it's still there. I was disappointed that my one snippet of information was going to be of any help, and returned the notebook to my pocket. So who killed them, I asked at last. That's what we were hoping you could tell us, Lander replied. For instance, what can you tell me about the son-in-law? About Donnie Cosgrove, I asked. I've only talked to him on the phone. What was said? He was mad as hell. Jack Lawrence had come to the house the day before and made a scene. Jack was convinced Deanne had jump-started our renewed interest into Tony Cosgrove's disappearance. Did Donnie come right out and threaten Jack Lawrence? Not in so many words. He mentioned something about tearing Jack's head off. He certainly didn't say he was going to shoot him. I told him he should swear out a restraining order, but it sounds like you're thinking Donnie's responsible. Lander gave me a grim smile. The man was nervous as hell when I was there talking to them this morning. He could barely sit still. His hands were shaking. He looked like he was about to puke. The symptoms sounded familiar. Maybe he was just hung over. That's what he told me, Lander said. Claimed he had been out late last night drinking with his buddies and tying one on. I'll be checking his alibi. I'll also be checking the gum. I thought about Deanne Cosgrove, her little house in Redmond and her three little babies. I had to think that her husband might be responsible for any of this. But a homicide detective's suspicions often count for something. I had to give Detective Lander his due. What about finding the Lawrence's phone records, I asked. Finding out who they've called and who's called them in the past few days would probably be a help. We're working on it, Lander said glumly. But of course that's going to take time. I know that drill all too well. When I used to send requests for phone information from Homicide at Seattle PD, getting a response usually took forever. Now that I work for the AG's office, however, that was no longer true. Requests for information that had been signed by Ross Allen Connors were usually handled with surprising alacrity. Ross Connors could probably speed up that process for you, I suggested. Lander looked at me sharply. He could? I nodded. And would he? If you and I made a joint request. Lander looked astonished to think I might be able to bring the power of the Washington State Attorney General to bear on his investigation. Since I've never been much of a team player, I couldn't quite believe it either. How long would it take to do that? Lander asked. For an answer, I picked up my phone, located Ross Connor's number, and punched send. Ross himself answered after the fourth ring, and he didn't sound the least bit phased by the fact that my call was interrupting his Sunday afternoon golf. So, you think the new double homicide up in Leavenworth is related to your old missing persons case? Connors asked once I finished. No way to tell that for sure, I told him, but it's a distinct possibility. All right, then, Connors said. Fax over the paperwork. I'll see what I can do. He must be a pretty good guy to work for, Lander commented after the call was finished. He is that, I agreed. Ross is all about getting the job done. He doesn't much care who gets the credit. Where do I sign on, Lander asked. We're full up right now, I told him, but I'll tell Harry Eyeball about you and ask him to keep you in mind. Harry who? Lander asked. Harry Eyeball, I told him, my boss. You're kidding me. That's his name, no shit? Yes, Harry, middle initial, I, Ball. Detective Lander shook his head in wonder. Sounds like you guys have a great time working here. 
We do, I said. It's a barrel of fun. Anything else I should be tracking, he asked as he stood up to leave. Any other leads? Since we were working together, there was no reason to hold back. I've got a call into someone named Thomas Dortman, I said. He's a defense analyst who years ago used to work at Boeing with Carol Lawrence's first husband, Tony. Since I haven't heard back, he's probably out of town. If you find out anything useful from him, you'll let me know, won't you? You bet, I told him. I'll be glad to. Because the elevator is key-controlled on weekends, I had to escort Detective Lander back down to the parking lot. On our way, I noticed that Mel's door was open and the lights and radio were both off. Here we go again, I told myself. She's probably gone A-W-O-L, just like she did yesterday. I had visions of her, walking back to Seattle, striding purposefully through the bike traffic of the I-90 bridge. Back upstairs, I tried calling her cell phone and was surprised when she answered. Where are you? I asked. Outside, she said, in the smoker's hut. I hurried downstairs. With the brisk wind blowing down off the snow-covered cascades, it was clear and sunny outside, but cold as hell. Mel was huddled inside one of the collection of just-in-case outerwear she keeps in her office, a hooded, fleece-lined jacket. She sat at the table with a lighter and a package of Marlboros and a huge glass ashtray in front of her. An unlabeled file folder lay next to the ashtray. I didn't know you smoked, I said, taking a seat across from her as the chill of the picnic bench bit into my backside. Mel blew a column of smoke skyward and watched it drift off toward the traffic speeding past along I-90. I don't, she said. I borrowed these from Barbara. Why today? Someone's trying to frame me for murder, she said, and it must be one of my so-called friends. Mel stubbed what little was left of her smoldering cigarette into the ashtray. I pushed the ashtray aside and covered her icy hand with mine. Which so-called friend do you think is involved? She shrugged. One way or another, it's all tied in with Sasek. I came down here to work up my courage before calling Ross. I'm sure he'll want to put me on a leave of absence before somebody in the media gets wind of this rather than after, the way he had to do with Destry. Destry, I asked. Destry Hennessy? Sure, Mel said. It was three years ago before I showed up. Don't you remember? I did remember, but only vaguely. Something about her grandmother? Yes, Mel answered. The grandmother had been widowed for several years and was living alone in Salt Lake City when a 16-year-old punk broke into her house one night, robbed her, raped her, and left her to die. But she didn't die, not right then. When the case went to court, the kid's defense attorney finagled a plea bargain. Juan Carlos Escobar went to a juvie facility up at Logan until he was 21. And Destry's grandmother? She ended up first in an assisted living facility and later in a nursing home, where two years later she died. The doctors were convinced that the infection that eventually killed her came about as a result of her original injuries, but the D.A. refused to amend the charges against the punk. He was released on his 21st birthday. The more she told me of the story, the more it jogged my memory. And he was killed that night, right? I asked. Mel nodded. On his way home to his own grandmother's place in Salt Lake, someone ran him down in a vehicle. Wasn't an accident, either. They ran over him several times and left him to die in an irrigation ditch. How do you know so much about this, I asked. For one thing, Destry and I roomed together when we were down in Cancun. We sat up late one night on our balcony watching the moon on the water and drinking margaritas. That's when she told me about it. What happened to her grandmother was what propelled her into Sasak, the same as what happened to Sarah did me. For another, that's what I was doing upstairs, a LexisNexis search on the case. She tapped the file folder. What about Ross, I asked. You said something about what happened before. Well, naturally, Destry was a person of interest in that case. All of her relatives were as well, but on the night it happened, Destry and her husband were actually in Washington, D.C. She had been to a Homeland Security meeting and was at a dinner at the White House when Escobar died. Talk about a gold-plated alibi, I said. Mel gave me a faint smile. That's what Ross Connors thought. 
He saw no reason to put her on administrative leave while the investigation ground on. And that's just as well, since the case is yet to be solved. But some investigative reporter from the Seattle Times raised all kinds of hell about it. Thought Destry was being given special treatment, and that's why I'm going to go call Ross right now to give him a heads up. She started to rise, but I held her hand and stopped her. No, I said, not yet. Let's talk about this. What's there to discuss? Right now, I said, the people responsible for all this think they're getting away with it. You haven't been notified that you're a suspect in the Matthews case, have you? Mel shook her head. Of course not. How could I? I knew nothing at all about it. Until you brought it up this afternoon, I didn't even know Richard Matthews was dead. Exactly, I said. The cops in Mexico haven't made the connection, and as far as the killer is concerned, neither have we. As long as nothing happens to change the status quo, Ross putting you on administrative leave, for example, no one will know we've caught on either, and that gives us our best chance of catching Matthew's killer. Mel said nothing. I suggest we tackle this case the same way we would any other, I continued. First, let's go upstairs and put Barbara's cigarettes where they belong. Then let's go back home and I'll interview you the same way I would any other victim. Or suspect, Mel interjected. Victim, I repeated. We'll make a list of everybody who was on that trip with you and find out as much as we can about them. And we'll check to see exactly what the cops down in Cancun have going for them on this case. What if the killer used my weapon, Mel asked. You had it with you? My backup Glock, she said. We were flying on Anita's private jet. There wasn't an issue with security. If forensics ended up linking Mel's 9 millimeter to Richard Matthews' death, it was going to be a hell of a lot harder to make all this go away. Did you have the Glock with you all the time? Not when I was swimming or jogging, she added. It's hard to carry a concealed weapon when you're wearing a bikini. Amen to that, I said. She smiled at me then. Let's go inside, she said. I'm freezing. We went back upstairs only long enough to return the cigarettes and lighter to Barbara Galvin's top desk drawer. As we headed back to Seattle, Mel sat on the far side of the car, holding the file folder tightly against her chest. Who all was at the retreat in Cancun, I asked. She rattled off a list of names. Anita Bowden, Professor Clark, Destry Hennessy, Rita Davenport, Abigail Rosemont, uh, Justine Maldonado, and me, seven of us all together. Then there was Sarah James, Anita's cook, and the two pilots. The cook uh, stayed at Anita's place, the pilots went to a hotel, the rest of us shared. And was there any kind of disagreement among you, I asked, hard feelings of any kind? Not at all. We spent a lot of time brainstorming about the upcoming fundraiser. That was the point of the retreat. And did any of the women know your story about what had happened between Sarah Matthews and her father? All of them did, Mel answered. Anyone who was on the board, and we all were, would have known about it. How can that be, I demanded. I didn't find out about any of it until yesterday, when you finally told me. But in the meantime, you're saying the rest of the world already knew? It's part of the board of directors' selection process, Mel explained. Prospective members are encouraged to write essays explaining why they came to be involved in sexual assault prevention programs. Once the essays are written, they're circulated among existing board members. So you have essays for all the other women on the retreat? I've read them, she said, but I didn't keep them. They're painful stories, Bo, all of them. Would anyone else still have them, I asked. Maybe, why? Because of the guy who attacked Destry Hennessy's grandmother is dead, and if Richard Matthews is dead, then maybe some of the other responsible parties have met the same fate. For a moment, Mel didn't answer. Then she dredged her own phone out of her pocket, scrolled through some numbers, and pushed send. Hey, she said breezily when somebody answered. Mel here. There was a pause. Oh, no, the food was fine. Great, not to worry which told me Mel was calling Rita Davenport, her fellow Sasek board member and the lady who ran the catering company. So, uh, I was calling with a favor, Mel continued. You wouldn't happen to have a copy of all the board member essays, would you? You do? Hey, that's great. If you could just shoot them to me in an email. Sure. Uh, that's terrific. 
Wrong? Oh, no, nothing's wrong. I just wanted to compare notes on a couple of things. Fine. Thanks. Mel closed her phone and heaved a sigh. Once back at Belltown Terrace, Mel started a new pot of coffee. Then armed with computers and notebooks, we began to go over what we knew and what we didn't know. One of the good things about working with a partner is that you gradually come to terms with a division of labor. Without her even having to discuss it, Mel opened Rita's email containing the Sasek board member essays. While she started studying those, I opened the file she'd brought home from the office. Of note were a few paragraphs and an article. The lead investigator, bountiful homicide detective Ambrose Donner, reported, Members of Mrs. Hammond's family were initially considered persons of interest, but at this point they've all been questioned and cleared of any involvement. Investigators continue in their efforts to locate the unidentified nun who was seen speaking to Escobar shortly before he disappeared. They're also trying to locate the vehicle involved in the incident, reporting a dark blue Buick Riviera with a broken front headlight and extensive front-end damage. The mention of a nun's possible involvement was an immediate red flag, but for right then I let it go because I finally had what I needed. Flipping open my phone, I set about finding Detective Donner. He had been investigating a homicide that involved a dead sexual predator, which, it so happened, was what SHIT was doing, too, more or less. It took a while. Sorry to interrupt your Sunday, I said when I finally reached the man at home and had introduced myself. No big deal, he said. I'm watching golf. What can I do for you? I'm looking into one of your old cases, I said, wondering whether or not you ever closed it. Which one? Juan Carlos Escobar. Donner didn't even hesitate. That punk? No, he never closed it. Near as we can figure, he pissed someone off while he was in juvie, and they took care of him as soon as he got out. He raped and robbed some little old lady, Donner added. The victim died eventually, and probably because of what Escobar did to her, but he was never charged with murder like he should have been. And none of her relatives were involved in his subsequent death, I asked. They all came out squeaky clean. We ended up settling on the gangbanger theory, I can tell you. Did you ever find the vehicle? Donner hesitated. Yes, he said. As a matter of fact, we did. Two weeks after the fact, this guy comes home from taking his wife to Europe for their 40th wedding anniversary. He gets off the plane and his car is missing from the airport parking lot. Let me guess. A blue Buick Riviera? You got it. When the crime lab went over it, the interior had been wiped down pretty thoroughly, but they did find pieces of Juan Carlos still stuck to the front end and undercarriage. What about the nun, I asked. Did you ever find her? Look, he said, this is a small town. I'm not sure I should go into all this. After blithely spilling his guts about Escobar, I found Donner's sudden reticence mystifying. Come on, Detective Donner, did you find her or not? We never found her, he said, but nobody ever reported her missing either so we didn't have any way of knowing if we even had a second victim. The chief made the call, said we were keeping it under wraps until we had an actual ID or a missing persons report to go on. Wait a minute, I said. What are you saying? Donner sighed. When the crime lab went over the Buick, they found a single thread, a long black thread. The guy who owned the car didn't own anything black like that, and neither did his wife. So the nun was in the car. That's what we think. But we have no idea what happened to her afterward. Did you do composites of her? I think so, Donner said. They're probably locked away in the cold case room. Why? I'd like to get a look at them if I could. Maybe you could fax them over to me. But, he began, look, I said, I know you went out on a limb by telling me this. If I give you my home fax number, we can keep this off everybody's radar, right? Right, he said. That would be a big help. What's your number? 
"'What's going on?' Mel asked, as I hung up with Donner. "'The cops in Bountiful had reports that Escobar spoke to a nun shortly after his release "'and just before his disappearance. "'There's some evidence that the nun was in the car that ran down Escobar. "'She's dead, too, then?' "'No evidence one way or the other,' I returned. "'And without a missing persons report or any evidence of foul play, "'Bountiful sat on that part of the case.' I've asked him to fax over a composite sketch, but we won't get that until after Detective Donner goes into work tomorrow, if then. I punched in Ralph's number and left a message for him to find out whatever he could from the cops down in Cancun concerning the Matthews case. When I finished, Mel looked up from the papers before her. I've checked out four of these cases so far, she said. One was a grandfather, a pedophile who died, reportedly of natural causes. One was a bar pickup scene date rape where no assailant was ever named, apprehended, or charged. The other two are still locked up in prison. One of those raped and murdered Professor Clark's 11-year-old granddaughter. The other attacked Justine Maldonado's younger sister. It struck me as interesting that in almost every case, with the possible exception of the date rape scenario, the women had all been galvanized into taking action and joining Sasek by an attack on someone other than themselves. Before I could make that observation, though, the phone rang. Mr. Beaumont. Yes? It's me, Deanne Cosgrove. I need to see you right now. Why? What is it? If it's an emergency, you should probably hang up and call 911. No, I need to talk to you, please. Is your husband there, I ask? Is there some kind of problem? Donnie's not here. That's why I need to talk to you. Talking to hysterical women has never been my strong suit, and Deanne definitely sounded hysterical. All right, I said, but if you don't mind, I'd like to bring my partner along. We'll be leaving downtown Seattle in a matter of minutes. Deanne simply hung up. Before I could do the same, Mel was slipping her shoes back on her feet. Wait up, she said to me. My Glock's down the hall. So's my jacket. After I brought Mel up to speed on Deanne Cosgrove and her husband Donnie, we drove for a while in silence. The wind was coming up in sharp gusts, and it was spitting rain as we headed for the bridge. I knew I should keep my mind of the Cosgroves and what was happening there, but it kept coming back to Mel. "'What's Anita's deal?' I asked. "'Anita's?' Mel returned. Well, "'What do you mean? Since Anita's the mover and shaker behind all of it, I'm just curious about what set her off. Did something happen to her? Did it happen to someone she cared about?' I don't know, Mel said. I don't think anyone's ever said. Why? I'm just curious. Now that you mention it, Mel remarked, I am too. By the time we parked in Donnie and Deanne Cosgrove's driveway, the sprinkles had changed into a hard rain. The porch light was on. The moment we pulled into the driveway, the front door opened and Deanne came dashing out to meet us. Her hair, hanging loose, seemed to stand on end in the blowing wind and rain. "'I'm sorry about your mother,' I said at once. "'Thank you,' she said, stepping forward to meet me. "'And thank you for coming. "'I didn't know what else to do or who else to call, "'and with the kids already asleep, "'I couldn't just throw them in the car "'and go traipsing all over God's creation looking for him. "'Looking for Donnie?' I asked. "'She nodded. "'He left the house a little while after Detective Lander did. "'I was so upset about my mother that I couldn't think straight. "'I really needed him here with me, but he said he had to go out.' that he'd be right back. But it's been hours now, and I have no idea where he is. I've tried calling his cell and his office phone, but he isn't answering. I even tried calling his friends, the ones he said he was with last night. She paused. And, I prompted, they hadn't seen him, she said. They hadn't seen him today or last night either, Detective Beaumont. What does it mean if he wasn't where he said he was? Mel rounded the back corner of the car. Neither she nor I answered, but we both knew what it meant. Donnie Cosgrove's alibi was out the window. I even called some of the local hospitals, Deanne continued distractedly. But then I found the note. What note, Mel asked. Deanne wheeled and turned on Mel. Who are you? I'm Detective Beaumont's partner, Melissa Soames, Mel explained. He asked me to come along and see if I could help. Since it's raining, maybe it would be best if we went inside. Nodding, a distraught Deanne Cosgrove led us into her house. After Detective Lander left, he did too, Deanne went on. I mean, 
How could he do that, leave me here alone with my mom dead and everything? After a while, I called some of my friends from church just so I'd have someone here with me so I wouldn't be alone. They came over and helped with the kids, helped get the house cleaned up. They finally left a little while ago. I knew I needed to get some rest whether Donnie came home or not. That's when I found the note when I was getting ready for bed. What note? Mel prompted. Deanne hurried over to the dining room table and picked up a single three-by-five card. On it was written, I'm sorry, I love you, Donnie. Sorry for what? I asked. Deanne shrugged. About my mother, maybe? I guess that's what he meant. I couldn't help but feel sorry for the poor woman. Her mother and stepfather had both been murdered, but at this juncture she was so concerned about her missing husband that grief for the two homicide victims had yet to gain any real traction. And the note, Mel said, where did you find it? Folded up in my nightgown under my pillow. Donnie would have known I wouldn't find it until I started getting ready for bed. It means he knew he wasn't coming back before bedtime. But why? Why would he do that? Deanne wailed. She was crying in dead earnest now. You hadn't quarreled, Mel asked, when Deanne quieted down some. Well, maybe a little, Deanne admitted. I was really mad at him for staying out so late last night. I expect us to be together on weekends, and usually we are, but last night he said he needed to meet some guys from work. We had a fight about it before he even left. What time did he come home then, Mel asked. Late, Deanne answered, after the bars closed. He didn't think I'd be awake, but I'd been up with the baby. He parked on the street and then came sneaking in through the garage wearing nothing but his underwear. Said one of his buddies had gotten drunk and barfed all over him. So he put his clothing in the wash before he ever came into the house. This morning when I went out to the garage to do a load, I saw that he'd washed everything, even his sneakers, washed them and put them in the dryer. I don't know what he was thinking. They came out of the dryer completely wrecked. I had to throw them away. What happened then, Mel inquired. He was really quiet all morning, Deanne answered. Then when Detective Lander was here, it was like Donnie was... What, Mel asked. I don't know, Deanne said. Just weird. I mean, my mother was the one who was dead. I needed him to be here for me, but it was like he was out of it or something. It was all I could do to concentrate and answer Detective Lander's questions. Then, as soon as the detective left to meet you, Donnie left, too. He told me that he had to go out, that he'd be back later. And you haven't heard anything from him since, I asked. Not a word, she said, shaking her head. Except for the note. Should I file a missing persons report now, or is it too soon? Under the circumstances, it seemed unlikely that a missing persons report would be needed to jumpstart a search for Donnie Cosgrove. Does your husband have access to any weapons, Mel asked. Deanne stared at her. You mean, like a gun? Mel nodded. Donnie does have a gun, Deanne conceded. It belonged to his father. He keeps it locked in his desk in the bedroom. Why? Is it there now? Without a word, Deanne left the room. When she returned a few moments later, her face was pasty white. It's gone, she whispered, sinking onto the couch. You don't think he's the one who did it, do you? I mean, it's not possible. What kind of gun is it, Mel asked. I, I have no idea, Deanne managed. I don't know anything about guns. I just know I didn't like him having one. But it was a handgun of some kind, Mel persisted not a rifle or a shotgun. Yes, I think Donnie said it was a three fifty seven, but I'm not sure. Had I been asking the questions right then, my face probably would have given away the game. Mel's didn't. I'll go ahead and take down that missing person's information then, she said smoothly. What kind of vehicle did you say your husband drives? It was a deft pivot on Mel's part and Deanne Cosgrove clung to that disarming piece of fiction as though her life depended on it. Maybe it did. Without being able to believe we really were taking a missing persons report, Deanne might have fallen apart completely. A Chevrolet Tahoe, she answered. Surprisingly enough, the woman was still able to reel off Donnie's plate number from memory. Now what? Deanne asked. 
We're going to try to find him, Mel said. But not hurt him, right? Deanne said. I'm sure he hasn't done anything wrong he wouldn't have. We'll do everything in our power to see that no one gets hurt, I told her. Thank you, Deanne said gratefully. Thank you very much. She stood on the front porch as we made our way out the gate, down the driveway, and back to the sidewalk. At the end of the driveway, a rolling garbage bin had already been hauled out to the street. Mel and I exchanged glances as we walked past it. She held out her hand. I'll drive, she said. Gentleman that I am, I handed over the keys and climbed into the passenger seat. At the end of the block, Mel negotiated a quick U-turn, brought us back to the garbage bin parked at the end of the Cosgrove driveway, and I hopped out. Luckily, right on top of several dozen moldering dirty divers was a pair of mangled man sneakers. Triumphantly, I grabbed them up and hurried back to the car with my booty. Got him, I told Mel. Now drive. Next stop is the crime lab. Let's see what, if anything, Luminol can tell us. Mel, driving like a maniac as usual, steered us straight to the Washington State Patrol crime lab on Airport Way, south of downtown Seattle. There it took only a matter of minutes for Rena Bullworth, one of the criminalists specializing in blood evidence, to confirm what Mel and I already suspected. There were still tiny traces of human blood lingering on the seemingly white shoelaces and seams of Donny Cosgrove's Reeboks. Seeing blood there was one thing. Being able to know whose blood we were seeing was another problem entirely. Moments later, I was on the phone with Detective Lander up in Leavenworth telling him about this latest development. So, you think I'm right and the son-in-law could be our shooter, he wanted to know. Maybe, I said. The lady here at the crime lab isn't very hopeful about being able to extract a DNA profile from what little blood is left on Donny Cosgrove's shoes, but she's going to try. Even if the blood evidence isn't there, we've got footprints, Lander said. If your shoes match our prints, we can at least put him at the crime scene. Fair enough, I said. In the meantime, what kind of shell casings were found? A nine-millimeter golden saber. Why? Donny Cosgrove's wife told us he owns a handgun of some kind, a three fifty seven. she thinks, I said. But whatever kind of gun it is, it's currently missing from its usual spot in their bedroom. Lander whistled. Mm, sounds like we need to have a sit-down with this guy. Yes, I said, we do. But good luck finding him. He took off this afternoon after you left without telling his wife where he was going, and he hasn't been seen since. He isn't answering his phone. You want to post the bolo on him, or should I? Lander asked. In cop parlance, a be on the lookout is one step under an all-points bulletin, but it means pretty much the same thing. Not to worry, I said. My partner's doing that right now. Back to Redmond, Mel asked as we left the crime lab. I don't see any way around it, I said. So back to Redmond we went. When we arrived at the Cosgrove's little rambler a second time, the porch light was off, but interior lights showed at the windows. A fully dressed Deanne responded to the bell. She came to the door with a sleeping baby cradled in her arms. Did you find him, she asked. Is he all right? No, Mel said. We have yet to locate your husband, but we did find something else. We need to talk to you about it. By then, Deanne Cosgrove must have reached her own conclusions about our earlier visit. She listened to everything Mel and I had to say with dry-eyed concentration. "'You're telling me he's a suspect, then?' Deanne asked. "'It's always possible that your husband had nothing to do with what happened up in Leavenworth,' Mel said softly. "'But I think we can all agree that his behavior today is unusual. "'Until we can locate him and sort this all out, "'our first concern has to be keeping you and your children safe. "'I think you should take the children and leave.' Leave, Deanne repeated dully. You mean run away? Yes, I wanted to scream at her. Get the hell out of Dodge. It's the middle of the night, Deanne objected. The kids are asleep, she added. I'd have to load them into the van. Where would I take them? Well, you said earlier that some of your friends from church came over this afternoon and helped you. Do you think you could stay with one of them? Mel met and held Deanne's gaze for a period of several long seconds. When Deanne looked away first, I knew Mel had her. 
I'll call Mary Jane, she said. Mel and I stayed around while Deanne packed up a van load of food, clothing, and toys. Once the child gear had been loaded into the Dodge minivan in the garage, Mel and I helped carry the three sleeping kids out to the car and strapped them into their car seats. Deanne backed out of the garage and closed the garage door behind her. In the driveway, though, she paused and rolled down the window. "'Shouldn't I leave Donnie a note?' she asked. "'What if he comes home and we're not here? Won't he be worried?' You can talk to him on the phone if he calls you, Mel advised. Tell him you and the kids are fine, but don't tell him where you are or how to find you. And whatever you do, don't agree to meet him. If he contacts you, if he tells you where he is, you call us. We'll negotiate with him, not you. All right, Deanne agreed at last, if you think that's the best way to handle it. Mel and I stood in the street and watched until Deanne's taillights disappeared around the next intersection. The process of talking her into leaving had left me drained. "'Can we go home now?' I asked Mel. "'This has been a very long day.' "'You did a good job with Deanne,' I told Mel as we headed back to Seattle. "'Thanks,' Mel said. "'We went home. We went to bed. "'We had missed having dinner altogether, but I was too tired to be hungry.' When the phone rang at 2.12, I was so far off in La La Land that I tried to shut off the alarm instead of answering the phone. Mr. Beaumont! I hadn't spoken to Deanne Cosgrove all that often, but even half asleep I recognized her voice in the urgent whisper on the other end of the line. Are you all right? I asked at once. I'm at the house, she said. Donnie's here, too. I can see him through the window. He's asleep on the couch. My heart constricted inside my chest. Deanne was at the house, and so was Donnie. In my mind's eye, I could foresee the worst of all possible outcomes. "'What in the world are you doing there?' I demanded. "'I thought I told you.' "'I was worried about him,' Deanne continued hurriedly. "'I left the kids in Issaquah and drove by the house just to see if Donnie might have come home, and he did. "'His Tahoe is right here on the street where he usually parks it. "'His gun's there, too, locked inside. I can see it on the front seat.' but I don't have my own key to the Tahoe. It's still in the house. I thought about breaking the window to get at the gun, but I'm afraid that will set off the car alarm and wake him. Mel sat up next to me. What is it? You say Donnie's asleep on the couch, I said as much to Mel as to Deanne, trying in that one sentence to calm Deanne while at the same bringing Mel up to speed. Hang up the phone, Deanne, I ordered. Get in your car and drive away. I'll call 911 and have them send someone to... No, Deanne whispered to me. No way, I'm not leaving, and don't call 911 either, please. If armed cops show up here, they won't think of Donnie as the man I love or the father of my children. They'll only see a suspected killer. Which he is, I thought. Please, Detective Beaumont, Deanne continued. If you'll just talk to him, I'm sure he'll listen to you. I wasn't nearly as convinced of that as Deanne was, but by then I was already pulling on my pants. Mel scrambled out of bed after me and padded down the hallway to dress. All right, I agreed finally. I'm coming. We're coming, Mel and I both. If you don't want us to call anyone else to meet us there, you have to promise me one thing. What's that? That you drive down the street, pull into someone else's driveway, you can stay close enough to keep the truck in view so you can let us know in case he wakes up and starts to leave. But you cannot, you must not, be there in the house with him alone, understand? Deanne started to reply, then stopped. Donnie's my husband, she declared finally. Look, Deanne, I said, I know he's your husband and I know you love him. But in Donnie's current state of mind, armed or not, there's a good chance he poses a danger to himself and others. You included. But Donnie loves me. He'd never hurt me. I'm hanging up now so I can get dressed, I told Deanne. Promise me you won't go anywhere near the house. Promise? For an answer, she pushed the button and ended the call. I threw my phone onto the bed in utter frustration while I buttoned up my shirt. What the hell is the matter with that woman? Mel ignored my outburst. Where's Donnie Cosgrove and where's his gun, she wanted to know. And how are we going to play this? Donnie's asleep on the couch. At least Deanne thinks he's asleep. 
She claims his gun is locked in the car out on the street, but we have no idea if the one she's seeing in the vehicle is his only weapon. As far as your question about how we should play this is concerned, you tell me. The way I see it, smaller is better, Mel said. I'm all for understated elegance. Come on. Mel pulled our bubble light out of the glove compartment and slapped it on the roof of the Mercedes before she ever pulled out of the parking place. We exited the garage. Half a block later, we turned north on First Avenue. I glanced over at Mel as she turned on to Broad. If you're having second thoughts, I said. I'm not, she said. We're a lean, mean force. And with that, she slammed on the accelerator and sent us racing through four stoplights in a row, clearing each intersection as the light changed from yellow to red. Sick with worry in a short 14 minutes after pulling out of the parking garage of Belltown Terrace, we turned on to the Cosgrove's quiet cul-de-sac. Unplugging the flasher, Mel pulled in front of Donny Cosgrove's SUV and shut down the engine. Before the Mercedes could come to a complete stop, I was out the door and racing back toward the Tahoe. There I was relieved to see from my own eyes that Deanne was right. The blued steel handle of a three fifty seven Magnum lay partially visible under a folded newspaper that had been left on the passenger side front seat. As soon as I saw the revolver, I knew for sure it wasn't the weapon that had left behind the shell casing that had been found at the scene of the Lawrence double homicide. Revolvers don't eject their brass. By then, Mel had joined me on the sidewalk. His gun's here, I whispered to Mel. At least we've got that much going for us. Just then there was a single flash from a pair of headlights in a car blocked or so down the street. A car door slammed some distance away and running feet splashed toward us on the rain-soaked pavement. Thank God you really did come alone, Deanne said, gasping. I was afraid you were lying to me, that you'd bring a whole army along with you. Go back to your vehicle, I whispered urgently, catching Deanne by the arm and bodily turning her. Let us do our jobs. Is the front door locked or unlocked? It was locked when I left it, she said, but I don't know if it's locked now. Give me the key. Reluctantly, she reached into her jacket pocket and handed it over. This one, she said. Now get out of the line of fire. What do you mean, line of fire, she yelped. You said you wouldn't hurt him. You promised. I checked on him just a minute ago. He hasn't moved. Shut up, I ordered. Stay the hell out of the way. On the way to Redmond, we had determined that Mel would go around to the back of the house and wait on the far side of the patio doors, in case he made a break for it and tried to exit that way. Once she was in place, I'd go in through the front door and tackle him wherever he was sleeping. With one hand resting on her glock, Mel set out through the side yard to circle around to the back of the house. Rain was falling at a steady enough clip that it thrummed on the rooftops and dripped out of the gutters. I hoped the noise of the rain would help muffle the sounds of our moving footsteps. Wanting to give Mel plenty of time to get into position, I stayed where I was and counted to one hundred. Only then did I move forward, carefully, quietly, one silent step at a time. I eased my way up under the porch where glass side lights on either side of the front door offered a narrow glimpse of the living room. Pressing up to one of the windows, I saw the figure of a man lying sprawled against the back of the living room couch. One arm dangled limply over the end of the armrest with no sign of movement. On the coffee table, I glimpsed the outline of a spilled booze bottle. As I reached for the doorknob, I knew there was a fifty-fifty chance that the door would be locked, but it wasn't. The knob turned easily in my hand. The latch let go with what was probably only a tiny click, but the sound bore an ominous resemblance to a bullet dropping into a chamber. I stepped into the tiny vestibule. On the far side of the living room, I caught a glimpse of Mel through the glass at the patio door. She had yet to draw her weapon, and neither had I. I was within three steps of the couch when Deanne Cosgrove took Mel's and my well-thought-out plan and smashed it into a million pieces. Without any warning, she darted past me, screaming like a banshee. Donnie, wake up! You have to wake up! I tried to grab her, but she dodged out of the way. Despite the racket, though, Donnie Cosgrove didn't move, didn't even budge. And that's when I saw several empty prescription drug containers next to an almost empty vodka bottle that had spilled most of its remaining contents on the coffee table. 
Mel popped the flimsy lock on the patio door, shoved it open, and burst into the room. Kneeling beside the couch, she grasped Donnie's loose wrist. By then I had managed to grab Deanne and hang on to her. She was screaming frantically when Mel turned to us. "'He's still alive,' she said. "'Barely. Call 911.' It was almost three when the ambulance crew showed up in their rubber boots and waterproof jackets. While I attempted to keep a shaken and sobbing Deanne out of the EMT's way, they slapped Donnie onto a gurney. They wheeled him out to the waiting aid car. With a burst of noisy sirens, the ambulance took off, headed for Evergreen Hospital a few miles away. At the time they were leaving, there was no way to know if a stomach-pumping procedure would do the trick, or if Donnie Cosgrove was a goner. I'm going too, Deanne insisted. She pulled away from me, and I let her go. Moments later, Mel and I were alone in a living room littered with the ambulance crew's debris, muddy boot prints and discarded latex gloves. Are you okay? I asked. Mel nodded. But you'd better take a look at this, she said. She was pointing at the coffee table. Suicide note? I asked. Looks like. I moved over to the table and examined the paper without actually touching it. At the beginning of the note, the penmanship was reasonably legible. The ballpoint pen still lay on the floor where it had fallen. Honey bun. I didn't do it, but they'll think I did. That cop I talked to will think I killed them because I told him I was going to. I even had the gun along, but that was only because I wanted to scare the shit out of Jack Lawrence. I wanted him as scared as you were the other day, but mostly I took the gun along for protection. I saw the car of the guy who did it. At least I think it was his car. I watched him drive away. You've got to believe me when I tell you they were already dead when I got there. I checked. That's how the blood got all over me. But there was nothing I could do to help them. God help me. Nothing. I'm sorry. And you and the kids. The note ended its illegible scrawl in mid-sentence. It was unsigned. What do we do about this, Mel asked. We call Detective Lander over in Shalon and let him know that we've got Donnie. He may not be our suspect, but he is a potential eyewitness. If he lives, Mel muttered, and if Deanne had listened to us and stayed away from here, he'd be dead for sure. Local jurisdictions do not look kindly on other law enforcement agencies conducting raids or investigations of any kind on their turf without letting the home team know what's happening. Luckily for us, when the patrol officer arrived, a quick call to Harry I. Ball helped defuse the situation. By the time Mel and I drove across the 520 bridge, it was 5 a.m. The early bird morning commute was already underway, and Mel and I were both starving. 24-hour dining has almost gone the way of the dodo bird in downtown Seattle, with the notable exception of the Five Point Cafe at Fifth and Cedar. We ate breakfast, no coffee, and then staggered home to bed at six in the morning. To say we were both beat is understating the obvious. At nine in the morning, the phone rang. This is the doorman, Jerome Grimes told me. I have a Mr. Hatcher down here to see you. The very last thing I wanted right then was an in-house visit from Ross Connor's pet economist. But he was already there. All right, I said, tell him to go to the deli next door for some coffee and a bagel. Tell him we'll see him in fifteen minutes. Mel groaned. See who? She mumbled from under her pillow. Todd Hatcher, I told her, giving her a whack on her down comforter shrouded hip. Up and at him. The world awaits. Todd'll be here in fifteen. Todd arrived with copies of the abstracts and asked Mel and I if we'd take a look at them. On less than three hours of sleep, I wasn't going to be in the best condition to go searching for tiny discrepancies in a stack of old dead files. Mel gave me a look, took her stack of paper and her cup of coffee, and settled down to the window seat to go to work. I was saved by a phone call from Detective Lander over in Shillon. Any word on Donnie Cosgrove, I asked. Not since he got to the hospital. I tried checking, but the hospital wouldn't give me any info. I have Deanne's cell phone number, I told him. I'll try reaching her. 
were they all donning away in the ambulance, it didn't look too promising. What do you think about this supposedly suicidal non-confession? Lander asked. Do you think he really wasn't involved in the Lawrence homicides, or was he just trying to throw us off? I think Donny Cosgrove really did mean to kill himself, I responded. Does that mean he meant the rest of the note as well? Lander asked. Maybe, I said. He says he saw a vehicle that could have been the killer's drive away. At this point, even a description of the vehicle would give us a big leg up. You'll check on Cosgrove and let me know if and when I can come talk to him? Lander asked. Will do, I said. In the meantime, Ross Connors came through like a champ, Lander said. The phone records we ordered yesterday were on my desk when I showed up this morning. Have you seen yours yet? Not yet, I said. They're pretty interesting, he continued. They go along in a pretty predictable pattern until early last week. Then I have a whole series of calls from Jack Lawrence to Thomas Dortman, starting first thing on Tuesday morning. There are eight, nine, ten calls altogether from Jack Lawrence's cell phone. The one other oddball phone call was placed to a number in Portland, to a phone listed to someone named Kevin Stock. That one, and there was only one, was made on Saturday morning from the Lawrence's home phone. I know Tim Lander was talking, but I wasn't really paying strict attention. Suddenly, I had another idea. Hold on a second, I said into the phone. Then I called over my shoulder to Mel. Hey, Mel, when you looked up Thomas Dortman the other night, didn't you tell me he had a book coming out sometime soon? There's something about whistleblowers, Mel replied. I think it's due in bookstores sometime in the next several weeks. Give me a little time, I told Lander. Maybe I can figure out a way to get in touch with our friend Dortmund. When I put down the phone, Mel was staring at me. What? she said. What do authors need more than anything else? I give up, Mel said finally. Publicity? Todd Hatcher asked. Bingo. I scrolled down my outgoing calls and handed Mel my phone. Here's the number. But call him on your phone, not mine. Tell him you're writing a magazine article and you want to review his book. Tell him you're working on a deadline and don't have time to go through his publicity department. What good will that do, Mel wanted to know. You make an appointment to talk to him, only we show up instead. Mel was giving me one of her glowers when Todd took the phone from me and said, I'll do it. He did, and he did a credible job of it, too leaving a message that was flattering enough that I figured no author in his right mind would be able to resist. Okay, I said to Mel. Come on, let's go talk to Donny Cosgrove. Well, what about me? Todd asked. Keep working, I said. There's fresh coffee in the pot. We'll be back. And what if that Dortmund guy calls to set up an interview? Tell him where and when and then call us, I said, and gave him the number. Since we didn't need to get to Kirkland in a hell of a hurry, I drove. At the hospital, when we located Donny Cosgrove's room, he was still hooked up to an IV. Looking haggard, Deanne hovered on the far side of the bed. This is Mr. Beaumont, she said as we approached. I think you talked to him on the phone, and this is his partner, Melissa Soames, Mel supplied. Most people call me Mel. Donny Cosgrove was a big man in a flabby, flaccid kind of way and the distended veins on his nose spoke of a man with a more than nodding acquaintance with the sauce. "'They're the people who saved your life last night,' Deanne continued. "'No,' Mel corrected. "'The person who saved your life is your wife. "'When everyone else was busy giving up on you "'and everyone else was telling her to stay away, "'Deanne insisted on coming back to check on you. Oh, "'I am sorry I made such a mess of things,' Donnie said to Deanne. "'Sorry I put you through so much.' Hush, she said. It's okay. It doesn't matter. They need to talk to you is all. Need to ask you a few questions. What kind of questions? Donnie asked. Tell us about Saturday. Well, I've been thinking about Jack uh, ever since he showed up at the house on Thursday, Donnie began. It just burned me up that he could come over and raise hell like that and get away with it. Saturday, I decided I was going to go give him a piece of my mind. I told Deanne that I had some work to do at the office, even though I didn't, and when I left the house, I put my three fifty seven in my pocket. Did you ever meet Jack Lawrence? No, I said. I never met the man. He was a big guy, bigger than me, and very tough. I'm not exactly a, 
a wash in muscles, so I took the gun along, sort of the even things out between us, if you know what I mean, to buck up my courage a little bit, and on my way there I stopped off a couple of times for a beer or two. As in liquid courage, I asked. He nodded. But it didn't work. When I got there, I was so nervous I couldn't drive up the road. I parked at their turnoff instead. Parked and chewed gum, I asked. Nicorette, he said. I'm trying to stop smoking. So much for a possible DNA ID from the chewing gum, I thought. Well, what happened then, I asked. The beer, he said. I was just sitting there thinking about him, and then I fell asleep. Something woke me up. I'm not sure what. Maybe it was the gunshots. Anyway, I woke up with a start and was sitting there trying to get my bearings and think what to do next when this car comes barreling out of Jack and Carol's driveway. What kind of car? An old four Lincoln LS, Donnie said. Silver, I didn't see the plates. Donnie knows cars, Deanne put in. He's already teaching the boys which are which when they come on TV. What happened next, Mel asked. Donnie bit his lip, and for the first time in the whole encounter, he clearly didn't want to talk any more. Nothing, he said finally. That's why I feel so guilty. I sat there in the car for a while. I mean, I didn't have any way of knowing something awful had just happened, so I sat there and had another beer or two, thinking things over. If I had gone right then when it first happened, maybe I could have helped them, but when I got there and found them, it was too late. And suddenly I knew why Donnie Cosgrove hadn't come forward at the time, why he had staggered around in Jack and Carol Lawrence's blood without bothering to report the shootings to anyone. He wasn't thinking straight, because he was drunk. And you were afraid if you called the cops, they'd either think you had done it or give you a DUI, I said accusingly, or both. Donnie Cosgrove gave me a baleful look. I already have one, he admitted. Even though I'd already figured out the lush part, his admission made me mad as hell. Dan deserved better. The three kids deserved better. I think we're done here, I said. With that, I turned and left the room. A few minutes later, Mel joined me in a covered breezeway. What the hell were you thinking, walking out like that? You didn't even bother asking him if he'd seen the shooter. Had he? I asked. No, but that's what I figured. That's why I left, and to keep me from flattening the drunken bum's nose. I don't understand, Mel began. Of course you don't, but I do. Donnie Cosgrove is a self-important bastard with a gorgeous wife and three kids who all think he walks on water. And why shouldn't he? He's told him so. He's got an education and a good job, but he's too busy drowning his non-existent sorrows on the weekends to pay any attention to them. We were out in the parking lot by then. Naturally, it was raining. Again. Don't you think you're being a little judgmental about this, Mel wanted to know. Maybe she was right. Maybe Donnie Cosgrove's failures as a husband and father too closely mirrored my own. Maybe that's what set me off. Not nearly judgmental enough, I shot back at her. Believe me, I recognize the symptoms. I've been there, done that, and I've got the T-shirt. We were almost back to 405 before I tossed Mel my phone. We better let Tim Lander know. His number is in there somewhere. Look for a 509 area code in the dialed calls. Detective Lander didn't answer, so Mel left a message. Try Todd, I suggested. Let's see if Dortman called him back. He did, Hatcher was saying when Mel turned my cell phone on speaker. He said he couldn't do an interview today because he's been called out of town and is on his way to the airport. He gave me the number for his publicist in New York and suggested we arrange to do what he called a phoner later. Sorry I didn't do better, Hatcher added. Wait a minute, I said. He called you from a cell phone? Yes, like I said, he's on his way to the airport. Well, give me that number. Mel pulled out her own phone because she's a woman and, as she's told me many times, can do more than one thing at once. She held one phone to her ear with her left hand and keyed the number into her own phone with the other. "'Mr. Dortman,' she said when he answered. "'Melissa Soames with Special Homicide. We're looking into a pair of homicides that happened up in Leavenworth over the weekend. If you don't mind, we'd like to ask you a few questions.' 
sugar wouldn't have melted in her mouth. Oh, that's quite all right, Mr. Dortman. We're near the airport right now. Tell us where we can find you. I'm sure you'll have no problem making your flight. In the Alaska boardroom? Sure, I know where it is. I had already hit the gas pedal. We were, in fact, nowhere near SeaTac Airport, but we would be soon. He couldn't resist, Mel said. I love crooks. They always think they're smarter than we are, and they always want to know what we know. My phone rang. Mel put it on speaker before she answered. Bingo, Tim Lander shouted. Dortman has an 04 Lincoln LS. How did you figure that out? Donny Cosgrove, I told him. Dortman is on his way to the airport right now, and so are we. Do some digging on him if you can. Call us if you find out anything more. Tim Lander called back a few minutes later, long before we'd even reached the S-curves in Renton. I'm headed over the mountains right now, Lander said. Guess who has a license to carry? Our friend Dortman is the proud owner of a 9 millimeter Beretta, which would be consistent with that one piece of brass we found. What are we going to ask Dortman once we find him, Mel asked me. We try to catch him in a lie. First we ask him whether or not he was in Leavenworth on Saturday night. Depending on how he answers the first one, we ask him whether or not he knew Jack and Carol Lawrence. If he lies about either one, he's not flying today. But what do you think are the chances that he won't be waiting for us in the boardroom, I asked. I think the chances for that are excellent, Mel returned. So we'll find out which plane he's due to fly out on and catch up with him at the gate. At SeaTac, I let Mel out at the departing passenger door and then parked. Bent on catching up to Mel, I was hot-footing it across the sky bridge toward the terminal when my phone rang. It was Ralph Ames. I'm a little busy right now, Ralph, I said. Can I call you back? Sure, but here are the high points. I've talked the detectives down in Cancun into faxing you a copy of the ballistics information on the bullet taken from Richard Matthews' body. But here's the kicker. You'll never guess who their main person of interest is. The cops in Cancun say they're looking for a nun. A Catholic nun. Matthews and an unidentified sister were seen walking together on the beach shortly before he disappeared. I stopped in mid-stride. Did you say a nun? Yes, Ames answered. A fairly young nun, early thirties at the most. I thought you'd be glad to hear it. You can call Mel Soames a lot of things, but a nun isn't one of them. Look, Ralph, I gotta go, but thanks. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Call waiting was buzzing, and I switched over. You found him, I asked. Come to security at the main sea concourse gates, Mel said. Look for the first-class passenger and crew line. I've got someone here from TSA who'll walk us through. When I caught up to them, Mel introduced me to Darrell Cross, a transportation security officer. He nodded curtly in my direction, spoke briefly into his walkie-talkie, and then opened a chain into one of the maze-like sorting areas and led us straight to the front of the line. While we were placing our shoes and weapons in the security trays, I leaned over to Mel. Lady, when you're good, you're good. How the hell did you pull this off? If I told you, I'd have to kill you she said with a smile. Okay, Mel said once we had our shoes back on. Dortmund's on the 1145 flight for LAX. When he gets there, he's scheduled to connect with an overnight Copa Airlines flight to Caracas, Venezuela. Booked his tickets yesterday, paid full fare. In a hurry to get out of town, I asked. Do you think? The whole time we'd been going through the search procedure, Mr. Cross had been speaking into his walkie-talkie. Okay, Miss Soames, he said, leading us in the direction of the D gates. I've talked to baggage. They've got Mr. Dortmund's baggage isolated. If he doesn't fly, neither will his luggage. As we approached the gate area, I didn't think it would be difficult to recognize Thomas Dortmund. He had posted his photo all over his website. He was seated at the end of the bank of seats nearest the ticket agent's counter and the door leading out to the jetway. His website photos must have been either very old or photoshopped. The man depicted there had been younger and far leaner than this one. This one was jowly and slightly balding. He also looked haggard and bleary-eyed. Without any discussion, Mel and I approached Dortmund from either side. We somehow missed each other in the boardroom, Mr. Dortmund, Mel said, casually flashing her ID in his direction. I must have misunderstood. The gate agent made her announcement. 
Dortmund started to rise. Oh, you'll have to excuse me, he said. They're calling my flight. Have a seat, Mr. Dortmund, Mel said. You paid full fare. If you missed this flight, you can always rebook. Beads of sweat suddenly popped out of the man's forehead. Mel slipped into the seat next to him. So, is your publisher putting out a Spanish edition of the Whistleblower's Guide? She asked conversationally. No, he said. Why? I'd think you'd need to be available for interviews and appearances. Won't that be difficult to do from so far away, especially since you didn't bother to book a return flight? I have a meeting with a source in Caracas, he said indignantly, for my next book. In addition, my flight information is supposed to be confidential. You have no right to. When's the last time you saw Carol and Jack Lawrence, I asked. Who? Wrong answer, Mr. Dortman, I said. I nodded toward Cross, but it wasn't necessary. He was already picking up his walkie-talkie. Okay with the luggage, he said. Take it off the cart and bring it to my office. My luggage, Dortman yelped. You can't touch my luggage. You don't have a warrant. They can't touch your luggage, Cross said pleasantly, glancing at Mel and me. But I can, particularly if there's a chance a traveler's luggage will be on a flight when he isn't. But I haven't missed my flight. Darrell Cross smiled. I believe you're about to, he said. You need to come with us, Mr. Dortman. For a second or two, I thought Dortman was going to bolt and make a run for the jetway. In the end, he thought better of it. He shrugged and stood. I was about to ask him to put his hands behind him. This is my jurisdiction, Mr. Beaumont, Cross said. If you don't mind, we'll do the honors, but you're welcome to read him his rights. Two more TSA agents appeared out of nowhere, patting Dortman down and cuffing him. In the pocket of his jacket they found a plastic cheese knife that, wielded properly, could have done a good deal of damage to soft body tissue. Dragging Dortman's two fully loaded pieces of carry-on luggage with us, Mel and I followed Dortman and his TSA contingent back down the concourse and out past security. I've seen jail cells more welcoming than Darrell Cross's windowless hole of an office. It was carved out of otherwise wasted space between a men's restroom and the back of an abandoned ticket counter and furnished with grim gray-green federal building cast-offs. We took seats around a scarred Formica-topped conference table. One of Darrell Cross's TSA minions removed Dortmund's cuffs. Had he called for a lawyer, we would have gotten him one, and had an attorney appeared, his first bit of advice would have been for Dortmund to shut the hell up. But no attorney had been summoned, and by the time we seated ourselves around the battered tabletop, Dortmund was in tears. I didn't mean to, he blubbered, lowering his head onto his arms. Sitting behind his battle-worn desk, Darrell Cross seemed content to let Mel and me take over the questioning process. Maybe you'd like to tell us about it, she suggested. Jack was going to go public, Dortman said. He was going to spill his guts. About what? Mel asked. Jack was completely paranoid, Dortman continued. Once someone started looking into his wife's ex-husband's death, Jack said he was sure they were going to come after us, too. I tried to tell him that the statute of limitations had run out long ago, and there was no way for anyone to lay a glove on us. He was retired. Since I'm still working, I was the one who'd get hurt in the deal. If I got linked back to that whole scandal thing, that would be the end of my credibility. What scandal thing? I asked. Dortmund shook his head. There was so damned much money floating around, he said. Those were the days when planes didn't get sold unless someone's palm got greased. Since Jack was in sales, he knew all about the kickbacks. We figured out a way to skim some off the top. Not very much in the big scheme of things, but enough. Enough for Jack Lawrence to retire early? Dortman nodded. Well, I would have been all right, too, but I got caught up in the dot-com bubble, lost my shirt, and I'm still working. So when Jack threatened me, I had to do something. I tried to convince him to keep quiet. When I went to talk to him about it, he came after me. What happened was really self-defense. All I was doing was protecting myself. That's why Carol Lawrence was shot in the back, you little shit, I thought. What about Tony Cosgrove, I asked. Well, what about him? Dortman returned. 
He went fishing. The mountain blew up. End of story. Was he involved in the skimming, I asked? He figured it out, Dortman said. I was out of the country when all that came down. For all I know, maybe Jack did get rid of him, but I had nothing to do with it. What about Kevin Stock, I asked. Who's he? Dortman shook his head. I have no idea, he said. A laser printer sat behind Mel. She reached around to it and removed a blank sheet of paper, which she slid across the table so it came to a stop directly in front of Thomas Dortman. Maybe you'd like to write some of that down for us, she said, passing him a pen, just to be clear. You mean, like write down a confession or something, he asked. Mel didn't reply because Dortman was already shaking his head. I'm not confessing to anything, he declared. I want a lawyer. Now you have to let me go. Darrell Cross had maintained his silence throughout the process. No, he said, actually we don't. Not only did you have a dangerous weapon in your possession that you carried through security, we've now x-rayed your checked luggage. We know that there's at least one weapon in there as well. I have a license for that, Dortman objected. A valid license to carry. I want a lawyer. Darrell Cross was entirely agreeable about it. And you'll have one, he said. With any luck, he'll arrive about the same time we have the warrant to search your luggage. You're welcome to use my phone here to call your attorney, if you like. Have him meet you at the King County Justice Center in Kent. Or, if you'd rather, you can call him from there. You're a choice. I'll call him from there, Dortman said. As you like, Cross responded. The door opened and the two TSA officers who had brought Dortman into the office appeared once more. I believe Mr. Dortman here is ready to be transported. The guards led him away. I couldn't help feeling let down. I thought we were going to come out of here with a confession, I groused. Not to worry, Darrell Cross said. He motioned toward the clock behind him. Only then, upon closer examination, did I notice the camera lens that had been discreetly concealed inside the face of it. You recorded it? I asked. Every bit of it, Cross replied. With all of us visible in the room, I think Mr. Dortman will have a hell of a time convincing anyone that it was a forced confession. Copies, anyone? Yes, please, Mel said. Darrell Cross remained pleasant and cordial enough right up until Tim Lander showed up. He arrived with his legally executed search warrant in hand about the same time Darrell Cross's warrant appeared. That was when some old-fashioned TSA rigidity and non-cooperation arrived on the scene as well. Before the situation devolved into open warfare, Mel was able to finesse things enough that we were finally able to open Thomas Dortman's assorted luggage. The lid of one carry-on was stuffed with packets of hundred-dollar bills. "'Looks like he stopped by his bank this morning and closed out his accounts,' I said. Mel nodded. "'That's probably why he hung around till Monday,' she said. In the end, Detective Lander settled for walking away with Dortman's nine-millimeter Beretta, while Darrell Cross took control of everything else. As far as Dortman's Lincoln was concerned, however, Lander held the trump card." The L.S. was specifically listed on his search warrant. We located the vehicle, and after showing the parking attendant the search warrant, got the keys. Lander opened the driver's door, bent down, and peered at the floor. Then he stepped back. Take a look. Mel took a look herself. Looks like dried blood to me, she said. That's what I thought, Lander replied. He had summoned a tow truck. He and the attendant were arguing over payment of the parking fee, when I finally had a moment to tell Mel about how Matthews and an unidentified nun were seen walking together on the beach before he disappeared. Two unidentified nuns, she said. That pretty well spells it out. Richard Matthews' murder and Juan Carlos Escobar's have to be related. Not two unidentified nuns, I told her. Three. Three, she said. What are you talking about? LaShawn Tompkins. Shortly before he was gunned down at his mother's front door, an unidentified nun was seen lurking in the neighborhood. She was seen, but no one's been able to find any trace of her. A nun who goes around shooting people or running them down? Mel asked. That's ridiculous. It's still a possibility, I told her. And even if it's a long shot with both you and Destry Hennessy involved, 
We'd better give Ross Connors a heads up on this, too. She nodded. When Ross didn't answer his cell, I called his office, only to be told he was locked up in a series of meetings. When those ended, he was scheduled to speak at a dinner meeting in Tacoma. By then, Mel and I were running on empty on both food and sleep. We had planned to go back to Belltown Terrace and call it a day. Instead, we left the airport, hit I-5, and headed south to Tacoma. Can't we stop somewhere and get a sandwich, Mel complained. She was hungry enough to be downright whiny. Wait, I told her, you'll thank me later. I doubt that, Mel said. Sulking, she folded her arms across her chest, settled into the far corner of the passenger seat, and soon nodded off. By the time we exited the freeway and made our way up the hill to the restaurant where Ross would be speaking, the rain had stopped and an afternoon sunbreak had burned through the gloom. Inside, they had started serving dinner and the early dining crowd was lining up for the cheap eats. I guided Mel into the bar, hoping that from there we'd be able to spot Ross on his way into the restaurant. As we mowed our way through two orders of crab cakes, a side of pea salad, and several cups of coffee, Mel was almost civilized again. She was also puzzling over the same question that was bothering me. Okay, she said. Matthews clearly got away with something. To a lesser degree, so did Escobar, since the punishment didn't exactly suit the crime. It makes sense that we're dealing with a vigilante action of some kind. Other than the involvement of a nun, the only other connection between those two cases is that Destry and I are both involved in Sasak. I had already come to the same conclusion, and I was glad to hear Mel arrive there on her own. But LaShawn Tompkins was exonerated, Mel continued. Of that particular crime, I said, what if there's another crime we don't know about? Just then Ross Connors emerged and entered the lobby. Three stylishly dressed, power-suited women greeted him there and were about to lead him off toward a meeting room when I managed to snag him away from them. I saw that you called, he said. What's up? We told him what was going on. All of it. From Donny Cosgrove and Thomas Dortman right through to our unexpected but possible linking of those three very disparate cases. When we got to the part about LaShawn Tompkins... He stood up abruptly, walked over to the bar, and ordered a drink. By the time he returned to the table, he seemed to have made up his mind about something. By then, one of the ladies had returned to retrieve Ross and was standing impatiently at his shoulder. Taking the paper cocktail napkin from under his drink, he jotted a name on to it and then dropped it on the table in front of me. Two words were written there. Annalise Kim. She works at the crime lab in South Seattle, Connors said. We may have an evidence handling problem there. Go talk to her. Mel and I were actually talking about going on down to Olympia to see Destry. No, Connors barked, not at this time. With that, he turned and gave his hostess a bland smile and allowed himself to be led away. Whoa, Mel observed. Who pushed his button? We did, evidently. Mel picked up the napkin. Who's this? I'm not sure. I think she's an evidence clerk. I guess we better go see her. Which we did. Once again I drove while Mel ran the phone. We were headed for the crime lab, but fortunately she called ahead and learned that Annalise Kim was currently off on leave. Nobody said what kind of leave, but the answer Mel was given raised enough red flags that she didn't hang up until she had Annalise's home phone number and address. When Mel phoned there, she spoke to a Mr. Kim, who told us that his wife volunteered at the Burian Public Library branch on Monday evenings. So we went there instead. Walking into the library, we went straight to the lady stationed at the reference desk. I'm looking for Mrs. Kim, I said. The woman smiled and nodded in the direction of one of the book stacks. Partway across the room, a small woman with iron-gray hair and decidedly Asian features was pushing a book cart that was nearly as tall as she was. As we approached her, she pulled a rubber-made footstool from the bottom shelf of the cart and climbed up to return a book. She was still on the stool and at my eye level when we reached her. "'Mrs. Kim,' I asked, pulling out my ID. "'I'm J.P. Beaumont with the Special Homicide Investigation Team. This is my partner, Mel Soames.' Ross Connors suggested we get in touch with you. That didn't take long. 
She climbed off her perch and shelved the next several books without needing the stool's extra elevation. It didn't take long, I asked. Sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. I've been complaining about this for months. But as soon as I send an attorney around, well, that gets a reaction, doesn't it? Complaining about, Mel said. Annalise Kim returned two books and then sorted and reshelved several that must have been put away in the wrong order. About the hostile work environment at the crime lab, she said. Mrs. Kim, Mel said, if you wouldn't mind bringing us up to speed. I like order, Annalise declared. Some people aren't interested in keeping things in order. She paused to straighten the spines of books that were less than properly aligned. Lifo, she muttered, almost under her breath. That's the way we used to do it, before... I glanced at Mel, who seemed to be as mystified about all this as I was. Lifo, Annalise explained, as in last in, first out, as opposed to FIFO, first in, first out. Lifo is how we do things here, too. When I come in, the return books are stacked right there under the counter. The last ones to come in go back on the shelves first, and when I get to the last stack, the one in the back, I know I'm catching up. I like that. It makes me feel as though I'm accomplishing something. To go back to what you said before, I said, I'm assuming LIFO is how you used to do things at the crime lab, but now something has changed. Is that correct? What changed is she came along, Annalise declared. By she, you mean Destry Hennessy? Mel asked. Oh, no, not her, Annalise said. But since she's in charge, she's the one who could have fixed it, the one who should have put a stop to it. Who, then, I insisted. Yolanda Andrade. One of your co-workers? Not exactly. I'm just a clerk. Yolanda's an actual DNA analyst. She's supposed to develop profiles of the most recent cases. That's the whole reason they hired her, so the newest cases could be run through those new violent offender DNA databases. But she keeps rummaging around in the old stuff. I know because she takes kits out of cold storage and then doesn't return them to where they're supposed to go. What do you mean, old stuff? Mel asked. Before the crime lab moved into the new building, they had storage facilities here, there, and the next place, and things were a mess. Once we had everything gathered in one spot, it was my job to organize it, and I did. Working with years of unprocessed rape kits was no fun. I developed a system and was starting to get it organized, but then Yolanda came along and started messing around with those old evidence kits. Ones from 10 or 15 or even 20 years ago. And even though I've tried talking to her about it, she hasn't stopped. And Mrs. Hennessy won't make her stop either, probably because Yolanda is free and I'm not. Free? I asked. Right, Annalise said. Someone else, I'm not sure who, is paying her wages. Mine come out of the crime lab budget. But I'll be a lot more expensive when this is all over. I'm on leave to use up the rest of my vacation. After that, I'll quit. Then I'm going to court. I made the connection then. Yolanda Andrade had to be the DNA profiler Sasek was paying for, the one I'd heard about on Friday night at the fundraiser. When I glanced in Mel's direction, she was grim-faced, and I knew why. If you're going to launch a vigilante action, how much better to do it against people the cops didn't know they were looking for? Those long-stored rape kits with their unidentified DNA profiles would be an open book. One of those could very well lead back to LaShawn Tompkins, for example, and to many others as well, like to any number of ex-cons whose DNA profiles had been entered into the CODIS system or into our statewide DNA database simply because they'd been locked up in our prison system. I felt the hair rise in the back of my neck. Did she ever get any hits on those old cases? Mel asked. I never saw any, Annalise answered. Getting a hit is a big deal, you see. We mark them off on a board and everything. We're at 406 right now. 406 hits, that is. And once there is one, the kit is moved to a different section in the evidence room, from cold case to pending. Another part of your filing system, Mel asked. Annalise nodded. Well, tell us about it, Mel said. The filing system? It's really nothing more or less than a shelf list. It's an inventory system, a way to tell what's missing and what isn't. 
And that's one of the things I did every single day. Check the shelves to see if any of my control numbers were missing. And if they were, Mel asked. I wrote down the kit number, noted when it left the shelf, and when it came back on its own, or when I found it somewhere it didn't belong. You don't still happen to have that list, do you? Mel asked. Of course I do, Annalise returned. Would you like to have a copy? Yes, Mel said. It would be really helpful. Fine, then, Annalise told us. Once I finish here, we can stop by the house, but I have to finish shelving the rest of the books. I had just that moment fallen in love with Annalise Kim and her insatiable love of order. In fact, I had to resist the temptation to reach out and smother that incredibly wonderful record-keeping woman in an old-fashioned bear hug. But that might have been as unwelcome as an improperly aligned book spine. We wouldn't even consider taking you away from that, I said. At which point my phone rang. The withering look Annalise sent in my direction made it clear cell phones were an unwelcome intrusion in her library. I raced for the door. It's me, Todd Hatcher said. I was hoping to talk to you. I've turned up some pretty interesting stuff today, but it's getting late. I'm about to head home. You're still at Belltown Terrace, I asked. Yeah, he said. I ordered a pizza for dinner. Hope you don't mind. I don't mind at all, I said. Now, did Ross Connors happen to give you access to the SHIT squad's Lexus Nexus program? No, Todd said. He didn't need to. I have my own. Why? Because neither Mel nor I have computers with us at the moment, and we need a whole batch of research done in a hell of a hurry. What do you need, he asked. Every single thing you can find on both Destry Hennessy and Anita Bowden. Find whatever you can and print it. No problem, Todd said. I'll get right on it. When do you think you'll be here? That remains to be seen, I said. We've got a few things to handle on the way. On the drive north from Durian, as I fought to stay awake, I was forced to confront the fact that J.P. Beaumont is no Jack Bauer from 24. It helped my ego that despite Mel's relative youth and the nap she had grabbed earlier in the day, Mel was struggling to stay awake too. So, what do we do? Mel asked. She was clutching the papers Annalise had given us. Do we call Ross, have him send someone in to isolate all the kits that have been tampered with so they can be analyzed or more likely reanalyzed? Bad idea, I said. As soon as we do that, we tip our hand. Once Yolanda Andrade knows we're looking into this, you can bet everyone else involved will know too. I'm sure that's why Ross didn't want us talking to Destry either. It hurts me to think that Destry's crooked, Mel said. Me too, I said. The very idea left me feeling half sick. And if there had been evidence handling irregularities in the crime lab... She didn't finish the sentence, and she didn't need to. I knew exactly what she meant. That kind of scandal could jeopardize convictions that were years in the past. Todd's on it, I said. On what? He called while we were at the library. Since he was still at the house, I put him to work tracking down information on Destry Hennessy. I paused, worried that I was venturing onto thin ice. I also asked him to track down whatever he could on Anita Bowden. Good idea, Mel said. And that's all she said. When we got to the condo, Todd greeted us like an eager puppy that's been left on its own all day long. He had a fistful of papers to show us. Sorry, Todd, I told him. Mel and I are both working on two hours' worth of sleep. You're more than welcome to stay over. The guest rooms made up and available help yourself. And off to bed we went. I never really understood that when Mel goes down the hall every night before we go to bed, she uses some potion or other to remove her makeup. That night, tired as she was, she went to bed without performing that little chore. The next morning, though, I happened to wake up first, and I was shocked. Mel looked like a raccoon. 
Are you all right? I asked when she finally blinked awake. Sleepy, she said. Why? You look like someone blacked both your eyes. She leaped out of bed and, stark naked, raced down the hall to her bathroom, the guest room bathroom. She came back a few minutes later wrapped in a robe, carrying her clothing and absolutely furious at me. Why didn't you tell me Todd was sleeping over? You were right there when I told him he was welcome to stay, I countered. Yes, but you never told me he'd accepted. In other words, the Ides of March didn't get off to the most auspicious of starts around our place. While Mel showered in my bathroom, I went out to the kitchen to make coffee. Todd was there eating cold leftover pizza. He didn't say a word about Mel, and neither did I. Todd gave me a choice of two different stacks of paper, one with reprints of articles on Destry Hennessy, and the other devoted to Anita Bowden. I picked the Anita option and retreated to my recliner. Anita Bowden, daughter of a university physics professor and an insurance executive, had attended a parochial school. Was that a connection? Did the fact that Anita Bowden had attended Catholic schools as a child have something to do with the fact that a mysterious nun was somehow involved in her series of homicides? Another media mention of Anita Bowden came two years later, in the July 7th issue of Ann Arbor News, where she was mentioned in her father's obituary. Private funeral services will be held today at 2 p.m. at St. Clair Catholic Church for noted University of Michigan physics professor Armand P. Bowden who died unexpectedly in his home late last week. Died unexpectedly in his home. In the old days, when journalism was a more gentlemanly pursuit, those words constituted media shorthand and media newspeak for suicide. The rest of the article was a mostly laudatory recitation of his educational and employment background. Anita's name came at the very end, where she and her mother, Rachel Bowden, were listed as survivors. Those two snippets of Anita Bowden's history were as far as I'd managed to make it when Mel finally emerged from the bedroom. She was not only dressed, she was dressed to the nines. Heels, skirt, silk blouse, and blazer. In other words, she was clothed in the full armor of God and ready to take on all comers. All right, she said coolly, ignoring me and looking Todd straight in the eye. What have we got? Wordlessly, he passed Mel the Destry Hennessy file. She took that and a cup of coffee and headed for the window seat. For the next several minutes, the atmosphere in the room was thick with tension. It was a relief when my phone rang. Detective Beaumont? Yes. Detective Donner here, Ambrose Donner with Bountiful PD. Sorry I wasn't able to get that composite from the Escobar case off to you yesterday. Turns out I ran into, shall we say, a few difficulties. I know how that goes, I said, and I did. He meant that somebody with a wad of brass on his uniform had decided sending the composite wasn't going to happen. That's all right, I added. I was tied up all day yesterday in another case. I can't send it now, Donner said. He sounded pissed. Is that fax number you gave me still good? Sure, I said. Send away. I put down the phone and sat there waiting for the fax machine to come to life. Did you call Ross yet? Mel asked. I was stalling on that, I admitted. I'm not wild about telling him one of his favorite people, a criminalist he personally hired and mentored, is bent. You'd better call him all the same, Mel told me. We may think confiscating those tampered rape kits is a bad idea, but Ross Connors may think differently about that. Wouldn't you like to make the call, I offered? Do I look stupid or something, Mel returned? Not on your life. You do it. So I did. While the fax machine began clicking and clacking, I dialed Ross's office and was thrilled to be told the attorney general was in a meeting. Any message? His secretary asked. No, I said. I'll get back to him later. Coward, Mel said when I hung up the phone. I waited until the fax machine shot the piece of paper into the tray. Then I picked the composite up. Beneath it was a second fax, the ballistics information Ralph had managed to wheedle out of the authorities down in Cancun. I took both faxes along with me as I headed to the kitchen for a coffee refill. 
Mel must have emptied her mug at about the same time. I had put the composite down on the counter and was pouring my coffee when Mel joined me. She set her cup down and picked up the piece of paper. What I heard next was a sharp intake of breath. I know her, Mel said. I've seen this woman before. Where? On the trip to Mexico. She was there? She was one of the board members? No, Mel answered. She's one of the pilots. One of the two pilots in Anita Bowden's private jet. The pilot was a woman? Both of the pilots were women, Mel said pointedly. My mistake. What's her name? I asked. I have no idea, Mel said. We may have been introduced. If we were, I don't remember. There were two of them. I opened my cell phone and dialed Ralph Ames. Any word on the ballistic stuff I sent you? Ralph wanted to know when he answered. I didn't have the heart to tell him I'd only just that moment seen it. Not yet, I said, but remember the other day when I asked you about that flight into Cancun? Sure, Ralph said. What about it? I need the tail number on the plane, I said. I also need to know the names of the pilots, names and addresses, too, if you can get them. That might be a little more difficult, he allowed, but I'll see what I can do and get right back to you. I closed my phone, but a moment later Ross called, and I spent the next ten minutes telling him what I could about what was going on in the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab under Destry Hennessy's dubious leadership. When I finished, he let out a long sigh. "'Damn,' he said, "'but you and Mel are right. Doing anything to try to secure those rape kits right now is going to set off alarms for whoever's involved. We're just going to have to leave them for the time being.' Call waiting was calling. Sorry, Ross, I said, gotta go. Ralph Ames was on the other line. Here are the names of the pilots, he said. Diane Massingale and Trudy Rayburn. The plane's a Hawker 800 XP. Tail number is N861AB. That's November 861 Alpha Bravo. Excellent, Ralph, I told him. What about addresses on the pilots? Didn't get those, he said. The FBO in Cancun might have some information on that. FBO? FBO stands for Fixed Base Operator, Ralph explained. They handle ground operations for general aviation. Fuel, catering, landing facilities, ground transportation, car rentals, all those kind of things. So, FBOs are all over? Sure, Ralph said. And they keep a record of planes that land and take off under their auspices? Especially if landing fees or fuel purchases were involved, Ralph said. Why? What does any of this have to do with the price of peanuts? I'll tell you later, Ralph. Right now I've got to go. I closed the phone and turned to Todd Hatcher. Do you happen to have your spreadsheet handy, I asked. Sure, why? You know what an FBO is, I asked. Well, I have no idea, he returned. So I explained it as well as I could, bearing in mind that I had only heard the term for the first time a few minutes earlier. I want you to go to each of the crime scenes we know about, the ones you've been putting in. Then I want you to locate all the FBOs in the area and find out if a plane with the tail number November 861 Alpha Bravo was anywhere in that vicinity at the time of any of our mysterious deaths. Ditto the case in Salt Lake City, I added. The one I read about in the Destry Hennessy stuff, Todd asked. The Escobar murder? That's the one. Meanwhile, Mel had located a phone book. Here, she said, T. Rayburn. She lives in Kent. Don't pilots all have licenses, I asked. I'm sure, she said. They're handled by the Federal Aviation Administration. Want me to see what kind of information we can come up with? If nothing else, it would be helpful to know which is which. With Todd using the landline to track FBOs, Mel got on her cell phone to start working her way through the powers that be at the FAA. At the same time, I poked away at my cell phone to dial my own favorite weapons analyst, a self-described gun guy down at the crime lab, one Larry Crum. Larry and I go back a long way. We used to be pals, drinking buddies. Hey, bro, Larry said when I identified myself. How's it hanging? Typical drinking buddy B.S., and typical drinking buddy conversation. Never say anything real. I'm working on a case, I told him. This is not news, he replied. The problem is it crosses a few international lines, I explained. Like between the U.S. and Mexico. I have the ballistics workup that was sent from the crime scene, and I'm trying to figure out a way to run it through Nibin. 
No can do, Larry returned. Nibin would be the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network. Nobody's calling it the international whatever, if you get my meaning. I understand that, I said, but I think the case from Mexico leads directly back to several cases here in the States. If you could just walk this past... Look, Bo, he said, you don't hang around the crime lab much these days, but I can tell you it's hell. When Destry Hennessy comes riding through here on her broom, we all run for cover. If she finds out I'm doing an unauthorized analysis on her equipment and on her watch, she'll have my balls and my job. In other words, Annalise Kim wasn't the only pissed-off employee at the Washington State Crime Lab. As it happens, I said Destry Hennessy could be part of the problem. Whoa! Larry Crumb exclaimed. Bring down what you have, then. Let's see what I can do. Because Mel had commandeered my bathroom, I'd been trying to work while still lounging around in my robe. Not a good plan. Now I went to shower and dress. By the time I emerged, Mel was still arguing with the FAA. But Todd had a hit. I'm on the phone with Million Air in Salt Lake City, he said gleefully, holding one hand over the telephone receiver as he spoke to me. Their records show tail number November 861 Alpha Bravo was tied down there from October 9th through October 11th, 2003. I couldn't help but notice how quickly Todd Hatcher had caught on to the FAA lingo, and we both knew that Juan Carlos Escobar had been released on his 21st birthday, October 10th, 2003. Do we have any idea who all was on the plane, I asked. Todd held up his hand. You can't, he said. I, I just want to... But... All right, then. Someone will have to get back to you. What happened, I asked. They blew me off. I wanted to know if they had any details about the passengers or pilots, but they said they can't or won't provide that information, not without a warrant. When Mel finishes with the FAA, put her on it, I advised. Either she'll worm the information out of them, or she'll figure out a way to come up with enough probable cause to get a warrant. Where are you going? Todd asked. I'm on my way to the crime lab with the ballistic stuff. You keep tracking on FBOs. I started for the door, but Mel waved me down. Thank you so much, she was saying into the phone. Yes, I can hear it. The fax is coming through right now. You've been a huge help, David. Mel hurried over to the fax machine and then had to stand and wait until the documents finished printing. She handed the first one to me, and I saw it right away. Whoever had drawn the composite had done a wonderful job. Diane Massingale and the nun in the composite from the Bountiful Police Department were clearly one and the same. So, Diane, it is then, I said. Maybe it's both of them, Mel replied. They both trained with the Air Force in the first Gulf War, both left under less than optimal circumstances, as in, don't ask, don't tell. The FAA told you that? Not the FAA per se. David told me that. He just happens to work for the FAA, Mel answered. Anyway, after that, they both worked for commuter airlines. Then they flew charters. They worked exclusively for Anita Bowden since 2002. And they both live at the same address in Kent, the one we found for T. Rayburn. Now, where do you think you're going? The crime lab to drop off the ballistics info. I'm coming too, Mel said. But Todd needs you to work on the FBO situation. Todd has a telephone, Mel declared, and I have a telephone. If Todd needs me to do something, he can call. Right, Todd? Right, Todd said, ducking his head into his computer screen. I suspected that he had seen more of Mel Soames than he expected that morning. She seemed to be coping with the situation far better than he was. Okay, then, I said, come on, bring along our Destry and Anita info. The Mercedes was almost out of gas, so we took Mel's BMW. When we reached the crime lab parking lot, I thought Mel would want to come in with me. You go on, she said. There are a couple of things I want to check out. I went. I've been to the crime lab countless times without ever catching sight of Destry Hennessy. But as I pointed out earlier, this was the Ides of March, and the stars were not in our favor. She was down in the lobby, 
talking to the lady in charge of handing out visitors' badges. "'Hey, Bo,' she said. "'What are you doing here?' She seemed happy enough to see me. She wouldn't have been had she known what I was up to. "'Ballistics. Need to see Larry. "'Your old bud,' she said. "'This about the double homicide up in Leavenworth?' "'Yep,' I said. "'That's the one.' "'Good work,' she said. "'Sounds like you cleared that one up in a hell of a hurry.' I took my visitor's badge and rode the elevator upstairs. Larry was aghast when I told him I had run into Destry herself in the lobby. Don't worry, I said. Put in a call to Tim Lander and make sure he sends you everything there is to know about the weapon involved in the double homicide up in Leavenworth. But he already did, Larry said. That's what I'm supposed to be working on this morning. We're covered then, I said, not to worry. I gave him what I had. He looked it over, sniffing his disapproval. This isn't all that good, he said, but it may be enough. Give me a number so I can get back to you. I did, and then headed back down to the car, where I found Mel talking on her cell. When I got into the car, she handed me a scrap of paper. On it, she had scribbled something that looked like wing nuts in Butte Avenue. She hung up. Who was that, I asked. Ross Connors, she said. I just finished telling him that his boy wonder economist, Todd Hatcher is, in fact, a genius. He's located two more FBOs. Wingnuts is in Roseburg. Butte Aviation is in Butte, Montana. The date Sunita's plane was in those areas coincide with two of my sexual offender mysterious deaths. So, what's the next step? Since we can put the plane in the vicinity at the time of four homicides, three in the U.S. and one in Mexico... Ross is looking into whether or not we have sufficient probable cause to get a search warrant. I don't think so, I said. And that's what I told him, Mel agreed. He said it depends on the judge, and Ross Connors knows a lot of judges. So what's the next step for us, I asked. Let's say the two of us head out to Kent and have a chat with Diane Massingale or Trudy Rayburn, Mel said. An unexpected visit from us might force them into making some kind of error. If we spook them, what if they just jump in the plane and take off, I asked. If they try that, we'll know where the plane is, won't we, Mel said with a smile. And if they're apprehended while attempting to flee, we'll have probable cause for sure. Which is exactly why Mel Soames is my kind of girl. By the time we arrived at Trudy Rayburn and Diane Massingill's neatly rehabbed 1920s bungalow on the edge of downtown Kent, Mel and I had come up with a suitable fiction and with a decision that, in this instance, Mel would do all the talking. We parked Mel's BMW three blocks away and almost out of sight of Trudy Rayburn's house. Mel opened the trunk and removed the his and her Kevlar vests we keep there. Only after donning them did we walk back to the house. A blue Ford Freestyle minivan was parked in the driveway. We walked past it and stepped up onto the low porch. Then Mel rang the bell. As soon as Trudy answered the door, Mel put our game plan into action. She greeted the woman with a handshake and a warm smile. I don't know if you remember me or not, Mel said, but I flew with you on a trip to Cancun last fall. Oh, sure, Trudy answered. I remember now. What can I do for you? Once Mel handed over her business card, Trudy was a lot less welcoming. "'What's this about?' "'Your boss,' Mel answered. "'Anita Bowden. "'What about her?' Mel sighed. "'We really can't go into any great detail right now,' Mel said. "'But we understand that you and your partner have worked for Ms. Bowden for several years. "'We wondered if, in the course of your employment, "'you've ever noticed anything suspicious, anything out of line.' You mean like some kind of illegal activity, like transporting drugs or something? That would work, Mel said with another smile. Trudy moved back into the house and let the screen door close between us. Look, Miss Bowden has been wonderful to us, she declared, standing with her arms folded. I can't imagine her doing anything out of line, as you call it. So no, in answer to your question, I haven't noticed anything at all. When was the last time you flew Anita somewhere? Mel asked. Where did you go, and, and when did you return? 
I'm sure I shouldn't be answering these questions, Trudy said. It's really more a matter of corroboration than it is answering questions, Mel returned. We're simply trying to confirm what Anita told us from an independent source. But that's all right, Ms. Rayburn, not to worry. I'm sure we'll be able to check out your aircraft's past flight plans with the FAA. In the meantime, though, go ahead and keep my card, Mel added. Just in case you or Ms. Massingale decide there is something you'd like to tell us about. And don't forget, if the plane has been used in the commission of any crime, the two of you being the pilots could well be implicated as co-conspirators. Mel turned and sauntered off the porch with me trailing discreetly behind her. We were all the way to the sidewalk before the interior door closed behind us. Now we wait, Mel said as we headed back to the BMW. What if she calls Anita, I asked. That's a risk we're going to have to take. We had just settled into the car when Mel's phone rang. Okay, Roy, she said after listening for several seconds. Good work. Thanks for letting me know. Who was that, I asked, and thanks for letting you know what? Roy Porter, Mel answered. He's an interagency information officer for the King County Sheriff's Office. Ross asked him to do some background work for us. According to him, Trudy Rayburn has a CPL. That was bad news. It meant King County had issued a concealed pistol license to Trudy Rayburn. Great, I said. That's just what I want to know. And they've located Anita's plane, Mel added. At least they've established that she rents a hangar at the Renton Municipal Airport. They're still working on getting a search warrant. If they can get it, it'll include the house here, the hangar, the plane, and the minivan. The problem is, even if a judge grants it, how long will it take to get it here? Good question. We settled in to wait. Stakeouts can be incredibly boring. We didn't try to catch up on our reading for fear we might miss something. So Mel and I sat there side by side, thinking but not talking. In that tense silence, I found myself grappling with some serious life and death issues and contemplating what's important and what isn't. Once I came face to face with what I was really thinking, I went ahead and said what was on my mind. "'Will you marry me?' I asked. "'I know there should be arts and flowers and moonlight and all that other stuff, but...' Mel just looked at me. "'Yesterday you thought I was responsible for Richard Matthews' death,' she said. "'And today you're asking me to marry you?' If this was an answer, it wasn't the one I wanted. Why can I tell you, I said, I'm a hopeless romantic. Which is precisely the moment Trudy Rayburn chose to appear at the end of her driveway, lugging a pair of heavy-looking suitcases. She opened the back of the minivan and hefted those inside. Then, leaving the cargo door open, she hurried away, most likely back into the house to fetch another load. Showtime, Mel said, which was true, but it wasn't an answer to my question at all. The bad news is she's wearing her uniform, and where's Diane? After the minivan left the driveway, Mel gave Trudy a several-block head start before she pulled out after her. I called Olympia and talked to Don Hastings, Harry I. Ball's Squad A counterpart. What's the story on that warrant, I asked him. We don't have much time. We've got it, Don told me. A judge in Tacoma finally issued it a few minutes ago. Haley Mitchell is on her way with it. She's just now leaving Tacoma, headed for your location in Kent. It's too late for that, I said. We're on the move here. What's that, Don said. At first I thought he was speaking to me, then I realized he was dealing with a second conversation with someone else at the same time. Okay, okay, he agreed, coming back to me. We'll redirect Haley in the search warrant. Did you hear that, Bo? Hear what? November 861 Alpha Bravo just filed a flight plan, leaving from Renton Municipal at 1330 and flying to a place called Puerto Penasco, Mexico. Flight time approximately four hours. The clock of the dash of Mel's 740 read 1248. We didn't have much time at all. How many passengers, I asked. Two souls on board indicated. Trudy and Diane hadn't alerted Anita Bowden after all. They were meeting up, taking the plane, and making a run for it on their own. "'Where are you now?' Don asked. Trudy's blue minivan had pulled off Kent's main drag and into a Wells Fargo bank branch. 
Mel switched on her signal and parked at the edge of a Safeway parking lot across the street. We sat with the engine idling and watched while Trudy, carrying a briefcase, hustled into the bank. The suspect just went into a bank branch here in Kent, I told him, most likely picking up some cash. All right, Don said. SHIT's got a standing mutual aid agreement with Renton, so I'll let them know what's up and that we'll need units on the ground there at the airport. And Haley wants you to know she just passed the Kent Des Moines Road exit coming north, so she's making good progress. I rang off and gave Mel the lowdown on what Don had told me. Then, silent once more, Mel and I sat and waited. Again. She hadn't given me an outright no to my impulsively impromptu proposal, but she sure as hell hadn't said yes, either. When my phone rang again, I expected it would be Don Hastings calling to give me a minute-by-minute -minute update on Haley Mitchell's progress. It wasn't. "'You son of a bitch,' Detective Kendall Jackson said. "'You've been holding out on me.' "'What do you mean?' I asked. "'What's wrong?' "'Just had a call from Larry Crum at the crime lab. "'He got a hit. "'A hit on what? "'On the weapon that killed LaShawn Tompkins. "'And guess what? "'Where do you think it came from?' "'From you, you worm. "'From a case in Mexico. "'What the hell? "'Sorry, Kendall, I told him. "'Gotta go.' "'I dialed Don back. "'Is Ross Connors there?' I asked. "'No, but never mind. "'I hung up and dialed Ross Connors' cell. "'He answered up to only one ring. "'What?' he said. "'Is there some other problem besides the plane?' "'We've got to move on those rape kits,' I told him. "'Now. "'If there's any media coverage at all of the plane takedown, it'll be too late.' "'Done,' he said. "'I'll put the DNA lab on an immediate lockdown.' Now, where's that blasted list thing you were telling me about? Todd Hatcher has our copy. How soon can he have it there? I have a better idea, I said. Send someone to pick up Annalise Kim at her house and take her to the lab. It's her list. The one we have is only a copy. All right, he said. I'm on it. Where are you? In Kent, waiting for Trudy Rayburn to finish up at the bank. Which happened almost at the same time I said the words. Trudy emerged and headed for her van. Once Trudy's vehicle had merged into traffic, Mel pulled in behind her. The minivan was tall enough that we were able to stay several car lengths back. What was that all about, Mel wanted to know. Larry Crumb got a hit. The gun that killed Richard Matthews is the same one that killed LaShawn Tompkins. Mel jammed her foot on the accelerator. The BMW shot forward, passing several of the intervening vehicles and putting a permanent whiplash-style crink at my neck. I hate vigilantes, she muttered. So do I, I agreed, but please don't kill us in the process. She eased off on the gas, slowing a little and dropping back into the right-hand lane behind the minivan. Okay, she said. I thought she meant okay, she would slow down. I meant okay, I'll marry you, Mel explained. Oh, I said. Don't think I wasn't grateful. Ecstatic would be a better word. But Mel Soames is not the world's best driver. Great, I told her, but how about if we discuss this later? Right now, shut up and drive.
The blue van pulled up to the security gate and after a pause was allowed onto the tarmac. Soon the van disappeared behind a long line of hangars, but I wasn't overly concerned. Once the gate closed behind her, I knew for sure we had her. In a post-9-11 world, the freestyle wouldn't be coming back through that secured gate, not unless someone opened it for her. And I knew their plane wouldn't be taking off either, not without clearances from the FAA, which I was sure wouldn't be forthcoming. Haley Mitchell, waving frantically, pulled up behind the BMW in her Jeep Cherokee. I hopped out and hurried back to collect the search warrant, which she held out the window for me. As I started back to the BMW, another vehicle pulled into line behind hers, a Suburban, and I was gratified to see the remainder of Squad B, Harry I. Ball, Brad Norton, and Aaron Oliver, come spilling out of it. Harry strode up to the BMW. "'Where are these turkeys?' he demanded. They went around the building. By then, Mel had negotiated with the keeper of the gate, and because she's a female, she had asked for and received directions. We go around the end of this building and then turn right, Mel said. Anita Bowden's hangar is at the far end. Okay, Harry announced. I'm in charge here. Renton already has units inside the airport grounds, but they're waiting for me to give the word. He looked back at his little band of SHIT squad soldiers. Everybody wearing vests, we all nodded, Haley Mitchell included. Okay, boys and girls, Harry said. Lock and load, back in your vehicles, and let's hit it. There were no sirens and no lights, nothing to alert Trudy Rayburn and Diane Massingill to our impending arrival. Once we came around the near end of the building, we could see the van parked at the far end. Because Mel and I were leading the way, we got there first. Mel brought the BMW to a smooth and silent stop directly behind the van, where Trudy Rayburn was leaning deep inside to pull something from the far end of the cargo area. Trudy was the one with a concealed weapon permit. I tackled her and brought her down before she ever knew what hit her. Once she was on the ground, Mel removed her weapon. By then, Haley, Brad, and Aaron were out of the Suburban. They rushed into the hangar where Diane was coming back from the plane for a load of luggage. She hit the tarmac when ordered to do so and placed her hands in the back of her head. It was a by-the-book operation, over almost before it started, which was fine by me. Trudy Rayburn and Diane Massingale both seemed thunderstruck to think someone had actually caught on to them. As the ranking officer present, Harry enjoyed introducing himself and taking charge of the two suspects. Their consternation at hearing his name was well worth the price of admission. People who regard Harry I. Ball as some kind of joke do so at their peril. By then a whole phalanx of Renton PD patrol cars had appeared out of nowhere. Harry ordered the handcuffed suspects into two of them. Then, with Harry leading the way in his suburban, a mini motorcade set off for the King County Justice Center, where the suspects would be held for questioning. Armed with our search warrant and several eager helpers, Mel and I emptied the hawker's cargo hold. One by one, we went through all the pieces of luggage we found there and inventoried the contents. By the time we had finished sorting through the plane and its contents, I turned my attention to an unlocked footlocker in a relatively dim far corner of the hangar. When I pulled up the lid, the first thing I saw was a cardboard box, a large shipping box. The printed label was still visible. Display and Costume Supply. I recognized the name at once. When I first moved to the city, Display and Costume Supply was located in the Denny Regrade neighborhood, just down the street from my first condo in the Royal Crest. I still have happy memories of the owners, Dallas and Susie Carlton. Back when I was newly divorced and the doghouse restaurant was my home away from home, they tended to show up there around Halloween and the Fourth of July, St. Patrick's Day, and Easter, dressed in costumes from their apparently never-ending supply and bringing their unfailing good spirits with them. That corner of the hangar wasn't well lit, and when I first opened the box, it was almost like looking into a black hole. When I reached inside, I touched fabric, black fabric, yards of it, and when I pulled some of it out, I knew at once what it was. A nun's habit. Mel came up behind me. 
What in the world? But by then I already had my phone in my hand and was dialing information. Within seconds I had Dallas Carlton on the phone. With a little prodding he remembered me, or at least he claimed to, and when I told him I was looking at a shipping box loaded with nuns' habits, he knew right away what I was talking about. Oh, those, he said. So you know about them. Of course, it was a special order, the only one I've ever done. You wouldn't happen to remember who it was for. Sure, Dallas said. Anita Bowden's a good customer of ours. She said she was working with a school somewhere that was putting on a production of The Sound of Music. Thanks, I told him. Thanks so much. I turned to Mel. Guess who ordered a case of phony nun's habits? Who? Your friend and mine, Anita Bowden. Now let's go get her, too, Mel said. She lives in Laurelhurst. Ross called while we were on the road and brought us up to date. The DNA lab is secure. Yolanda Andrade is in custody for possible evidence tampering. Destry Hennessy has been relieved of her duties, and she's in custody as well. What about you? We found a whole box full of fake nun costumes purchased by Anita Bowden and stored in her airplane hangar at Renton Municipal Airport. Mel and I are on our way to pick her up. Excellent, Ross said. Once you have her in custody, we'll settle in for a game of let's make a deal, and we'll see which of these ladies is interested in spilling the beans. We drove to Anita's humongous waterfront villa on the edge of Lake Washington, in Seattle's Tony Laurelhurst neighborhood. When we rang the front door, a uniform maid greeted us, and then led us through to the back of the house. There, on a sun-drenched sun porch, we found a sweats-clad Anita, iPod earphones clapped to her ears, jogging along at a very fast clip on a high-tech treadmill. Mel! Bo! she gushed, taking off the earphones. What a pleasant surprise! Have a seat. I'll be done in a minute. Dory! she added for the maid's benefit. Do bring our guests something to drink. Her arrogance was such that I don't believe it occurred to her for one moment that we were on to her, or that the jig was up. When Anita finished her workout, she grabbed a towel, slapped it around the back of her neck, and then came toward us, smiling. To what do I owe the honor? I'm sorry, Anita, Mel said. You're under arrest on suspicion of murder. Anita Bowden was shocked. No, she exclaimed. I'm under arrest? What for? You can't possibly mean... Oh, but I do mean it, Mel said grimly. Hands on your head. Now... Anita Bowden did as she was told without further protest. By then I think she knew we knew, and there was no need for any further discussion. Halfway between the sun porch and the front door we met up with Dory. She was carrying a silver tray laden with a complete coffee service, along with an ice bucket, glasses, and a selection of sodas. "'Call Calvin,' Anita snapped at the maid as we went past. "'He's at the office. Tell him I need him.' We walked on. Behind us we heard the tray crash to the floor, glasses and cups shattering as they fell. Mel Soames and I had both worked high-profile cases before, but nothing could have prepared us for the storm of controversy we'd fallen into this time. Anita Bowden and Destry Hennessy were and are well-known and ostensibly respectable women in Washington State, with plenty of people who, without knowing any of the story, were ready to back them to the hilt. As far as those folks were concerned, the two of them could do no wrong, whereas Mel and I were nothing but a pair of malcontents who should have never have brought any of this up. Ditto Todd Hatcher, who I learned much later, turned his fifteen minutes of fame into a whopping two-book publishing contract. What really ended up pulling all the various threads together, however, was a young IT wizard, also a friend of Todd Hatcher, who went on a mission through Anita Bowden's computer hard drives. Destry Hennessy's initial position, that she had been duped the same way Mel had, went bye-bye when we uncovered and decoded a secret recording Anita had made of a telephone conversation between her and Destry. In it, the two women not only discussed exactly when Juan Carlos Escobar was due to be released from jail, 
but also how serendipitous it was that both Destry and her husband would be in Washington, D.C. at the time. Ambrose Donner of Bountiful, Utah, was especially pleased to hear about that one. Anita was someone who liked to keep score. Several weeks into the now public investigation, Mel and I found ourselves scrolling through one of Anita's files that the IT guy had lifted from her computer. It was a chilling rogues gallery of the people she had successfully targeted and had taken out. It was only when we scrolled down to the last one, the earliest one, that we saw the headshot photo of a pleasant-faced balding man in a jacket and tie. The caption beneath it read, Professor Armand P. Bowden. I thought he committed suicide, Mel added. So did I. A call to the Ann Arbor Police Department didn't add much to what we'd surmised. Armand P. Bowden had committed suicide by taking an overdose of prescription medications. That doesn't change the fact that his picture is here, Mel said determinedly. And off we went on the trail of Anita Bowden's mother, Rachel. Widowed for a second time, Rachel A. Trasker lived in a retirement compound near Tampa, Florida. This is about my daughter, Rachel asked warily once we had her on the phone. If you're a reporter, clearly we weren't the first people to make the connection between Mrs. Trasker and her errant daughter. I'm definitely not a reporter, Mel corrected. I'm an investigator for the Washington State Attorney General's office. We're calling about your husband, your first husband. Mel's remark was followed by a long period of dead silence. What about him? Did he commit suicide? Why do you ask? Did he? Mel insisted. There was another long pause. What if she comes after me? Rachel asked finally. What if Anita comes after you? Mel clarified. She always said she would. If I ever told anyone, she said she'd get rid of me too. I happen to believe her. Your daughter is an accused serial murderer. She's in jail awaiting trial and twelve cases of homicide. Armand never did any of the things Anita said, Rachel declared after a time. He wouldn't. He was a nice man. But she told me she gave him a choice. Either take the pills or she'd go to the police. She told me she sat right there and watched him do it. How could her father and I have raised such a monster? Unfortunately, the answer to that question was all too apparent to everyone but Anita Bowden's mother. And now we knew why Armand's picture was the very first entry on Anita's scorecard. As the investigators closest to the case, Mel and I were put in charge of victim and family notifications. Every single case was one of justice denied, with the notable exceptions of Richard Matthews and LaShawn Tompkins, all the victims were either convicted sexual predators or else convicted felons. That made them a less than sympathetic lot, but the same wasn't true of their survivors. For the parents or grandparents or siblings or wives or girlfriends of all these bad boys, the murdered victim was still their very own bad boy. Regardless of what crimes he may have committed as an adult, he had been little once, little, innocent, and loved. Of all those family notifications, the hardest for me was the one with Etta Mae Tompkins. In the intervening months, she had become far frailer. She sat quietly in her corner chair and listened to what I had to say. When I finished, she nodded. It's all right, she said. My Shawnee's in heaven now. I pray to Jesus that he'll come soon and take me too. With LaShawn gone, I've got nothing else to live for. I felt honor-bound to go back to King Street Mission to tell Pastor Mark I'd been wrong and he was off the hook as far as LaShawn Tompkins' murder was concerned. When I got there, though, the building was gone. Demolished. What I found instead was a hole in the ground with a construction crane parked in the middle of it. I never found Pastor Mark again, and I never found Sister Elaine Manning either. Then there was the matter of dealing with the victims of all those long-ago never-solved rapes. As the rape kits were tested, or rather as they were retested, 
Results led back to one or another of Mel's dead sexual offenders. And one by one, we located the rape victims involved to let them know that their cases were now considered solved and closed, even though they would never have the benefit of a trial to help put the attacks behind them. For a long time, I wondered if LaShawn Tompkins' case would ever surface. One of the last profiles developed was that of a 14-year-old rape victim, Jonelle Lenora DeVry, who claimed she had been attacked and raped on her way home from school by an unidentified gangbanger. It took us a while to track down Jonelle DeVry Jackson, but we finally did. That was how two months later Mel and I came to be sitting across from a young black woman in the neat living room of a small house on the outskirts of Ellensburg, Washington, where Jonelle now works in the admissions office for Central Washington University. We wanted you to know the case is finally resolved, Mel said tentatively, that we've finally learned the identity of the boy who raped you. Jonelle studied Mel for a long, hard minute. Is this going to come out in the newspaper, she asked. No, I said, not at all. You were a juvenile at the time. There's no reason to reveal your name now. Good, Jonelle said. I always knew who raped me, she added. And it wasn't rape, either. LaShawn Tompkins was five years older than me, but I loved him to distraction, and I thought he loved me, too. I told my parents it was somebody else because I knew my daddy would have killed LaShawn. And then about the same time, LaShawn got caught up in that other case. The one he went to prison for, Mel asked. Jonelle nodded. Yes, she answered. But once he went to jail for that, I knew not telling had been the right thing to do. And it still is. Deshaun has no idea who his father was. I want to keep it that way. Deshaun, I repeated. You had LaShawn's baby and kept him? You named him after LaShawn, but you raised him without ever telling him who his father is? My parents raised him, Jonelle corrected. They raised both of us. They helped me get through school the same way I'm helping Deshaun right now. You knew LaShawn was raised by his grandmother? I knew Adame, Jonelle replied. Adame and my mother were good friends. You knew LaShawn turned his life around while he was in prison. I guess, Jonelle said. And Adame stood by him the whole time, believing in him, loving him. A single tear slid out of the corner of Jonelle DeVry's eye. She would do, she said. That's Adame. She's an old lady now, I continued. She's old and frail, and she's lost LaShawn, the boy she raised from a baby. I left the sentence hanging in the air and waited. And you're thinking I should tell her? Jonelle retorted angrily. You think I should drag my Deshaun over there to Seattle and tell him he's your other grandmother? Your great-grandmother? And sorry I didn't tell you because your real father was locked up in prison and now he's been murdered? And have a nice day? I'm not telling you what you should or shouldn't do, I said. But I think knowing Deshaun exists would give a dying old woman a precious gift beyond her wildest imaginings. Jonelle studied me for a very long time. I'll think about it, she said finally. But I'm not making any promises. A week or so after that, I was due to go to court for a hearing in the Thomas Dortman matter. In the corridor outside the courtroom, I ran into Deanne Cosgrove. The ponytail was gone, her hair was cut short, and her makeup was deftly applied. She was wearing heels and a skirt and a blazer. Deanne, I said, taking her hand, I almost didn't recognize you. She smiled. I'm working, she said, at Microsoft, so it's practically just up the street. She paused and then added, Did you know Donnie's moved out? No, I said, I'm sorry to hear that. I kept trying to pretend he didn't have a problem, she said, but that day in the hospital, you knew, didn't you? Yes, I said, I guess I did. But don't worry about the kids and me, Mr. Beaumont, Deanne continued brightly. I have a roommate now to help with the kids and expenses, and once Jack's and my mother's estate is settled, we'll be fine. She started to walk away then into the courtroom, and I remembered something else. There was one other person your mother was in touch with that weekend. Someone down in Portland. Do you remember any friends she might have had down there? Someone she might have turned to in a crisis? Deanne shook her head. Not that I remember. 
And so, because I was curious, I called Barbara Galvin and had her dredge Kevin Stock's name out of the file. But when I called Deanne that evening and asked her about him, he still didn't ring any bells. A few days later, Mel and I drove to Vancouver, Washington, to meet with the family members of one of the last men to die at Anita Bowden's behest. We finished meeting with the family earlier than we had expected. Mel was anxious to head back north, but Vancouver, Washington, is right across the river from Portland. If you don't mind, I said, there's one more stop I'd like to make. Where? Mel asked. In Portland. And I gave her Kevin Stock's address which I had looked up before we ever left Seattle. "'You just happen to have his address with you?' Mel asked. "'It's a coincidence,' I told her. Kevin Stock lived in a small condo overlooking the Willamette River near downtown Portland. I saw the family resemblance as soon as he answered the door. Kevin Stock may have aged twenty years, but he was still Tony Cosgrove. His daughter looked just like him. "'Anthony Cosgrove?' I asked. Uh, no, no, "'No,' he stammered. You, "'You have me mixed up with someone else.' "'I don't think so,' I said, handing him my card. "'We need to talk.' Just then a second man appeared in the doorway behind him. "'What is it, Kev?' he asked. "'What's wrong?' Tony shook his head and sighed. "'All right,' he relented. "'I guess we do need to talk.' It took the better part of an hour. Sometimes it's hard to realize how much things have changed since the early 80s. Then, on the other hand, many things have remained the same. Tony Cosgrove had fallen in love with another man. He was also a devout Catholic who didn't believe in divorce or suicide. So he had chosen to disappear. I loved Carol, he said. And I told her if she ever needed me to call, but she only called me once, he added accusingly, to tell me about you. She was afraid you were going to upset things, and you did, and you're still upsetting things. Why are you here? What, what do you want? I want you to think about your daughter, I said, and your grandchildren. I think about D.N. every single day, he returned, but at this point she's far better off without me. I'm not so sure, I said. Her mother's dead, her husband's moved out, she's on her own with three preschoolers. And no matter what happened, Tony, she never once believed you were dead. She's been waiting all this time for you to come home. I can't, Tony said hopelessly. Think about the insurance. If I turn up alive, she'll have to pay it back. Between having the money and having her father, I asked. For the Deanne Cosgrove I know, there's no question how she'd choose. We got married in Vegas, at Treasure Island. Scott was the best man, Kelly was the matron of honor, Kayla was the flower girl and ring bearer both. Mel doesn't do sexism even for weddings. In addition to the kids, the only other guests were Lars, and Lars being Lars, the joke-wielding Iris Rasmussen. The wedding was in late afternoon. Mel wore an ivory silk suit and was absolutely stunning. I wore my tux. After all, I had already paid for the damn thing, and it seemed reasonable to get a few wearings out of it. I had fairly low expectations about the kind of wedding ceremony we'd have at a Vegas hotel, but I shouldn't have worried. Vegas is full of showmen, and the hired reverend delivered his memorized lines with a kind of heartfelt sincerity that left everyone in attendance in tears. Well, almost. The wedding supper was next door in a small private room at Morton's. Then, while everyone else went out to party, Mel and I returned to our bridal suite, where someone had strewn our bed with rose petals for Pete's sake. I was lying in bed when Mel emerged from the bathroom, having removed her makeup. She got into bed and flopped under her side of the bed. Ouch! she exclaimed, sitting up and rubbing her head. What the hell's wrong with the pillow? Reaching under the pillow, she removed the small gift-wrapped box I had hidden there. "'What's this?' she asked. "'Open it and find out,' I said. Inside was a model car, and not just any model car, either. An Arctic Silver Porsche Cayman. "'What's this?' she asked. 
It's a wedding present, I told her. Some people register at Macy's. When I get married, I prefer to give and receive Porsches. So that's your present, a Cayman. It's on order. We're scheduled to take European delivery in Stuttgart in early September. I already cleared it with Harry so we can both have the time off. Mel looked both astonished and bemused. You're really giving me a Porsche for a wedding present? Yes, I am, I told her. Your BMW was starting to look a little worn around the edges. And I get to drive it on the Autobahn? Yes, I said, shaking my head. God help us all. You do. This recording was produced and directed by Rick Harris. It was recorded at Harper Audio Studios by Shinobu Mitsuoka. It was edited by Fred Koch. Mixing and mastering were by Lance Neal. Hello, this is Cherry Jones, Tony Award-winning actress and narrator of The Little House on the Prairie audiobooks. As an audiobook listener, you know the pleasure of being captivated by a well-told story. You may not know that children who listen to audiobooks enjoy academic benefits as well. Hearing stories read aloud helps children reinforce important fundamental elements of reading readiness and reading comprehension, two key elements of overall success in school. When children listen to recorded stories, they hear and learn new vocabulary, and they practice active listening skills. Children can also listen up. Advanced readers can find challenging and complex stories. Delayed readers can listen and enjoy the story as a whole before breaking it down into smaller pieces. For all children, hearing a good book encourages a lifelong love of literature and reading. So. When you consider what to listen to next, why not also think about the pint-sized listeners in your life and select from one of the many available children's audiobooks? We hope you've enjoyed this program from Harper Audio. For more information about the broad range of titles from Harper Audio, Harper Children's Audio, and Cadman, please visit our website at www.harperaudio.com. You can also call 1-800-331-3761. Thank you for listening.